Greetings, New Eden, and welcome to CCP's official broadcast of Alliance Tournament 15. I am CCP Antiquarian, and I will be your host for the final two weekends of this grueling double elimination tournament in which fleets from the participating alliances will engage each other according to the rules set out by the CCP uh, EVE Online tournament team. Uh, for the past for the past several weeks, uh, uh, help me out. Two weeks. For the, <laughs> past two weeks. For the past two weeks, competent capsuleers have exploded. Have exploded. They have. They've yeah. they've been destroyed uh, by by uh, by fleets from uh, from the other alliances participating in the tournament this year. Uh, Overall, we've seen quite a lot of action, and in order to bring that to you at home, uh, we have brought in some expert capsuleer commentators, uh, I mean, helping me out already on the broadcast. Expert. Yeah. E expert, it, it can be nothing else. Of course, uh, joining me here at the desk, immediately to my right, uh, Elise Randolph, former AT commentator, Amar Championships commentator, and uh, eSports director for EVENT. That makes me sound really cool, thank you. You you <laughs> sound wonderful. And, uh, and to your right, uh, expert. Opex Luxury Yacht Pilot, Rain Chocolate. Rain, thank you for undocking with us. Thank you. And it was a Dragoon Yacht. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've 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 misattributed your skill set. <laughs> and uh, and I will pay for that uh, hideously in Twitch chat, no doubt. Of course, uh, these two uh, commentators will not be alone. We also have two expert uh, player commentators in the booth today. Uh, former AT14 commentator, the <laughs> overjoyously expressive moderator. Moderator? Glad to have you with us. Glad to be back. <laughs> and and of course, uh, next to him there, you can see uh, <laughs> the the, uh, the uh, ostentatious Yin Tan. Yin Tan, thank you for joining us. Well, glad to be here. Uh, before we go into the match today, we'd like to extend, uh, of course, some heartfelt thanks. Uh, first, to the ISD volunteers uh, who participated uh, and helped in running the feeder rounds to the Alliance tournament this year. And, of course, to our friends at EVENT who ran the stream for the first two weekends. Uh, we, we don't have time right now to name everyone involved in that, but we will give special thanks uh, to director Bay Art J, executive producer Nash Cadaver, uh, esports director Elise Randolph. Yeah. Uh, and, and and of course, uh, some hosts that uh, took the desk that day, Ithaca Hawk and uh, Nicole Valsol. Yep, of uh, the uh, initiative. Their, yeah. their first time on the desk, I think they did an excellent job. Uh, of course, they did that in order to give uh, the other host, a former Alliance Tournament uh, commentator, former Mark Championships commentator, Crossing Zebras contributor, and uh, overall uh, wonderful guy Apothne a chance to, to go out there and, and uh, comment on matches himself. Apothne, who is no doubt uh, calling his mother and letting her know that he will wear more proper attire next time. Now, this match is ready to kick off the first match of uh, this uh, second to last weekend of Alliance Tournament 14. We have the bands in uh, for Ronin versus Snuffed Out. Those bands, the Ronin, have uh, targeted the Scimitar, the Gila, and the Ishtar. And the Snuffed Out have targeted the Blackbird, Deacon, and Curse. We don't have time for predictions because the match is starting. So we'll go to the boys in the booth for this match, Ronin versus Snuffed Out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this first match. We don't have time for introductions here because the match is about to start. We see the Ronin here having brought a, a top-heavy version of the drone all-in, and Snuffed Out bringing a more conservative uh, version of the drone spam comp. Moderator, quickly, why don't you tell us a little bit about this Pontifex and Purifier interplay? Yeah, so the Pontifex and the Purifier have a good role. Uh, the Pontifex is going to be used to use Defender Launchers to shoot down any bombs from the Purifier. However, already these uh, Vexers are getting tackled, tracking disrupted, and the Thoraxes are being as well. The Armageddon getting tracked and disrupted is a little bit questionable, seeing as how that will almost certainly be a missile platform. Uh, but the Vexer of Lynch Me is already dropping down into uh, low armor. Yeah, but that said, that and Neros is tackled and neutered on Snuffed Out's side. Things are getting on top of it, and whilst... Ronin is definitely going to lose ships. They're going to attempt to trade for this Aneros very quickly. That's obviously a kill condition for this team. Um. Yes, yeah, so uh, Sharp as in the Oneros, if he's being neutered by the Armageddon, won't have a lot of capacitor to sustain any hardeners. Uh, meanwhile, John Locke uh, is being jammed, webbed, and painted. He's bouncing uh, uh, in between uh, armor. We did see I believe some rep drones at some point, but interestingly to note, uh, Ronin does not actually have any sort of remote repairs, uh, where Snuffed Out has repairs for the time being, uh, up until now as sharp as does drop. 
Yeah, so the Ronin there, they traded two Vexes, two ships for that Neros. Do you feel that's a good trade for them in this situation? Oh, that's an excellent trade. If you can kill the uh, core logistics, uh, that's definitely one of the win conditions uh, if you don't have any logic yourselves. Uh, that's why Ronin is likely bringing more beefy setups and uh, snuffed out with relying on heavier resists uh, paired with that Oneros to work. And uh, the Purifier already dropping down into low armor, but at the same time, this Vexor Navy issue, a uh, very point-heavy ship of Lilu Killick drops at the same time. Uh, so snuff out coming back into the match with a solid kill of their own. Yeah, that said that Hugin, the main offensive control for the snuffed out team, is dying here. And with that purifier down, they no longer have a really effective way of killing off the Ronin's drones, which would kind of halt their momentum in this match. Right now, I think the Ronin are hugely advantaged. They've got those three battleships ready to start chewing away at these uh, large ships on snuffed out's team. That said, we see the Pontifex go down, dropping boosts from the Ronin. Yeah, so that will be whatever uh, link burst that he has no longer being able to apply later. Uh, but the Huggin dropping uh, down is rather crucial. Uh, very importantly, though, these Rattlesnakes are some of the key ships, and if they can drop uh, the Myrmidon uh, without losing the Thorax rather uh, at early at the same time, they're going to be in a good position. Those Rattlesnakes and the Armageddon paired together have a uh, lot of damage, and if that Armageddon is especially running any smart bombs in his highs, he'll be able to eventually clear off the drone base of the Myrmidon and the Vexter. The Myrmidon now being the primary and the Lynx as well for snuffed out uh, Look at how quickly that thing melted, though. How, you, so there's so much damage on this uh, Ronin team between two Rattlesnakes and an Armageddon. They're just burning through things. And you can see how slowly that Thorax is going down. Snuffed Out has so few threats left on the field that can dismantle this comp. What have they got to do to get, it, to get the momentum back? I don't know if there's much they can do to get back into this comp. Uh, having said that, though, they are chewing through Xantaris, which is a good call. Uh, Xantaris would be a major threat. However, he's not heavy on points, and uh, Ronin has a lot, uh, even though they've only got some of their core ships with the Sorex dropping. Uh, those Rattlesnakes and Armageddon's do heavy amounts of work. Yeah, we are seeing Snuffed Out start to spread their uh, drone ships around to these beacons to try and make it more difficult for those Rattlesnakes and Armageddon's to apply to them uh, later on in the match. They are going to be able to kite. So it seems like Snuffed Out here is playing for that points victory, trying to time out the Ronin and use their mobility advantage to really try and do something. Yeah, well, Ronin is trying to put Snuffed Out in a timeout of their own as this uh, Ronin of uh, as Stratios uh, of Golson Y is about to sit down as Vexor had just recently been knocked out. And they're losing that, not actually trading out this Thorax of Xantaris, who's been alive for forever. He will drop in a second, but Ronin is up so much right now. Uh, Snuffed Out has really three damage ships that are cruiser or battle cruiser sized against two Rattlesnakes and an Armageddon. There's a reason that they are the pirate faction battleships. They're very powerful, very uh, point uh, efficient for what they do and uh they're very durable as well they've got so much tank you can see just how much of that defense bar is left there that said you've got to give credit to antares for that piloting being able to defensively just outlast like a stratios and a myrmidon in a t1 cruiser just by running away and using those mgd beacons effectively really good piloting there yeah excellently played by him if he was being able to pull damage and uh, survive longer gives the rest of his team more time to trade out snuffed out chips, which they're doing right now as Razor and C is uh, scrammed, and he, he will likely be one of the upcoming primaries. We're seeing a lot of damage coming onto Seju uh, Kanba in the EOS, and uh, some damage initially, but uh, Lane Dragon is recovering shields in his Vexor. Yeah, it just looks like the snuffed out team has spread out and they're just trying to go for this points victory, but at this point I don't think it's even possible. There is just so little DPS left on the snuffed out side to be even put onto these ships here, you know, and they lack the real utility to make any huge plays here. Yeah, exactly. We can see that the control bars uh, are roughly equal, the attack bars are roughly equal, but look at that massive defense bar like you were alluding to, and we can see that there's a bit of a purple bar. So for those of you who are new to the tournament, that will be the active tank, so likely there's some sort of shield boosting or some sort of local uh, armor, probably a medium ancillary repair on possibly a thorax. So, uh, really interested to see their uh, use of those mechanics. But Razor NC uh, dropping down into hull was tackled, uh, trying to get to one of those beacons, and not being able to micro-jump drive as he was scrammed. He will drop in a motor matter of seconds, and we can see the beautiful explosion on screen. Yeah, and Senju is obviously being worked on. It looks like the missiles from the Rattlesnake are just slowly boating their way all the way across the arena to him. There's practically nowhere he can run where he will be safe from those Rattlesnakes at this point. Yeah, if those Rattlesnakes are in the middle of the field, cruise missiles will be able to uh, hit effectively pretty much in the 
anywhere in the arena. Not quite sure if he's got Rapid Heavy or Cruise, but uh, it doesn't uh, matter too much at this point. Ronin have this match well in hand. Uh, they're just playing cleanup at this point. Uh, really well played by them. Yeah, what do you think about this Ronin comp, though, overall? Are you expecting to see something more for this, or you just think it's a one-off? Because, obviously, the Deacon that the Ronin are so famous for was banned. Yeah, uh, Ronin wants to use that Deacon uh, logistics to leverage some of the individual mechanical skills that their Logi pilots have. Uh, those Deacon pilots are some of the better uh, players. Uh, Senju now dropping in uh, his EOS, uh, the Vexor and the Stratos being the only remaining ships for snuffed at this point. Yeah, the only question uh, in this snuff film is how long can they they survive? You know, can they make it for the full three minutes and run out the clock? Yeah, I uh, I don't know if uh, they're going to be able to survive uh, this uh, horror film for them. Uh, the rattlesnakes are sending their drones and uh, missiles across the field. Just we see them streaming now. Uh, good fights in local. Uh, yeah, I think both sides know here here at this point. It is just waiting for the end. Yeah, so that Vexor uh, now getting tracking disrupted, not sure quite why. Uh, maybe a little bit of a, a manor TD on him, but uh, he now drops, and uh, the only remaining ship uh, being the Stratos and the Ants Tiger. Yeah. What do you think about those tracking disruptors, though? They didn't seem all that effective, even though Bronin did bring, you know, three real turret ships. They weren't able to neutralize the damage of that, even at the start of the match. Well, one of the problems with trying to track and disrupt something like a Thorax or a MOA is that usually these are going to be right on top of you. Now, if those were rail ships or um, some sort of a... It looks like beam. the Stratios there is going for a boundary violation, trying to see if he can break the record set uh, by, I believe it was Goon Swarm of 200 and something meters out of the arena. Oh, no, he is trying to just climb out the clock. That is a foolish endeavor, because as we all know, records stand forever. Yeah, um, at least is a living testament to uh, that record being the original OG uh, member of the Boundary Violation Legion. Uh, beautiful explosion as the Stratio spirals out of control and uh, snuffed, uh, now no longer being in control of their tournament destiny. The Ronin taking the win in this match and going on to the top 16 side. And with that, we'll send it back to the desk. And there we have it, snuffed out, falling out of the elimination bracket as uh, Ronan moved forward. Uh, they have two rattlesnakes uh, in Armageddon and uh, that one uh, lingering thorax remaining on the field at the end of the match. Uh, Elise, what did you think? I thought it was a really good showing of Ronan, you know. They're showing why they belong to be, or they, yeah, they definitely belong being here. Uh, snuff, they took a good team, they had pretty good game plan knowing what they wanted to do. You saw them sitting on the MJD beacons ready to like jump out of harm's way. It's, it's a week one and week two meta style play. However, the Ronin, they knew what they were doing. They brought five cruiser hulls, just a bunch of cruiser hulls, and they all had scrams on them. So, you know, that just stops the MJD, so they just, they just win. All right. Uh, Rain, the, uh, the bands, uh, when they came in, I know you had a little bit to say about them. Uh, yeah. What did you think? So, Snuffed Out was actually the first team to ban the Deacon, which Ronan has shown continuously throughout the tournament that they're skilled Deacon pilots. And in retaliation, Ronan then brought, I believe it was close to 70 points worth of battleships, and then no logistics at all. You could see their two Deacon pilots, Lilu and David, were actually just in DPS holes and they still managed to wipe the floor clean with Snuffed Out, even without logistics. Scathing, scathing review. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the meta that we talked about uh, emerging there as far as uh, Tech 2 logistics frigates or using logistics frigates, uh, that comes as a result of a point increase uh, for Tech 2 logistics cruisers. Exactly. Uh, there's yeah. a number of other changes in points, uh, and, and I'll let you guys have a go at it uh, to, to let people know uh, what it is that we're seeing in the rules this year that is influencing this meta. So every year, uh, CCB Fozzie and the Alliance Hornet team, they, they tinker with the point systems a little bit. Um, this year, the big changes, obviously, as you mentioned, was Tech 2 Logistics becoming substantially more expensive. Um, and also the battleship hulls themselves are also becoming quite expensive. So in tournaments past, you may have been able to take a very strong battleship core and augment it with a very strong support wing uh, with a Tech 2 Logistics thrown in. Now you have to make a decision. You can only take two of the three. Um, and we saw Ronin there, they just went for the battleship core 
really strong support wing, but no logistics. And we've seen them abusing the logistics frigates because the logistics frigates are, are very cheap point-wise. So they've been having the best of both worlds. I mean, does that constitute abuse, Rain? Is, is it, if, I, we're, if we're using the Tech 2 logistic frig frigates as they're meant to be used? I mean, so logistics frigates, a lot of people aren't very good at them because they're very difficult to fly. You not only have to be within your own teammate, you're the other logistics pilot, but as well as the rest of your team because your rep range is very short. So being a good logistics pilot, especially in the frigate range, is very, very difficult. So I wouldn't really call it abuse, but if you're good at it, then you excel at it over anyone else who, say, may have not have practiced it as much. Yeah, they have a very high skill cap on those ships, so it's really fun to see these uh, mechanically gifted pilots, especially at this stage of the tournament, um, just fly really well. Now, uh, we did see some other point changes coming in and some other changes to the rules. Uh, notably, uh, drones, light, medium, and heavy Tech 2 drones are permitted uh, in this year's AT, Alliance Tournament 15. Uh, also, uh, some changes to Tech 1 cruisers, uh, uh, recons and hacks, those cruiser size ships getting a little bit cheaper in points. Uh, has that had an impact on the matches that we saw in the first two weekends? And, and will we see that continue to have an impact this weekend? I mean, absolutely. I mean, you saw it today in this very first match. We saw five five Tech 1 cruiser hulls on one team. Uh, so that was very, very important uh, for the Ronin. I mean, oh, Snuff, I mean, Snuff yeah, also I mean, took right. a Hugin, yeah. too. The Hugin <laughs> is making a huge resurgence in the Alliance Warner 15 meta because of how cheap it is and how much control it can offer. Now, uh, one more thing to mention as far as the changed rules. Uh, one thing that we have to mention, uh, at the beginning of that match, we, f we filed through really quickly uh, the three bands from each team. Now, this is a, a first for the Alliance tournament, I think, uh, to see yeah. three bands uh, in the second to last weekend through the, the championships. What kind of changes do you think that's going to have on the play that we saw last weekend and the weekend before on the Event T stream? So a lot of times, a lot of teams will default to banning two logistics. So they will ban both shield logistics or both armor logistics. Well, now with the three bands, you can ban all three like our logic logistics cruisers rather than just the two and hoping your opponent bans them. But at the same time, a lot of people think logistics is a very easy ban. But you can also ban things out like the battleship core teams that we see. So you can ban out some of the navy battle or battle cruisers, not battleships. So you can ban out some of the navy battle cruisers or say some of those. Um, I want to say like a hyena, some of the support frigates, some of the smaller ships that really are key to winning a match. And that Navy BC core was very popular last yes. year at Alliance Tournament 14 and of course uh, facilitated by uh, the use of those uh, those Tech 2 logistics cruisers. Uh, that not so much appearing in the first two weekends, uh, mostly due to these point changes, mostly due to uh, just the, the, the drones and people having to attend to them. What do you guys think? Uh, well, you saw it a lot in the feeder rounds, people taking the four battlecruiser hulls and that type of meta, mostly because they didn't have the time to come up with something new and they couldn't explore the meta too well. Um, so th we saw them very early, but since we'd seen them before, they're very easy to figure out. Like, you can deconstruct them very well. All the teams know how to deal with them. Tracking disruptors, nudes for the harbingers and stuff like that, and they're, they're just gone. So people have countered with what we we're seeing here, which we call drone spam, more or less, because there's just a bunch of drone ships throwing out uh, their weapons and just running around the arena. And it may seem like they're running around like headless chickens, but they, they are actually doing it for a reason. Uh, where they run, the positioning is very, very crucial. Uh, if you make a mistake and you're out of position or you're too close to one of your friends, if you get caught and then your buddy dies with you and that's just a bad, you know, a bad situation. All right. Would you say then that this uh, represents kind of an increase in the necessary skill for a pilot to be effective in the arena, right? Yes, so with the, with the introduction of Thunderdome, pilots, pilots are actually able to practice with what would be the Tranquility Arena set. So in the past, people had to set up their own arenas. They may or may not have those jump drive de uh, beacons, whereas now you can set it all up on Thunderdome and pilots can actively use them and actively show that they're able to like pilot properly. Because initially, in prior years, it was always kind of like a gamble because if you got bumped or accidentally double-clicked the wrong way, then you MJD out of the arena and you're dead. Whereas now, pilots are able to, like I said, practice it and then perform, like execute on it. Well, we'll hopefully see uh, more of that uh, coming up here in the matches for the rest of the day. Uh, we've got about two minutes before we cut back to the booth uh, for the second match of the day, which, if I have the schedule, uh, it will be uh, Skill U versus uh, Rote Capel. 
Uh, and that should be an interesting fight. Uh, both, uh, as at least wrote, uh, having been uh, in the Alliance tournament before and and putting forward uh, some some good showings there. Uh, always nice to see teams returning to the Alliance tournament. Of course, we also have a number of other new teams making an appearance uh, here today. At least six of our teams haven't been on the Alliance tournament before, as far as I know. Uh, we'll get to that schedule in just a little bit. We do have the bands coming in now uh, for that match. Skill versus Rote. Uh, bands coming in from Skill are the Black. Bird, the Vexor Navy Issue, uh, and the Vindicator. Uh, that Vindicator, the cheap Serpentus battleship that, uh, that actually uh, sn snuffed out used pretty well yeah. uh, last weekend. Or, uh, was it last weekend? Weekend before? I think it was last weekend. Last yeah. weekend. Uh, and uh, Road Capel with their bands coming in, the Oneros, the Stratios, and the Curse. Uh, again, three bands per team. Uh, what is going on there with those bands? So well, when, you, uh, when you ban the Vindicator, you're basically saying... I don't want my battleships, which I'm planning to bring at zero, to get instantly melted by Vindicator DPS. Um, so that's kind of showing your hand a little bit. But I'm very interested in Rote banning the curse. It's kind of been their, their theme throughout their entire Alliance Hornet history, uh, taking like Armageddons and curses and stuff like that. What do you, what do you make of that? Well, I was going to say, I thought it was interesting they banned the Oneros. The Oneros was, I believe, the strongest T2 logistics cruiser, as well as probably the most popularly picked and the highest win, win rate. But at the same time, that's the only logistics cruiser that was banned. So all logistics are on the field. And yeah, and it seems like they could easily sub in a Guardian if they're going for some sort of armor yeah. comp there. Oh, and I was going to say, although, with the curse ban, a lot of times curses are used to shut down the dual deacons. So maybe Rote might be bringing dual deacons, mm -hmm. which... The counter to that would be a curse, because the curse just sits on top of the deacons and shuts them down. Uh, that that could be indeed their strategy. Uh, we'll find out more once we see what the teams have brought uh, directly onto the grid. Uh, as we cut to the boys in the booth, uh, Yin Tan and Moderator, uh, for this, the second match of the day, Skill versus Road Capel. Hello everyone and welcome back to the booth. I'm here with Moderator once again and today we're going to watch uh, Team Edgelords go up against Team Rook Capelle. And Team Edgelords here have brought a very classic kind of five battle cruiser core composition supported with two Vigilance and an Executor, uh, primarily because that Aneros was banned. And Rote Capelle, on the other hand, have brought a classic RLML all-in setup, very standard and very well put together. So this is going to come down to piloting, I feel. Something interesting to know, however, is the warp-ins. Both teams have warped in at 50 kilometers, but they've landed at a kind of odd angle to each other. So they're roughly 70 kilometers from each other, if I can do my trigonometry right. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you passed your trig class. So they uh, came in at about that range because they do have uh, the warp and beacon that they have the option to choose. So they will come at uh, slightly uh, angled warp-ins. So that puts that together. So one of the key... Uh, points of this match is that Skill Yourself does have that exec here, and you know, Neros already would have a lot of trouble against what appear to be every single rapid light missile ship you can possibly have in the game put together on the road side. Uh, an exec here will absolutely melt uh, once that's primary. So if Rogue Compel can accurately kite away and drop the exec here and then work away at the, the Vengeance, which would be some of the heavy tackle, but one of the faster assault frigates. It's actually the tankiest uh, armor assault frigate in the game. Uh, the Purifier is going to get absolutely deleted uh, if Rokapel even so much as looks at it sideways. Uh, so these Flirt Fleet Hurricanes, Navy Harbingers, and Navy Brudix have to really do a good job at dropping the Scimitar early. That's going to be one of their conditions towards uh, winning the match. Yeah, and obviously the, the Team Edgelords is going to have to make sure that they apply all of those battle cruisers correctly. They're going to have to match transversal and make sure that they hit as hard as possible because this is going to come down to a kind of race uh, in the middle of the match when both logistics are dead. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, Fleet Hurricanes, they're also bringing those possibly over... Uh, the uh, Brutix Navy, which is not banned, we've seen a lot of that, uh, but the, you can bring extra links with that, and I'm interested to see what kind of links they will be running uh, as we do begin the match here. Uh, the Scimitar already taking an absolute pounding. Uh, Ruri Shishino is doing his best to burn away, now running ASB charges. Rokapella doing exactly what I thought they would, burning through the tank of that executor who already has Repbots on top of him. Yeah, you know, those five battle cruisers they've got, um, they're going to have all of their drone base just filled to the brim with as many rep drones as they can field, and that's going to be able to keep this executor Kira, kind of healthy for a while, but there's so much burst DPS coming out of this Rote Capelle team. 
Yeah. However, trading an executor for a scimitar is always, always, always a good trade. Uh, Ruri Hashino has br- br- burned through about half of his uh, ASB uh, charges at this point, and so far, Skill, your, <laughs> Skill is doing an excellent job at getting that scimitar uh, down. Uh, Ruri Hashino is burning towards the edge, and uh, hopefully he doesn't uh, boundary uh, kiting against the uh, edgelords. He is now uh, dropped. Uh, the executor of Lee Jansen is into low armor, and that's an excellent trade for uh, the edgelords themselves. Oh, you can see how fast these edgelords are burning through that Orthrus as well. That is absolutely brutal. Not even getting a chance to get an XLASB off. Possibly a sleep at the keyboard as he gets deleted from the field. That is really bad for this team. Yeah, I thought that uh, Rote was in the uh, commanding seat uh, off of the initial Warbins and more or less the team comps, but uh, the Edgelords are proving uh, wrong. I me mean, wrong. Uh, they're doing a good job at keeping that executor alive. I'm not sure how he's able to survive so long, but one of the problems running an ASB on a ship like an Orthrus is it has essentially next to no resist, and it doesn't have a large shield buffer, so you're using a large amount of your total uh, active shield tank to... Uh, be used when you cycle each boost, so it's very difficult to get all your charges off, and if you're asleep at the wheel like Jalen was, when you just don't have that buffer, you can get erased, and uh, that Orthrus will get erased. That Gila, we can see tackle on top of him. That is excellent play. The Scram and Web will definitely prevent him from uh, micro-jump driving, and... Yeah. Uh, the Navy Osprey is taking significant this is, damage this is, as well. This is absolutely brutal from the Edgelords team, just managing to keep that Executor alive. I, t- I was just taking a look to see if maybe he'd MJD'd, but there was nothing. He's just managed to live through an entire RML all-in cl- uh, clip burst. And now we've reached the point where I don't think Rote even has the DPS to kill it anymore. Uh, I mean, even if they did, the Executor has now dropped, but the Gila uh, being tackled means that Rote would have to perform immaculately, and even then, uh, the Edgelords would have to have a massive uh, piloting uh, failure or to uh, be out of the edge of the arena themselves uh, if to lose this at this point. Uh, really excellently played, knowing exactly what they needed to do, getting on top of that scimitar and trading out much earlier uh, than their executor dropped. Yeah. One interesting thing to see here is that the Rote Capelli team appears to have ECM drones rather than shield repair bots, uh, and that might have been one, one of the reasons why that scimitar fell so fast. You know, they didn't have, bring any sustain with them, whereas the Edgelord team brought a ton of it. You know, those battle cruisers are really, really good at it. They perform the same role that the Typhoon fleet issues did previously. Yeah, one of the problems is that the Cerberus and uh, the Caracal, as well as the Navy Osprey, uh, some of them don't even have a full bandwidth of uh, light drones, so some teams feel that they get more utility out of using EC drones to try to jam off incoming tackle or hostile uh, logistics or some other key ship. Uh, but at this point, uh, the Purifier now uh, finally drops. Um, the Cerberus of uh, Hishar uh, Kurdin uh, being the current primary, and it's very interesting that the Edgelords have left uh, Ben Bully uh, alive as the last ship. Uh, Team Edgelords and uh, Ben Bully have a history of being rather uh, an acrimonious relationship, to put it at the very least, on tranquility. so I can see why they're saving him for last. No smack talk in local, but I would uh, expect a lot of that after the match. Oh, yeah. Really, it just looks like Roque Capelle here got Ben Boozled. Uh, you know, they brought a really good comp, but it just wasn't enough. They weren't able to pilot in such a way that they could mitigate the damage from this Edgelord's comp. And in fact, Edgelord's, you know, piloted really well. You saw how fast that stalk dropped. They were just matching his speed perfectly, st- staying on the same transversal path as him, and just deleting him. Really excellent execution there from the Edgels. Yeah, they were timing uh, what were probably heated target painters and uh, the cycles of their artillery uh, with the uh, the beams and the pulse, uh, or uh, <laughs> rather the uh, rail guns, uh, rather excellently. Uh, ben is using the remaining uh, shield ASB charges he has left, but he will eventually run out uh, and really well played again by uh, the The, the real question here is, does he run out of uh, HP before he runs into the edge of the arena? And the answer is no. Edgelord's taking that last kill for themselves, and with which I will take control of the camera and send it right back to the studio.
and Rode Capel eliminated from Alliance Tournament 15 uh, by Skill U. Uh, Skill bringing uh, bringing one of those battle core comps uh, that we were just talking about a, a moment ago. Uh, Rain, what did we see happening with that match? So those battle those battle cruiser holes are of, are pretty tanky. They can shoot with high DPS from a long ways away. They're not all-encompassing as in they can hit everywhere in the arena, but we clearly saw both teams within, I believe it was 70 kilometers, and they were immediately able to apply to that scimitar and remove him from the field before the rapid light spam could even touch their executor. Elise? I mean, I think that was just a clear outdraft by the, the skill U team. Capku, he saw what the Rokapel team wanted to do and said, I think he had like two or three teams that he wasn't sure what he wanted to take. He saw the bans, he saw that curse ban by rote, and he said, you know what, I can, I can take these Battlecruiser hulls and I can dunk all over them, and he did. Is there, is there anything uh, that Rogue could have done uh, to bring that out? Was there any way for them to start applying damage earlier, uh, to get into better position? Did they maybe miscall the warp? I mean, they're in light missile kiting ships, so I don't think warping in any closer would have been an easier bet. I think if they had gotten through um, the initial clip with all of their rapid lights through that executor, like most people would have predicted and fully applied that DPS, then the match might have swung in their favor, especially because then they could have deleted the other cruisers on the field, the purifier. Um, so I'm guessing either they did terrible timing of their calling or they were just too far out of range. Another possibility, and, and hear me out on this one, <laughs> this is the skill you team again going next level. They see the Onero span and they said, I'm gonna bring a brick tanked executor and hope they shoot it first. <laughs> and I think that might have happened with what, what went down there. Like so that, they plan for the tech logistics to be banned. Yeah. Well, and when they saw it, they they just made an audible, right? They were like, okay, they're gonna want to shoot our logi. They're gonna try and bait us into a weak logi. We'll give them what they think is a weak logi, but it'll be like a strong logi. Uh, he did hold on there for quite a while. Uh, we he saw did. that executor uh, making making himself available, and and I, presumably, I mean, he was primary, so it's not yeah. like he needed to yeah. do all that much work. He just needed to survive. I mean, that rote setup is predicated on killing the logistics first, kiting around outside the arena, utilizing MJD beacons to just keep kiting and keep applying their damage. Um, that I mean, they wanted to do that, they couldn't. Another thing we saw there was the vigilance. Those are the, the Sherpentis cruisers, 90% web. They get you know damage bonus as well. You can fit the rails on them, and they are super durable tackle if you want them to be that way. And uh, you know they're cheap. Well, they they certainly are cheap in this tournament. Uh, yeah. Not not always available to everyone. Uh, we'll we'll maybe see more of these uh, innovative calls uh, responding to the meta as we move forward in the day. Uh, a real quick uh, opportunity here to go through the rest of the schedule. Uh, coming up at fifteen forty, we have Thermodynamics versus the Brave Collective. At sixteen hundred, uh, Shadow Cartel versus Testic Alliance. Please ignore. Uh, at 1620, the Bastard Cartel uh, will go up against We Form Volta. And at 1640, Mercenary Coalition uh, will face the bright side of death. Now, that's all happening before the break today uh, with Rain and Elise here on the desk with me. As we move into the second half of the day, uh, our, our commentators will switch it up a little bit, uh, try and relocate, and uh, we may even have an appearance from CSB Fozzy here in the studio. Uh, I know he's always eager to participate in the Alliance Tournament, and it, it of course, overjoys him to be able to uh, sit at the desk and, and provide a little bit more uh, in-depth look at the CCP's perspective on this, which I just I just can't do. Uh, so coming up after the break, uh, Solaris Ketonium versus Pandemic Legion. Uh, I've heard about this this Pandemic Legion. They're uh, they're a young band of upstarts looking to make their name in of, this alliance tournament of recondite repute, no <laughs> doubt. Uh, followed uh, at 1740 by Hydro Reloaded versus the Salt Farmers. Uh, Tuskers Co. Uh, will face off against a Vidra Reloaded at. 1800 Eve time, that of course being the first uh, undefeated bracket uh, match of the day, uh, followed by Northern Coalition Dot versus Exodus Dot, the Initiative Dot versus Pen is out, uh, and then, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, and then uh, at 1700, last match of the day, Abandapart Dot versus L A Z E R H A W K S. Laser Hawks, uh, who actually have been uh, pretty impressive in the tournament thus far. I've, I've yeah. actually uh, had a lot of fun watching their matches, watching Vydra as well. Um, looking forward to, to that, the 1600 uh, match versus Tuskers is going to be amazing. Are you guys looking uh, towards anything in particular? P perhaps this, what did you call them? Uh, endemic, endemic Force? Pandemic Legion. Uh, I'm looking forward to see the uh, PL versus Slice match and the match following that, the Hydra versus Salt Farmers, because the winners 
will go on to face one another, which may lead PL to facing Hydra in an elimination match. Or it could just be like a lot of people crying and slice versus salt. Slice farmers. versus salt. Sounds yeah. good. I know that's what CCB Fozzy is is predicting officially. I, I think he's just I think he's just hoping for the best possible show <laughs> uh, for everyone viewing at home. Uh, we care about your entertainment. Rain, what what are you looking forward to coming up here? Definitely the slice match, but not because I'm a member of PL, but because Slice has some pretty clowny setups and they just have amazing piloting using those MJD beacons. Who did they go up against last weekend? No handlebars, that's, and it was the pilot the Panthon. Panthon, I think his name is, yeah. And he single-handedly drug a drone swarm around the arena just by MJD. Yeah, he MJD to a beacon, then MJD to another beacon, then ran to another one, and MJD. It took them like eight minutes to kill him. <laughs> re re recommended. Uh, open up another window in your browser. Fire up Yakety Sax. Uh, play it at the same time. There's nothing like a little bit of Benny Hill happening uh, as you watch the Alliance tournament. It just makes everything a little bit more colorful. Uh, those matches all coming up today, uh, all of them uh, uh, should be uh, amazing and, and entertaining, and, and we will have you guys in the booth uh, offering a little bit of commentary, uh, telling us what's happen happening there. Uh, also, and before we cut to our matches, uh, we have a few announcements coming in uh, from the control room here. Uh, reminders to those of you who are looking for something to do, uh, this month, uh, Steel City Eve will be happening uh, on the 19th of August. Uh, that is happening in Butler, Pennsylvania, which if I recall correctly is like straight up Route 8. Uh, anybody in Friendship or Bloomfield right now? How you doing? Uh, contact Rick Javex for further information there. And of course, uh, on the 25th of August, uh, the Midwest Eve meetup will be happening in Urbandale, Iowa. Uh, I've never been to Iowa, so I can't offer any I've advice gone. on <laughs> how to get around. Uh, Rain, Iowa? Yes, pretty nice? yes. It's, it's in the middle of Des Moines, so it's very easy to get to. Very nice crowd. Um, deep I mean, fried it, butter? That's happening at our state fair currently going on, yeah. so I do not believe we will have deep fried butter. Wonderful. Uh, those not the only Eve Meets worth mentioning right now, but uh, uh, for more about Eve Meets happening in an area near you, uh, please stop by evemeet.net, uh, where you can take a look at, at any player gatherings that are scheduled that have been posted up there. Uh, of course, two, two big uh, gatherings of players coming up uh, later this season in October on the 6th, 7th, and 8th, Eve Vegas will take place, that happening at the Link Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, hosted by CCP. There will be uh, extreme CCP dev representation, uh, presentations from players, uh, and a bunch of content. Uh, you will both have been to Eve Vegas. Yes. Uh, pretty good time? It's, yes. It's amazing. absolutely fun. It's a, it's a great event. If you've never gone to an Eve meet, uh, Vegas, and you live in the U.S., Vegas is an easy place to get to. It's a lot of fun. You can either nerd out all day about spaceships, well, you can just uh, not talk about spaceships and just have fun with your, your nerd friends. Yep. Of course, we prefer if you talk about spaceships. Uh, always make spaceships the center of everything that you do. Uh, Eve is more real than life. Uh, and <laughs> if you don't live in the United States and can't make the Eve Vegas, uh, the largest Eve player meet in the world will be happening in November. Uh, I think I've got the dates for that written down here. The 4th and the 5th of November, Evesterdam will be happening in Amsterdam. Uh, that event is, by all reports tremendous and amazing if you petition logi bro uh, perhaps uh, I'll, get, I'll get to go I'm not gonna go I'm not gonna be able to go but that is on my Eve bucket list I, I need to go to Evesterdam when you see it you I mean I, I it's so close to, yeah. to here it's in a I, I learned today it's in a completely di different hemisphere from where I live it's in the eastern hemisphere yeah the near east it's also in the same hemisphere where you live it's in the northern I mean, hemisphere yeah, there's so multiple that. ways to look at this uh, nobody likes them. rain ever been over to Amsterdam? I have not uh, have you have you seen the photos it looks um, lovely, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, I've always heard great, great things about it. Highly uh, recommend. <laughs> There's a lot of bikes. I don't know if we can trust so many bikes in one place. <laughs> Suspicious bicycles. You heard it here first. Thank you, Elise, for that warning. Uh, a few quick shouts out to uh, those of you following along on Twitter. Uh, recently, uh, Julianus Soter... I'm not sure about that. Uh, MDAR, Manic Velocity, Ulti2, Ultranus, BS, Fuzzy Steve, Bocce, Rix, Javix, Web, Spaceship, Scared Panda, uh, Nihilaus, Vause, Lysis, RVB's Thecla, Lulu, Lynette, Antoine, Baldera, Damasus, Kadesh, Cadball, Roannon, Gabe, Wilhelm, Nichtlicht, 
I did my best. Uh, Sindel Pelian of the Angel Project, Gorski Carr of the official Eve subreddit, Gavin2505 is actually Gavin7096, the second worst solo PvP in Eve. He's not even good at being bad. Uh, the Boatman and his bigger boat on behalf of Andrus, the Discourse on behalf of Cerulean Voth, and Onion. Uh, Eve Onion News on behalf of Opus Magnum. Uh, those people gave me a, a, a little shout on Twitter, and I promised I would shout back. Uh, shouting has occurred. Now, coming up, uh, our match here uh, will be Thermodynamics versus the Brave Collective. And uh, we've got the bands in already. You guys have had a chance to take a look at them, but I'll, I'll reiterate them for the people at home. Uh, Thermodynamics has banned out the Blackbird, the Hoogan, and the Curse. And Brave... Uh, Gotta love them. I hope Kigali's watching. Uh, <laughs> Brave has banned out the Scimitar, the Hyena, and the Ishtar. These bands, what does it mean for what we're going to see on the field? <sighs> so both the Hugan and the Hyena band, they clearly don't want to see webs and pains from either team. Yeah, it, it looks like... I'd say Thermodynamics, it's a safe bet to say that they want to take something very skill-intensive, which usually means kiting around. Um, you know, banning out that Hugin, it's a really annoying ship to have to deal with because it can, if you get a bad warp in, you're just instantly webbed right off the bat and you lose a linchpin instantly. Uh, that's no fun for anyone, so just get, get it out of the way. Uh, that, that's what they say. And on TQ, these teams could not be any more different. Brave Collective, uh, known for, you know, having a whole bunch of newbies, uh, their motto is be brave, so they don't care if they die, they just zerg hoard everyone. Um, Thermodynamics, on the other hand, they they value pilot skill. Um, so yeah, they, they on TQ they try and, so Thermodynamics tries to like fly around the, the brave Zerg horde and just pick off everyone that comes at them. And you know, it works for both teams. You know, Brave has a lot of fun and uh, Thermodynamics has a lot of fun. In the Alliance tournament, however, who knows what's gonna happen. It's everyone's content yeah. is, is, is how it works. Uh, do we have any predictions on this fight going in? So my immediate prediction would be Thermodynamics because, like Elise said, their piloting skill, I believe they have probably a little more background within the Alliance tournament. But Brave, by no means, is taking this as a joke. I believe they actually gave the most money to, in the silent auction to get in to the Alliance tournament. So they're taking this very seriously. The fact that this is just now, they're, they're just now in the elimination bracket shows that they've put in a lot of effort. So I'm not counting them out in this one. I'm going to get a prediction from you in a second, at least, but I've just remembered something, and I feel like it's important to mention. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, putting forward money for the silent auction, every team that emerges uh, as victorious in today's match is guaranteed a seeded invite for next year's Alliance tournament. Uh, so what's on the line here, at least for some of these teams, is not having to pay that <laughs> in the silent auction yeah. again. Uh, so with that being said, do you think Brave can pull it out? I, or? I don't know. I think Thermodynamics have a pretty sizable edge here, but anything could really happen. Like, rock, paper, scissors is a thing that happens in the Alliance tournament. If Thermodynamics does something, or doesn't predict what Brave is going to bring very well, then, you know. So? Th thermodynamics, right, for sure. Just check and make sure. Thermodynamics, two votes from the from the commentators here on the desk, and we'll go to the boys in the booth, Yin Tan and moderator for this match, Thermodynamics versus Brave Collective, here at Alliance Tournament 15. Hello everyone and welcome back to the arena of absolute annihilation here. We've got Thermodynamics going up against Brave Collective with Thermo bringing a very interesting setup, something that I'm not entirely certain we've seen before. Uh, whereas Brave Collective <laughs> are bringing something we certainly have seen before, I think. Isn't that right, Moderator? Yeah, so interestingly enough, this Brave Collective setup, setup is the exact same composition that Tuskers beat them with in the previous round to send Brave to the lower bracket. And Brave has actually executed the exact same warpins as Tuskers, uh, maybe wanting to... Uh, use the setup, seeing as how it knocked them down. Uh, Thermodynamics using the uh, flagship Armageddon, that's why the camera cut to it at the beginning of the match. So that flagship Armageddon is going to be using the long-range uh, officer or uh, X-type heavy newt to try to newt out uh, the Slepnirs, their hardeners, any sort of uh, other active modules that consume capacitor uh, before they come in. But we're already seeing bombs off the field from uh, Thermodynamics. Those are going to try to hit the drones that we see incoming, and it looks like they're going to land on the entire core and those drones off the bat. 
Oh, and that's a huge wave of damage there. You can see those cruisers going into super low shields, and that that's going to force this Basilisk into overdrive. Yukiko has been incredibly good so far in this tournament, one of the best logistic pilots we've really seen uh, step up out of nowhere. But I don't know if he's going to be able to handle this much damage whilst keeping hit the primary, which seems to be John Le Wang, or at least was there for a moment, alive. You know, damage being spread everywhere here at this point, although it looks like the Brave Collective is rushing in. We know those Slepnis are fit with auto cannons, so they are going to be trying to get in, get on top of this Thermodynamics team and just try and tear apart the squishy targets. What do you think about the choice to go for those Vigilants? So the Vigilants appear to be uh, very heavily tanked. Uh, Velcherun was the initial primary, and it looked like he was taking a lot of damage, uh, and that would be a good choice. Get those 90% webs off of the field. Also, being blaster damage, they're very naturally strong against killing Slepnirs. If you get 90% locked down by a Slepnir and a Vigilant, uh, that Slepnir is isolated. That Vigilant, that going vigilant into is dropping alpha. down, though, rather quickly. And we're seeing a lot of remote repair effects on the Thermodynamics team split. They need to be on God's Apples, and they are not. So he drops. That was an incredible play there from Brave Collective. They split damage between the Vigilant, the Purifier, and uh, the other Vigilant. And the Aeneas only has four reps. It can only keep so many reps cycling on things. They saw which one was getting the least reps. They just immediately switched for it, trading back for a, for a mower. But that is not great. The Ferox, however, of Brave Collective is now super low armor. It doesn't look like he's going to make it. But equally, they're trading back for another Vigilant. This is incredible. This is like back and forth here. A real big race between the two teams. Yeah, very much so. So the Ferox is likely going to be running some sort of an info link, which they don't care about too much besides uh, the sensor hardening. You use that against some sort of a jamming effect. Thermodynamics does not have that. Uh, their purifier is going to be excellent source of damage uh, to be hitting into a MOA that's tackled or has hardeners off. Uh, but he's taking a lot of damage, uh, now getting some intermittent reps. But a whiplash is dropping was dropping rather quickly. He's stabilizing a bit, but Thermodynamics uh, took the lead dropping the Ferox and the MOA for trading out the Vigilant. They that need Navy to get something else. is going super low here, though. You know, the resists of that thing, if he's heating well, they're huge. The Rep Drones are going to be able to keep him alive, potentially, here, especially as we see another MOA down. These uh, squishy kind of DP, like, almost ablative... Uh, plating for the fleet of Brave Collective are just slowly being chipped away by this really strong core. But if Thermodynamics starts bleeding these Navy Brutixes, this Navy, this uh, Fleet Hurricane, it's going to be brutal for them because they don't have the same resilience of threats. They don't have those healers. They don't have those Slepnis. They don't have the things that can almost self-sustain. And they don't have the same level of resists that they do. No, and we can see that the Navy Brooks is taking a very long time to die. That was after they dropped the mo. That'll be about four to five hundred damage, uh, depending on the ammo that he has. Uh, the Brooks now finally does. We can drop. see Chester in the Gila though, going very, very low there. He's scrammed and he's webbed. I want to know how you get scrammed and webbed in a healer, but it likely has something to do with that malediction of wild things. We've seen so many of these interceptors making critical plays during the AT, keeping stuff in position. But you can see there, the damage has dropped off. The healer's starting to stabilize at around twenty percent. He's slowly getting chipped away, but he's got a lot more EHP to go. Yeah, and they and they need to trade something out on the Brave side. Uh, their Basilisk has been grappled and heavy nuded, so it will be very difficult for him to actually get any RR. We can see that it's dropping in and out. Uh, meanwhile, though, they're making a good call in dropping Blood Rune in the Purifier. That is a lot of damage. The Purifier will nearly perfectly hit a Gila, but trading a Purifier for a Gila no is No reps perfect. on that healer as he died. It looks like that Basilisk might be nuded out. Yeah, he's been nude and grappled uh, by the uh, flagship nudes uh, of that army. Vigilant of Velshram down. This is so close. They're trading blow for blow yeah, here. Yeah, this is really. a really uh, punt knock knocked out fight. So the Armageddon uh, is kiting at range, uh, trying to keep away from the auto cannon damage. Uh, as Thermodynamic continues to lose link ships, and that Manticore has been deleted, uh, I'm not sure how he got caught. It doesn't appear like there were any tackle effects, but the Manticore must have been hit by drones at range. That'll be a lot of damage, and that's crucial for Vordak Kalger in the Navy Harbinger. So God himself and Vordak Kalger are the only two link ships right now. Brave Collective still has their links, and you can see the massive... Uh, shield uh, bar that they have in terms of active, that will be ASB uh, boost from the Slepnir, and it appeared that John Lee Wang is taking damage. He will be their primary. That defense bar is really deceptive, though, because that is not a sustained tank. That's obviously something that will run out of charges, it will burst, you know, there's only so long he can keep himself alive, and Brave Collective here, they're running out of tools. They don't have ways to catch these purifiers, catch this malediction, and kind of almost kite out this thermodynamics team. So they're going in hard with their core and trying to kill this Navy Harbinger under an Aeneros. I can't help but think that that's a very, very 
brave play, you know, not to uh, make a pun on their name there, that was completely unintentional, you know, not focusing on that Aneros. What do you think about that? I think that was uh, definitely not an unintentional pun. That Slepnir, though, is not receiving resist consistently, though. It's dropping in and out, so he's having to run his active tank, and the, the Basils can't sustain all of that. So right now, Thermodynamics needs their Navy Harbinger to, to survive long enough to trade out for John Lee Wang. If that Navy Harbinger drops, that will be a lot of sustain that John Lee Wang will be able to have, having less damage being applied to him. And it's also worth noting that that makes the Aneros squishier, because the more of these Navy BCs die, the less Rep drones are going to be able to be on that Aneros. Oh my god, it's so close here. Like, 1% structure. Uh, going down there, that is huge. The Brave Collective now, they've got a huge amount of DPS off the field. They've got a huge amount of utility off the field. They might be able to swing this back. And one something that's really crucial is Rane Centro and his Purifier uh, receives armor oh. reps in the b smallest of slivers of uh, Absolute Hull. And those bomb... Uh, <laughs> The Torp damage, while not the most effective against Slepnir, uh, he'll be firing EM uh, damage, which is not good against Minmatar resist on that Slepnir. Keeping him alive is absolutely crucial. If they can have that 500 damage and trade out the Slepnir, uh, again, who is not receiving any sort of remote repair, or and now is, from uh, that Basilisk. Uh, Thermodynamics needs to break something, and War Destined, uh, a good friend of mine, has now been tackled uh, Broken the tackle. tackle. Dropped. It look, I look. I don't. I have no idea what, what is even tackling him at this point. This is just a mess. But both teams are playing right down to the wire here, making such good calls. The Aneros, though, taking into going into half armor, he's not going to have much sustain to keep him alive. As this brave collective uh, team just pounds in on him, two Slepnirs, a healer and a Manticore, just putting on as much hurt as they can. I wouldn't be surprised to see them try and switch back to this purifier, try and bait him out a little bit, try and keep his attention on his piloting, but who knows at this point. Yeah, so it would appear that we've got a Web set on of... Web on Yukiko. Uh, yeah, and Web scram. on Yukiko and, and Scram. Realizing right now that Thermodynamics, uh, they need to get some points off the, on, the, on the field. If they can kill the Basilisk, they'll be up a total of uh, 50 to 45, and with only 2 minutes and 30 points le uh, seconds left on the clock, they need to get some sort of a lead right now. Yeah, do you think Brave Collective here should be playing defensively and trying to win on points, or should they be going in for the kill on that Aneros? They're going in for the kill on their Aneros. He is hard tackled by what appears to be uh, one of the healers, which is excellent piloting uh, by Cold Fuzz uh, locking him down. Yeah, even through the newts of that Armageddon, but the Basilisk there, 20%, he doesn't seem to have any reps left in him. Oh, maybe just reloaded his ASB there or something? I have no idea, but he is somehow repping all the way back up. All of Thermodynamics work just uh, undone in a couple of seconds there. That Purifier still getting perma reps. The Aneros in structure. Brave Collective might take this one in what I think is yet another upset from this new team. Yeah, so the... Uh Armageddon. Aneros down. The Armageddon currently. Oh my god. Yeah, the Armageddon only has a total of three damage drones on top of that Basilisk. I'm not sure why he doesn't have a larger flight of uh, drones. They might have been killed, actually. Uh, and the attack bar of uh, Thermodynamics team is rather low. At now, with the Oneros dead, uh, Ryan Centro couldn't be sustained. Brave is playing this excellently. I don't see any way that Thermodynamics can get... Uh, 32 points in the time that we have remaining. The real question here is, does that Armageddon go down? Because, you know, we should uh, clarify this for the viewers, but the, all of this is done on Tranquility. That Armageddon is probably going to be like 10 billion-esque, do you reckon? Uh, so one of the reasons you would bring in Armageddon is because if you have a rather poor team in terms of wealth, um, you can make it essentially the best ship it can be, uh, barring some sort of uh, officer drone damage uh, modifier, which isn't as big as the uh, Balgorn webs. You can do it for about two billion at, at the very most. So if Still you don't 45 have- 45 seconds here and Brave Collective is just chipping away at God himself in the Fleet Hurricane, good name. Uh, Brave Collective has taken this one and taken it in a very convincing fa fashion, you know, almost emulating uh, their heroes, it seems, in the Tuskers, uh, managing to uh, pull off some really crisp execution that you wouldn't expect from them. No, this is definitely a bit of a surprise. Seconds. So uh, Brave Collective brought the setup that they lost to, and uh, they were very uh, much so their namesake, uh, completely locking down every ship on thermodynamics that they need to, making correct calls and primaries throughout. Uh, that Armageddon will survive as there's only 10 seconds left on the clock, but well played by Brave throughout. Um, thermodynamics uh, just couldn't take the heat. Yeah, you got to put your hats off to these guys. This was incredible. <laughs> you and your puns. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, as we now have timed out, uh, we'll send it back to uh, the uh, lady and gentleman on the desk. It's 
NC Dot got uh, whacked again, losing three Titans and five Super Carriers. NC Dot for Snuffbox. I hope Snuffbox wins this. Come on, Snuff, bring your A game. Let's take down NC. going up against Soilaris Chitonium. Oh, you didn't know! I want uh, to call them. They're better known as Slice. Your ass better slice. Call oh, it's somebody. Slice. Different ways, man. The audacious Brave Collective defying the desk here, saying, no, 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 we're not going to melt. No thermodynamics, you go home. How do you two feel? I, I mean, I thought that was like superb of Brave to show off, especially against thermodynamics. Like I said, they're not like some newbie team. They're very skilled pilots. So, I mean, the fact, I believe Moderator called it out, but he said they brought the match, or they brought the comp that actually beat them from Tuskers. And not only that, they didn't just copy the comp, but they were able to execute it well. So props to them. Ex excellent work. Uh, just just back and forth piloting all through the, the first five, six minutes of that match, really coming down uh, towards the end. At least any any observations? I mean, I actually got that prediction right. I, know, I just told everyone that I thought Thermodynamics would win. That was my way to motivate Brave Collective. They need that sort of reinforcement. So I am 100% right in my predictions. Also, very impressed with Brave Collective. Uh, these guys, they are not just newbies. They know how to, you know, they know how to fly in an Alliance Hornet setting. 10 on 10, they just beat some of the most skilled pilots in a, a, basically a fair fight. So, uh, you know, props to them. They had better execution, <laughs> better started. target calling. Basically fair. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, fair. wonderful. Uh, we did see uh, some uh, some excellent logic happening there uh, from Braven, and mention of it in the booth, uh, Yukiko uh, yep. ha has, has performed uh, amazingly throughout the tournament uh, thus far. Uh, that that moment where uh, it it looked like the the Bazzi was gonna go and then just came right back was it just a, an ASB that that hadn't been triggered what was going on? Um, yeah, it was definitely most certainly an ASB. Those uh, the Basilisk is fit with a large ancillary booster. Uh, you get nine charges. Doesn't run on cap. You can just you know say who cares about the newts from the Armageddon flag again? Eh, no big deal. No big deal. Uh, that, that's what Brave says. No big deal. That's uh, that's how they run it. Uh, we will see a Brave move forward in this Alliance tournament as Thermodynamics bows out, uh, and that will set us up for the next match coming up here: uh, Shadow Cartel versus Test Alliance. Please ignore uh, now. Uh, we've already gotten the bans in for this match, and they've been given to the commentators here. Uh, Shadow Cartel uh, banning out the Scimitar, the Harbinger Navy issue, and the Oneros. And Test Alliance, please ignore targeting the Cerberus. The Gila and the Vindicator, uh, looking at that strong Serpentis battleship. Uh, what do we think these bands indicate about what these teams are bringing to the field uh, based on their performance earlier in the tournament? So again, when you ban Vindicator, you're sort of saying, I don't want you to have a very strong battleship sitting at zero. I want to be able to, if I have the option, bring my team in at zero kilometers to the beacon, or at least something at zero kilometers to the beacon. Um, so that's, you know, that's generally what the Vindy says. We saw that earlier today um, where uh, Skill U, you had that Vindy ban and they brought something completely different. Um, this is a last Vindy ban, so I think Test kind of want to bring something uh, a little bit more broadly, probably very battleship heavy core. They're going to put it right in the center. Uh, worth mentioning here, uh, as you indicated, this is the last ban. Uh, it, it may or may not be the the last ban. We're not sure who got to go first, but the way that the bans are are delivered uh, is that the first team gets to ban one ship, the second team two ships, back to the first team for two more ships, and then uh, back to the second team mm -hmm. for the final ban. Uh, I'm not sure if Test went first or second here. It it seems like they might based on uh, the way that the bands look to me. Yeah. At the very least, it was their last band. Yeah. So, I mean, they wanted to conceal that as long as they p potentially could. And uh, th that's what I would glean from it. But, you know, there's so many mind games that you can do with the banning. Uh, you can really, if you take it too seriously, you can definitely lose a match by getting inside your own head. The Alliance tournament not to be taken too seriously. Uh, Rain, what do you have to say about, about these bands and what it means for what we're going to see? So, looking at the test bands, I believe... Uh, Shadow Cartel actually had brought a Rapid Light spam 
um, setup before as well as a drone spam setup, if I'm remembering correctly. So that's where maybe the Serb and the Gila ban come from. But looking at Shadow Cartel's bans, it looks like the Simi and the Oneros being both the really good T2 logistics cruisers. So they don't want to see either of those. And then the Navy Harvey, which is crucial to those battle cruiser cores. So they might be banning those and then, say, juking and then bringing a different logistics ship or still bringing the battle cruiser, the Navy battle cruisers, just excluding the Navy Harbinger. But we I have mean, seen, sorry to cut you off, we have seen mm -hmm. Test bring Tech 2 logistics frigates. Oh, that is true. So, they beat in Ronin. fact, they beat Ronin, the masters of the Tech 2 logistics frigate. They beat them at their own game. Test has been doing really well this tournament thus far. At least, is, is I mean, to my untrained eye, I've had a, a wonderful time watching them, and it's it's always great to see a, a team that that has come to the tournament time and again mm -hmm. uh, progress at least this far and and do so by kind of mixing things up a little bit, not necessarily following exactly what uh, what they've done in previous years. Uh, I, I certainly have, have enjoyed watching their fights. I, I think that my vote here would be for Test. I, I, I just like them. That lizard with his suit? What's his name? What's his name? Super super executive suit suit lizard? Uh, uh, yeah. That's his name, That's right? his name. That's his official, this is that's his name. official real name. So uh, interesting. If Tess do lose, I'm going to be interested to see if anyone from their team has to eat hot wings. Is that is that a thing? <laughs> that is a thing. I think... Didn't Pro God Legend do that on Twitch the other weekend? Uh, Pro God Legend, one of the FCs for Test Alliance, uh, got his entire fleet killed. Happens regularly for him, but it's okay. Wow. And uh, as punishment, um, he got him killed in a, in a different way. Uh, he went into a wormhole and then couldn't probe himself back out. So as punishment, uh, he said to his, his fleet mates, I will eat the hottest wings that I can find. And so he did. We're, we're I mean... Did, did he stream it? How yeah, did it go? Oh, yeah. He did. He, he streamed did stream it. it. Yeah, yeah. How, how was it? Uh, his face got a little red. Uh, I saw his washing machine news. It sounds delightful. I'm actually a big fan of hot wings. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how, how could you go wrong? It's not much of a punishment. I mean, could have picked anything his else. His face got really red, and I think... Bananas. Oh, I think he couldn't feel the left side of his face for about 45 <laughs> minutes. Sometimes that implies uh, something, something way worse. If you can't feel the left side of your face, please contact a medical professional directly. Also, don't eat hot wings if you can't have hot wings. Recommended. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, prediction for the fight? I'm definitely going for Shadow Cartel. Shadow Cartel has one of my, one of my favorite friends, Bunny Wink on it, or Erica, who's their logistics pilot. So I'm hoping that they bring some logistics so I can see her fly around. But yeah, definitely cheering for Shadow Cartel. I am. Uh, I'm going with my head instead of my heart on this one. I'm going to go with Test Alliance. Uh, Test Alliance, please ignore taking two votes from us here at the desk uh, versus uh, Shadow Cartel. Uh, and we will throw it over to the boys in the booth for this match. Shadow Cartel versus Test Alliance, please ignore here at Alliance Tournament 15. Hello everyone and welcome back. As we all know, Elise's head much, much bigger than his heart. So it's glad to see him uh, concentrating on the smaller things in life. Um, here we've got Shadow Cartel going up against Test Alliance, please ignore. Shadow Cartel bringing a very conservative um, drone spam setup, but modifying it a little bit, bringing an Ares and a Hound as their support. Whereas Test Alliance, please ignore, is bringing a very interesting version of the setup they brought against the Ronin, um, going with a four BCs and a Starte, two Deacons and two Vengeances. One of the most important things, I think, during the start of this match is going to be whether or not those Vengeances are able to screen that Ares and keep it away from the Deacons. If they don't, they're going to really struggle to apply to those logistics frigates, especially with those boosts. Yeah, and uh, as Jintan was just saying, what the double Deacon setup allows you to do is it gives you total of seven points more to work with. Uh, double Deacon costs a total of 10 points, and an Onero, any sort of a Tech 2 armor or shield, Lodgy, will cost you 17. So that gives you a lot more points to work with, and that's why uh, they can go with Double Vengeance instead of uh, Hound Ares, which is uh, less uh, cost overall. And interestingly enough, uh, Test Alliance, please ignore, only choosing to bring in 99 points in their uh, composition, which is why uh, Shadow Cartel starts off with uh, a lead uh, burst going off uh, as we uh, begin the match. 
Yeah, this is obviously the 100th match of the tournament, so let's see who which team is 100 here as the match starts, if we can get a view. We can see that Ares there of Chris Elliott burning, taking a really defensive... Hound already there. deleted, so that will Ooh. be the artillery of the Fleet Hurricanes and the Railguns of the Brutics, completely getting rid of either bomb damage or torp damage that applies excellently to the Battlecruiser core. Excellent target calling by Taft, and where is the Shadow Cartel attack bar right now? It's it's there, but it's if the drones Moving have to move, forward. you have to see that. Look at Chris Elliott's piloting here, it's so excellent. He's like crisply moving in, keeping his angles as good as he possibly can so that he can't get blapped by these canes as he moves in towards this Deacon. Looks like he's heading towards, I can't see from this angle, but he's got a tackle there on Dante. And it, that seems to be where all the drones are applying. Shadow Cartel here, able to sneak in an interceptor to that fleet under Guardian reps and look at how, look at how much damage that uh, Deacon is taking. Yeah, he no longer has the tackle on top, but that was some Chester Tier uh, turning and burning uh, and uh, feathering right on top of that Deacon uh, setup. He needs to get tackle back on top of one of those two Deacons uh, because without the ability to slow it down, uh, those drones will have difficulty tracking the very low signature uh, radius that those Deacons have. That makes it uh, much more difficult to target. Chris, however, unfortunately also tackled. Looks like those Vengeances have been doing their job as well. So now it's going to be a race. Which team can kill the other team's frigates first? This is something we don't normally see in the Alliance tournament. It's something we normally see on TQ. And the Ares goes down without keeping a web or a scram on the Test Alliance Deacons. That's going to give Test Alliance a huge sustained advantage going through this match. You know, those drones can't apply to it very well. Yeah, uh, Mr. Hyde would absolutely be pleased uh, Test Alliance, please ignore getting rid of the uh, Frigate Menace, and that those two Deacons are absolutely menacing in their own right, uh, being able to do a good job of uh, surviving. But they need to get the rep off of each other and onto that Fleet Hurricane, who is now the new primary. I like the choice of Soldaris being the team captain of a test as your opening primary. Yeah, right now, it, what it looks like is Shadow Cartel is going to have to, to kind of grind out this test comp. They aren't going to have the ability to kill those Deacons, so what they've got to do is they've got to take off as much damage from the field as possible, and it looks like Test here is just shooting their drones, trying to defang this Shadow Cartel comp. That's an incredibly conservative, but also intelligent move here. Do we see this uh, very often? Yeah, we have been seeing it a lot of often. Uh, as a uh one of the uh, influences that I take in casting Arctosis once said, you don't have to just win the match immediately. You just want to get progressively more ahead. And that's what Test is doing. By whittling away at the drones, uh, especially of like the Stratos and the Vexers that have a smaller overall bay, they can bleed them out. And sure, they might have uh, a presence on the field, but if they have no drones, they might as well be dead in the water, uh, provided that they don't have some sort of offensive module like a Scram or a Web, which it doesn't appear like they do, because at this point, you would want to sacrifice a Vexor or two to get rid of those Deacons. Look at how tiny that control bar is. It is minuscule. Shadow Cartel have brought nothing but drone nav comps in their mids by the looks of things, just trying to get their drones out there onto a primary target as fast as possible. It looks like this is almost a attempt at bringing a Mirror Breaker version of the uh, drone setup. Yeah, like you're saying, that control bar is somehow smaller than Elise's heart, and uh, Shadow Cartel uh, not being able to break anything so far. Uh, we see Rep Drones and uh, the repairs on that Fleet Hurricane sustaining him for the last two to three minutes so far. Yeah, and this is something we don't, we wouldn't normally expect from Test. Test have historically been one of the most interesting theory crafting teams in the Alliance tournament, bringing in things like the Mobile Tinker and bringing in things like, oh god, the Distributed Tinker. But here, they seem to be really stepping up on their execution and their, like, understanding of wind conditions. Would you say that Test here has their wind condition now down? Just kill the drones and point them out. Yeah, they knew what they needed to do when they saw the setup on field, and they're executing it perfectly. Even though it looks boring, we don't have a lot of points so far uh, scored, uh, Test is doing exactly what they need to, and they're doing uh, it so, so far so well. Shadow Cartel is right now trying to stick to uh, roughly towards the... MJD beacons, and they're not able to have any sort of tackle or screen. Yeah, that's a great view, Lair. You can see all of these drones just go popping one after the other, just snap, 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 trying to replace them, but it's just not doing anything. In my opinion, Shadow Cartel here, right now, they need to pull in their drones, and they need to try and either bump those deacons away or do something absolutely crazy, because the way they're doing it right now is they're playing into a losing game. Yeah, uh, Test is absolutely playing the uh, game of drones perfectly, and, you know, if you... Uh, if you, you lose, you die in the game of drones, and uh, Shadow Cartel, their ships might not be dying, but uh, their drones are uh, 
Falling. being worked away at. Yeah, it's this is going to be a this is going to be a very slow, very grindy match. But I want to see if Shadow Cartel can make a play here. They still have options. It's not like they brought Vex and Navy issues, which are incredibly vulnerable to defanging. It's why we've seen uh, so few of them brought recently. Is that if you kill one flight from them, they're done. They're out. And as teams have gotten better and better, as we whittled away the chaff, what we're ending up now is with teams that understand to shoot the drones. These drone comps are getting worse by the day. There are still a number of drone comps that are very uh, highly viable and that we definitely will see towards uh, the end of the tournament. Uh, one of the problems, though, is that this drone comp that they've brought is uh, one-dimensional. So you need to be three-dimensional in your thought process. So that control bar is rather small. So Jin, you uh, like 2D, so that's understandable. Uh, that's also why CVA isn't in the uh, tournament this year, is they don't have the uh, three dimensions and the depth uh, at this point. <laughs> Why are you going to throw that to me on the commentary desk? But <laughs> All right, so right now what we're seeing is we're seeing Shadow Cartel still trying to grind through this Brutix of Digital Charon, and we're finally seeing some Test Alliance... Oh, and we're finally seeing some Test Alliance damage start to go onto the EOS of Digigala. It looks like he's strayed a little too close there, somehow being caught despite being a kiting drone ship. But honestly, it doesn't surprise me. Those two Deacons have been piloting really well. They managed to trap that Ares, and they managed to trap that Hound. It's going to go up well for them. The real question is really, what can Shadow Cartel do at this point? So, one of the things that we're now seeing with that control bar being as small as it was, they probably have a target painter, and that's probably the extent of the, their control bar. So, if they don't have any webs, uh, these Deacons are uh, after burning at that speed, so they're uh, not running any sort of micro warp drive. If they don't have any webs, they can't slow them down. If they can't slow them down, their drones won't track. If you don't have tracking on your drones, you're never going to kill anything. Mm. So what could they do? Could you potentially see them going in and trying to bump people away from the Deacons? Because we know they have a really short range. Yeah, they would have to at this point. And look at the attack bar on Shadow Cartel. Uh, not only is the red, which is the applied damage, rather low, but the grayed out bar, which is your potential damage, is so low. And that's because Test Alliance this entire time has been working away at the drone bay, and it looks like Test is now going to be starting to work at uh, Erica Durant's uh, Guardian, uh, a number that are a member of a uh, Team 10, uh, not uh, winning so far. Oh, it's fine. We'll uh, we'll win on the field of anime, which is where it counts. Um, but yeah, it looks like Test Alliance here going for that Guardian, just trying to secure their points lead, because quite frankly, Shadow Cartel here has been put into the dark. They've got no options. They're just trying to secure their points lead, just in case someone, I don't know, disconnects and boundaries, I think. Yeah, uh, not much that Shadow Cartel can do at this point. Uh, Test is just now chewing through uh, the armor or of Erica Durant, and being an offensive drone team, you're not going to have that repair uh, bots in your bay to sustain the Guardian. Doing so would essentially leave you with uh, no damage. Yeah, and there's effectively no reason for Test here to make any more aggressive of a play. They just need to slowly grind through these ships and secure their pretty much already bought victory. You know, Test not being tested here. Yeah, um, I mean, they were initially put to the test by that Ares, uh, who kind of overshot, uh, which is why we saw the uh, scram and the web uh, drop off of that Deacon. Had he been able to stop on top of there and just hit the space bar or uh, manually uh, click around in space, and we see the, the Guardian, Guardian now drop. Uh, Erica Drantz is a Vohai no more, and uh, oh, it has, Shadow Cartel is actually boundary violating. Uh, they uh, have decided that they are uh, no longer interested in continuing uh, their involvement in this match. Uh, Rather unfortunate way to go out of the tournament. But at least we don't have to sit here and talk about how Shadow Cartel don't have any options for the next minute. Yeah, well, uh, we still have another minute. Some of the uh, Eoses and uh, the Stratos and Ishtar are still alive. Uh, maybe that's uh, some salt uh, on the Shadow Cartel side. I would be rather uh, frustrated if I uh, lost in this manner to test. Yeah, this is going to be absolutely heartbreaking. You know, Shadow Cartel is a team with a lot of institutional experience in the Alliance tournament. They've played here for a long time, but they've slowly been on, been on this downturn for the past couple of ATs. And whilst they did manage to get kind of far this year, they're still falling at the same kind of a level of hurdles. Test Alliance, a well-known kind of gatekeeper team. Uh, gatekeeper team, mean, meaning if, you, uh, if you're in like the top eight, you'll probably beat Test. If you're below the top eight, you're going to get stomped by Test. And that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Shadow Cartel, uh, having their Eoses get tackled, they're not going to die at this point in the next 10 seconds. Uh, 
unless they choose to boundary like their uh, comrades uh, test. I mean, none of their ships are even in armor at this point. They weren't really uh, taking much damage. Uh, Dialga now dropping as uh, time expires. We will send it back to the uh, man of the desk who has the best pun, Oko's CCP Antiquarian. And there we have Test Alliance, please ignore, moving ahead of Shadow Cartel, advancing in the tournament in this elimination bracket, uh, Shadow going home uh, in what really came down to an early frigate fight. We had that one interceptor going up against two logistics frigates, who was going to make it uh, and and survive into later in the fight. I, I heard you whispering under your breath, Test have it, Test have it. Yeah. Uh, 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 Rain, what did you think? So definitely um, went to test very early on, as we as we saw. I believe uh, Shadow Cartel probably could have strategized a little better using their Ewar mid slots or even using the drone spam that they have, using Ewar drones. However, they decided just to go full on DPS using the target painters, um, and then obviously it didn't play it out. They only had their tackle within that one Aries, and once he died, their hopes of winning died. Yeah, I mean, you saw what. The Shadow Cartel team tried to do, they, they kind of took a, a page out of Exodus's book uh, with the Interceptor, which proved vital when Exodus had it, because they have one of the best pilots, not only in the Alliance tournament, uh, but possibly in the game. Wasa QC, he was able to stop every micro jump um, in the previous week with that Interceptor. So Shadow Cartel's like, oh, that's a good idea, I'm going to take that Interceptor. Unfortunately, they couldn't execute the exact same way, and that's part of the problem when you're on the back foot in the Alliance tournament. You try and copy someone's um, set up or try and you know take a page out of their book, but you don't have the time to practice and execute. And that's what we saw there. Uh, the drone spam just it's very strong in the first few weeks, but teams know how to take care of it. Like Test took a team that they knew could beat drone spam. They knew they could beat battle cruisers with it, and you know just Shadow Cartel were on the back foot the entire time. Now there's the question: that Ares survives into say the third minute of the match. What do we see happening instead? So if and it's a big if here because I don't like Shadow Cartel's total team, but if they could keep that Ares alive and pin down one of the Deacons. We saw the Deacon actually outfly the Ares, but if he could keep it tackled and webbed, the, uh, you know, one Deacon goes down and that entire test team starts falling apart. Agreed, yep. What do you think about the decision to go and, uh, I, I think the word that we used in the booth there was defang, uh, by targeting just the drones. It was mentioned that it was a conservative play, but also intelligent. Could they have just moved on to the ships and and not worried so much about the drones? They could have. It would have put more pressure on those Deacon pilots, and it would have also given um, Shadow Cartel the potential to win. So when you defang them and essentially kill all their DPS, then no matter how badly your team essentially pilots, as long as you're not flying out of the arena, you will be okay. So like, say the Deacon pilots got too far away from each other, say you know somebody accidentally disconnected, or they were just unable to land reps right away because they fell asleep at the computer, they would still... Tess would still be ahead, having defanged Shadow Cartel. Now, Elise, how often is it that someone falls asleep at their computer during one of these uh, during one of these alliance I mean, it, matches? It's, it's very rare. Uh, sometimes when you're winning so hard as tested in that match, maybe it could have been. Uh, they an got bored. Problem. They got yeah. bored of winning. Yeah. But uh, that happens. Uh, <laughs> Uh, of course, uh, Tess will move forward, and uh, Shadow Cartel will go home. Uh, they will not be in the top 16 as we emerge uh, from the end of combat today here at the 
Coliseum of the Cosmos Alliance Ooh, Tournament 15. Nice. Uh, Real nice. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Uh, we're going to move forward with our next match, and we already have the bands in for that. That the Bastard Cartel uh, versus We Form Volta, and they are uh, pretty much set to take the arena in the next five minutes here, uh, keeping us delightfully on schedule for Alliance Tournament 15. Everybody, everybody quite happy about it. Uh, the Bastard Cartel's bands, and let me make sure that I have this correct. Uh, Bastard Cartel banning out the Armageddon, uh, the Slepnir, and the Rattlesnake. Two battleships there being targeted, and that, uh, that Slepnir. Uh, and the uh, We Form Volta team have gone for the Blackbird, the Vindicator, another Serpentis ship, and uh, the Ishtar. It's the second time we've seen the Ishtar come up today, yeah. as a matter of fact. What do we think about those bands? So, Volta, I believe, had been jammed by, their bla by a Blackbird in their last match last weekend, and that caused them to go into the elimination bracket. So I think this might be a sort of bitter ban, as though because they have been burned by it before. There are other ways to get around ECM and jams, but Volta doesn't want to take that chance. So I think that's why they brought up the Blackbird. Yeah, sometimes you have to ban with your heart, not with your head. Now, do they leave that open? Uh, of course, there are other other ships available at a slightly higher point cost that can apply uh, e war on the grid. Uh, just blinding the Blackbird, is that enough to protect them from that tactic? It could be, because Blackbirds are, like you said, cheaper points. They're also a cruiser hull, so they're a little tankier than, say, the Kitsune or the Griffin. But at the same time, it's a very clear they don't want ECM, and it's allow it forces the Bastard Cartel, if they want to bring ECM, um, to sort of rethink what their whole comp is, rather than just saying, oh, we have a cruiser, we have a cruiser spot, let's just throw in a Blackbird. Yeah. At least? So, uh, I mean, the Blackbird is so annoying to deal with, right? Because... <laughs> It's really kind of durable. It could be in a shield or an armor setup. Um, you don't really have to fly it that well. I mean, you have to push buttons, but it's a griffin and a kitsune are much harder to fl uh, fly, and you have to have a team built around it. You can just shove a blackbird in there, and, and it'll be fine. It'll, it'll get a jam off, and then you'll lose, and you'll feel real sad. So, uh, you know, Volta, they don't want to see that blackbird. They don't want to be sad. They also <laughs> banned the Vindi, which we've been seeing quite a bit. And uh, I've been saying that a lot of the reason behind banning of Indy is you want to stick together as your core or you want to bring a battleship heavy core to the center of the arena, potentially, uh, and you don't want that like just shredding your team to bits. So what do you see them bringing? I think Volta are going to bring Dominixes. <laughs> We've seen Dominixes twice in the Alliance tournament out of 100 matches, 101 matches. I think we're going to see it again. So, so I'm, I'm calling my shot. I hope Starfleet Commander brings Dominixes so I don't look like a fool. But uh, he loves the Dominic's hull. I mean, it's just, he's wild. I, I see. And, uh, and do you think, do, it, supposing that your prediction is correct, that we see some Dominic's uh, on the grid, can they deliver? Who wins this fight? If Volta bring Dominic's, they win the match. Otherwise? They probably still win the match. So Volta is your call. <laughs> yeah. let's, just, let's just get that out there in, in no uncertain predicated terms. Mm -hmm. You pick Volta. Yeah. He... Forms Volta. Uh, Rain, what do you think? Uh, Volta versus the Bastard Cartel. Is this is this Bastard's first appearance here? I don't believe they were here last year, and they've made it pretty far this year. I don't I don't quite remember them being like a well known team within I'm, the Alliance tournament. I'm I'm going to to follow up later to to check. I'm, I mean I'm not sure about their pilots. Obviously, they may have come from mm -hmm. um, from participating teams previously. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not sure that I've seen. I the believe Bastard they Cartel. have members from other teams, so this isn't like the the first mm. time the people have flown. But this I believe is the first time that their namesake has been flown in the Bastard Cartel. Um, you know, Volta. They've previously won Alliance Hornet before uh, under a different name themselves. Uh, they won Alliance Hornet ten under Starfleet Commander. So, you know, this is, the, the elimination bracket is chock full of Alliance Hornet winning teams. It's really weird to see. What was their team name? It was, it starts with V as well. It's, this is going to drive me nuts. I thought they won. We form Voltron. I thought they won under Try. I might be thinking of someone completely different, though. This is going to drive me crazy. I'm pretty sure it's We form Voltron. We form Voltron didn't no. win. No. No. I'm, I'm pretty sure Alliance Hornet 10. Was it called We Form Voltron, though? That's I mean, the question. I this mean, is not important. Uh, they won. So, they got a bunch of it. <laughs> so, uh, your prediction, We Form Volta. Rain, your prediction. Uh, Definitely Volta. Uh, also Volta. I am not going to argue against uh, the two experts sitting next to me. I am going to kick it to the two experts uh, standing at the booth, ready to deliver us this match 101, the Bastard Cartel versus We Form Volta here on Alliance Tournament 15. 
Hello everyone, I've had to unbutton my jacket because this match is just too hot to handle. We are seeing some of the biggest monies being fielded on one uh, in one match that we have seen so far. We've got a Rabiasu, we've got two Flag Balgorns. This is going to be expensive no matter who wins or loses. Um, just quickly, I want to run down this E-War fight that's going to happen right at the start of this match. The Flag Balgorn uh, for the blue team Volta is at zero and the, uh, the Crucifier is going to be trying to stop the Bastard Cartel from applying its damage to the Kitsunes and other support that they've brought. Moderator, go! Yeah, both teams giving us a uh, 101 in uh, bringing pimp ships as uh, this is the most expensive match so far in the Alliance, Tire Alliance tournament. Already Flag Balgorns are webbing each other off, so uh, th there are jams on top of the Balgorn of Kendra. If they can get that on top of him sustained, that'll be excellent. Volta choosing to get the webs on the Deacon and the Purifier. If they can use the Purifier to uh, get tracked by the Navy Harbingers, which themselves are being tracked and disrupted, which is why we see this Purifier of Kiakul survive, that'll do a lot. Right now, the Kitsune is the primary of Bastard Cartel, wanting to get the jams off of the grid that do so much to those Deacons, the Arbitrators, and the Balgorn. Look at how unbelievably girthy both of those control bars are. This is a real E-War matchup. I'm hoping that we can get a look at that the Deacon of Predator 989 there. It looks like he's being webbed by the Balgorn of Mystical Might. He came in at zero, um, but, you know... The Deacon already dropping into low armor. If that Deacon drops, the next Deacon will oh follow. Oh my god. The Purifier will follow after that. The Arbitrators won't be long for this world. And so far, Volta is surviving. Their logistics is keeping a good job of getting repped on top of Andy Gardet. Another the Purifier, purifier dropping. So much DPS here dropping from the Bastard Cartel. It looks like Carthenor is webbed as well. He will go down soon. And that's going to take all of the sustain away from this Bastard Cartel to comp in just under a minute We have in the confirmed match. gems on top of that Belgrin. The control bar is not applying for Bastard Cartel. That is why we are not seeing webs across the field onto any Volta targets. That Kitsune is almost certainly stacked with Amar Jammers. Volta mind gaming Bastard Cartel to the nth degree. Cooling their shot and hitting it perfectly. Just r just running through them. You can see just how fast they've been able to get on top of this team, apply that control, and just take that Navy Harbinger to town with almost nothing being traded back from the Bastard Cartel. There's no damage being applied. Yeah, so this was a very close to a mirror matchup. Some of the uh, lower end ships are a little bit different, but those Vigilants having the 90% webs are certainly Navy going to be down. applying, and they are locking down these ships. That's why we see Arbitrators going only at 30 kilometers. If they can get the tracking disruptors off the field, and it looks like they are, those Harbingers will be hitting for that much more damage. Yeah, it's strange how little these Arbitrators have been able to do just because Volta has been able to just push in there. They didn't have the defensive kind of control that is brought by the webs, by the newts of that Balgorn, which could keep Volta from just running riot over them and another Arbitrator down. This is disaster for the Bastard Cartel. Yeah, and the Bastard Cartel, their Balgorn does not have any sort of a turret in their high slot. It's all newts, it's all smart bombs uh, in those high slots. The Deacon uh, now dropping. Yeah, might have all newts in the high slot, but I think it's about to be all dead in a couple of minutes here. <laughs> Just things dying left and right. Ehrenhorn in the uh, in another Arbitrator going down, and there is nothing the Bastard Cartel can do at this point. I honestly think they should be moving towards the beacons and trying to deny we form Volta of the loop. Yeah, uh, Starfleet Commander uh, once infamously said, uh, kill the Balgorn, don't let him boundary violate. And we can see that they have Scram and Web on top of that Balgorn. They are going to get the entirety of what will almost certainly be high-tier officer webs. The uh, Brudix being uh, Nost will have trouble sustaining his active tank. That's why we're seeing him drop so fast. Excellently played by Volta. That Kitsune, I would love to see what jammers he had, uh, given how uh, much Bastard Cartel was locked out on their Deacons, their Arbitrators, and their Balgorn. I'm willing to bet it was almost all Amar jammers. Yeah, Bastard Cartel was locked out, lo uh, locked out, and Volta has locked in a W here. The real question is, um, can you try and explain to us a little bit what the Rabiasu does in this comp and why it's so much better than, say, an Aneros or a Guardian? So, a Rabiasu is basically a Guardian but on steroids. It was the Alliance Tournament uh, prize ship last year, Alliance Tournament 14. Uh, Volta came in third place that last year as the Navy Harbinger of uh, Ido Benedict drops. Uh, the Rubisu has a significant armor tank and is much more uh, powerful in a uh, buffer than either other Tech 2 uh, armor variant. Yeah, and obviously that Pontifex there, it's got a multiple roles. So the first is it's going to be able to bring boosts, but the secondary one is that Defender Launcher. We saw that earlier, and we're going to start to see more of these Command Destroyers, I think, because of just the pure power of these Rep Drones. 
being put on Rabiasus and being put on Guardians to keep them alive. It's so, so important to these kind of top heavy comps. Yeah, and we're seeing in local uh, Rabiasu op, please nerf. Uh, they may uh, be seeing some posts later about that. Uh, from Bastard Cartel. Uh, Bastard Cartel actually being the old Agony Empire core uh, merged with uh, Bastard Cartel. Uh, Agony was a team that historically did uh, very well in uh, small gang roaming in the curse region of uh, Tranquility. And they've also had a very deep run in previous Alliance tournaments. Uh, they were one of the teams that uh, played all the way up to top six or top eight, I believe, uh, going a couple years back. And uh, that Balgorn now uh, into Law Armor, now Hull, Kendall de Langre is uh, no Langre for this world. Rip in pieces, it seems. I really hope we can get the kill mail of that Balgorn because I'd love to see how it's fit. We've seen so many different versions from the all new to the guns. And whilst we're pretty sure this one is all new, it'll be interesting to see if they fit the officer newts or a smart bomb. There's so many different choices you have with the Balgorn, and that's why it's used so often as the flagship. Yeah, uh, Volt is showing the power of uh, flagship Balgorn paired with the Rabiasu. But again, one of the weaknesses in being showed by TikTok Tizik is that it's very weak to Amar Jammers if you don't have the uh, remote seat and sir boosters uh, to give uh, you that boost to your ECM strength. And Izu drops, and with that, Volta. You know, not, in, not a shocking victory there. Yeah. Uh, with that, uh, we'll send it back to the desk. Eve Dublin returns this October 20th and 21st. For tickets and more details, please visit www.evedublin.com. And there we have it, Weform Volta advancing ahead of the Bastard Cartel with an uh, amazing execution of their comp. Uh, you saw that control bar on the on the screen completely filled up all the way across the screen for both teams. Uh, of course, that indicating how much potential they have, not necessarily whether or not their E-War effects are actually being applied. Uh, so you had both teams going at full strength, trying to, to overpower the other uh, with E-War, and, and the effect was just what we saw. Uh, uh, of course, the, the Rabisu making an appearance on the field amazing, uh, I, and that is a great ship, a great little logistics replacement. Uh, any comments on the match, Rain? So I think that was more a game of control than anything else. Obviously, you have to call the targets of either your ECM jams, your tracking disruptors, those Balgorn webs and newts, and... Um, I was going to say, Volta actually successfully pulled it off. They immediately eliminated the logistics, then they eliminated the support, and then they eliminated the Bastard Cartel's DPS core. Very good target calling by them. Elise? Yeah, I mean, they, they got ice water in their veins. They were calm, cool, collected. That is my favorite comp that I've seen so far in the Alliance tournament. Uh, just because really... of the bling, or no, because, no, just because, because of, of the actual of utility how well of the it was ships? Put together, you know? like, it's, control teams are my favorite archetype uh, because they can do so much damage if you pilot them well. Uh, you don't have to, like, Click in space a lot. We have to make you know decisions. You gotta think. It's a thinking man's comp. You know. You like control, but you don't like the blackbird. Is yeah. that no? I mean, I mean, the blackbird's just annoying. You know, so <laughs> don't want, no one wants to deal with that. And uh, you know, that might have been like a little bit of a fake out jam too, because Volta are the one that banned the blackbird, and they brought the kitsune. Now we do have a uh, infographic we can throw up on the on the screen right now uh, about E War uh, and about how that works. Um, as far as the the ships in the Alliance tournament and the restrictions there, uh, there are a number there are a number of effects that they can play. Uh, we we may not have that video up right <laughs> now, uh, but uh, in addition to uh, controlling whether or not a a target can be locked, now that's. Uh, 
that's jams. Yeah. Uh, we've also got uh, people that are neutralizing the energy of the other team, and that's classed as Ewer and shows up in the control bar as well. Mm -hmm. uh, energy newts, energy nosses, anything that's going to take away capacitor and the ability. Uh, what other forms of Ewer do we have, and, and have we seen them much in this Alliance tournament? So we saw the tracking disruptors, so that um, I think I believe it limits your actual weapon modules, either it's the optimal or the range. So that way you become less effective, even if you are pilot, like piloting correctly or your opponent's piloting correctly. Yeah. So um, you've got you've got the sensor dams, you've got the tracking disruptor, and you've got e e war. You know. So uh, we saw a lot of tracking disruptor in that match and missile uh, guidance disruptors, which the team has brought just in case there was some uh, RLML spam, but you know didn't have to do with it. And of course, here we see. have electronic countermeasures, uh, which is a way to kind of uh, combat. Uh, being jammed out mm -hmm. by the other team. Uh, of course, different ways that you can do that uh, to ensure that you're still able to lock onto the other team uh, and deliver that damage. Uh, Volta, of course, able to apply their control much more effectively than the Bastard Cartel uh, leading to that victory. And them advancing in this elimination bracket. Yeah. Uh, we'll see more of them uh, tomorrow. Uh, I mean, they're, they're a dark horse favorite to win the whole thing. You know, if they were still in the um, like the top bracket, I think they would have just gone all the way through to the grand finals, not dropping a match. You of think course, so? They, they dropped a match, so they wanted to make it hard. They wanted to go down to the elimination bracket because you know that's where you get to really test your metal as a, as an alliance tournament team. Most of the previous winners have come from the elimination bracket. You don't say. Yeah, you get your backs to the wall. You get that mean face on. And you're like, "Er, I'm gonna beat everybody," and that, that's what they're trying to do. A master class. I mean, we saw the double deacons. Uh, they neutered one deacon and webbed the other one. Uh, so they couldn't help each other, and then they shot this guy. Just smart, smart plays. <laughs> uh, uh, of course, it does make it a lot more difficult in that last day, uh, if you or in the last weekend rather, if you move through the elimination bracket. You do have to win against uh, the team. Uh, you have to f face more fights in a row yep. uh, than the team uh, that comes through the undefeated bracket. Yeah, uh, and they get, I think, a, a an automatic one match yep. uh, or one f one. Battle lead yeah. in the match. One game lead in the, in the best of five finals. Um, but you know what? If you're on a roll, I mean, you, you get a you get a hot hand. I'm told that that that's a real thing. In in baseball, it's a real thing. In in uh, the alliance tournament, uh, we have yet to analyze the you got, metrics. You got the hot see, fingers, but it, it could be the case. The hot mouse. Yeah, the hot uh, fingers. Like hot that's fingers. How you play Eve? Two fingers. That's these two. The, just no. I just use F1. Just it's, I was told that's the way to go. Ray, don't shake your head. Don't shake your head at me. I'm having a good time. Uh, also having a good time, the Mercenary Coalition and the Bright Side of Death. Uh, both of them have had one loss so far in the tournament, and they will face off e against each other next in match 102 of Alliance Tournament 15. Uh, the Mercenary Coalition and the Bright Side of Death. Uh, we do have the bands that have come in for that match, and I don't believe that either of you know them, so me reading them out will be the first you've heard. Big reveal here Can't on Alliance Tournament. I love this. The Mer the Mercenary Coalition have banned the Prophecy, the Eos, and the Ferox. And Bright Side of Death have gone for the Astarte, the Gila, and the Scimitar. Did you say Prophecy? Man. Prophecy, yes. Eos, Ferox. I have, have we seen the Prophecy in no Not today. Okay. We have before. We've seen one Prophecy uh, before, and I think maybe Mercenary Coalition fielded, fielded it. Uh, it's a weird... Weird ship to waste a ban on. I don't, I don't know. Maybe they've got some intel. Maybe they know Bright Side of Death just loves the... Well, what does the prophecy bring to the field? We're looking at that uh, T1 Amar cruiser hull, so it's cheap. Yep. Uh, it's uh, kind of a command ship. It's the, it their, links, their version yeah. of the... Yeah, it's, I mean, it gives links. It's very durable. It has some drones. Uh, it's got a few mid slots too, but it, nothing to write home about. Just a really tanky, and it kind of looks like a... But it looks like a chicken a little it, bit. It does look like a. It, it looks like a very robust eagle. Yeah, I mean, he's, it's, he's, it's he's eaten a well fat, yeah. through the spring, and he's prepared for the winter. Uh, the prophecy, uh, perhaps unusual. E Eos Ferox, what does that mean? So the Ferox is really good for doing the long range GPS. We've seen it a lot paired with Slepners. Um so I would see that a little more reasonable than say the Ferox or the prophecy or the Eos. Yeah, the uh, the attack battle cruiser there. Ooh, ooh. Uh, battle cruisers on the screen. Now, this uh, the prophecy I was talking about earlier should show up at some. No, these are just the tier three mm -hmm. attack battle cruisers. Uh, we have uh, very rarely seen these uh, these ships actually used, uh, just because people are afraid to bring them. And the navy battle cruisers 
uh, do a lot of what they do, but they have drones to you know augment that. I'm always depressed that the Oracle doesn't make more of an appearance at the Alliance. You know, me just, too. Me too. It's, it's just a beautiful glass cannon. It just <laughs> and if you hook it up with with you know those uh, tachyons. Or uh, I mean, any anything, and just knock from range. Just love yeah. it. We've seen teams in the past try and bring uh, oracles yeah. to the alliance. Yeah. They yeah. just balls of fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just shat- shattered light bulbs. Uh, okay, uh, the bands coming from Bright Side of Death, the Astarte, the Gila, the Scimitar. What do they not want to see? Uh, the Gila, great ship. You know, it's good in the the drone kiting meta. It's good in um, shield rush teams. Uh, so that's a, that's a value ban right there. Just get that Gila out of the way. Those drones are annoying to deal with. You can't really bomb them off either. So, so uh, Blackbird drones, is, does anything not annoy you, at least? I mean, I've, I've, no. Got it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a lover, so I have to hate a few things, but I hate them very well. Rain, the Astarte and the Scimitar showing up in the bands, what do you think? So the Scimitar would probably be the better of the two um, draw, or shield logistics cruisers. Um, however, the Basilisk usually is brought for Tinker comps. So we may still see one of those. However, the Simi is better for the kiting comp. So if they don't want to be kited. That's probably what they're going to ban. I haven't really seen the Tinker as a as a fleet. Uh... We've we've seen some like pseudo Tinker. So it's usually like Rattlesnakes, Basilisk, something along those lines. Yeah, we we've seen. That's a, a good point you guys bring up. The the Ferox is very good in a Tinker setup because it gives you links and you can put a large energy transfer on it for fairly cheap points. Uh, so maybe you want to get rid of that Ferox to uh, mm-hmm. just get rid of some of the support. Of the tinker, you know. Mm. Uh, interesting and, and interesting choices for sure. Uh, we'll see how they play out uh, when we go to the booth uh, in a few minutes here. Uh, before we do, a uh, special reminder. Sorry, let me pull these sheets out and make sure that I get everyone down. Uh, s- some shout outs to people on Twitter uh, Takeo Stalens, Setonia. Uh, I know that you two are good friends yes. on Twitter. Uh, Jay McLean, who uh, appeared at FanFest uh, last year, I believe, or earlier this year. It's It's been a long one. Uh, Major Caprice, Bunny Wank, Jazaja, Scatha, Backbone666, Fairy Red, Dorath Polius, uh, Z Trike Avalon, Madden Canrende, Zenobia Vane, Daryl McQueen, Saint Ch- Chuthulu, which is an interesting spelling of that word. Uh, Orlana Equilisers, Ec- perhaps there's no vowel between the EQ and the L. It's unusual. And Simon Kelly, uh, a quick quick shout from me to you. Uh, thanks for following me on Twitter and uh, paying attention to the Alliance tournament as the action unfolds here today. Uh, we will be going uh, over to the booth shortly uh, to follow up on this, uh, uh, sorry, to uh, check out the action between Mercenary Coalition and the Bright Side of Death, but first we'll get some predictions from here at the desk. Rain Chocolate, who is it that takes this match? Uh, I want to say probably Bright Side of Death because they didn't ban the Prophecy. And my uh, previous like three predictions were all wrong, so... Are you shooting? Uh, how, how have you gotten any right today? I have gotten some right. Okay, yes. I'm just checking. I've gotten them all right. I'd like the record to show every single match I predicted 100% accuracy. The the record will show what the, what it shows. Yep. <laughs> uh, uh, and and who do you predict for this fight at least? I had Mercenary Coalition circled, but they also banned Prophecy. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Like. They're just on a new level, so I'm actually going to stick with them. I'll, I'll stick with my gut there. Mercenary Coalition. Mercenary uh, I'm going to take this win with uh, their, their hatred of prophecies and all things bird-like. I'm, I'm split here uh, because you guys picked uh, two different teams, which makes it very difficult for me to go along with your opinions. Uh, uh, so I will avoid making a decision, and I will kick it directly to the boys in the booth, Yin Tan and Moderator, as we proceed with match 102 of Lions Tournament 15, the Mercenary Coalition versus Bright Side of Death. Hello everyone, it's Yin Tan, Welcome you back, welcoming you back a final time for to the pairing of myself and Moderator as we look on for this match between Mercenary Coalition and Bright Side of Death. Um, what we see here is we see event- essentially the poverty version of the comp we just saw uh, from Volta being brought by Mercenary Coalition, a flag Balgorn. Uh, complemented with an Aneros and then a lot of battle cruisers to go with it. Whereas the Bright Side of Death has brought something very unorthodox here, bringing those Dominixes that uh, Elise Randolph loves so much. And this actually looks like a comp that's very similar to one that Pandemic Legion lost to initiative with. What are your thoughts on it, Moderator? Yeah, uh, if they can use smart bombs, is kind of the idea to kill off other drone setups. And against what Mercenary Coalition have brought, Dominixes aren't particularly 
good. Uh, one of the things that they may be wanting to do is use a micro jump drive beacon, which would make sense given that they have all warped their entire comp to the center of the arena at zero. Yeah, something interesting as well is going to be how those nemesises from the Mercenary Coalition team are used. Obviously, they're going to have bomb launchers fit, and that may allow them to kill loads of Bright Side of Death bomb uh, drones if they are positioned well. That's going to take a lot of skill to be able to predict where the drones are going to be and then bomb them out. Yeah, it's very difficult to do. Some teams have done it with uh, greater success than others. Uh, one other thing important to note is that Mercenary Coalition will have a flagship Balgorn on grid to use those long-range webs to try to lock down uh, Bright Side of Death uh, from continuing to ping off every single micro jump drive beacon like we've seen many teams do so successfully. Yeah, it's worth noting that there is a micro jump drive beacon right at the center of the arena, so it might be that they're potentially going to just split up. They're going to drop their drones and just start MGDing out in all sorts of different directions to make it nearly impossible for the Mercenary Coalition team to apply the power of that Balgon. Yeah, and already we see Mercenary Coalition choosing to uh, back away uh, from these drone balls that are coming in. Bright Side of Death taking damage in the Myrmidon, and Bright Side of Death has no logistics to actually sustain that Myrmidon uh, once he is primaried and falls. Yeah, you can see there the logistics of Mercenary Coalition just burning as fast as he can away from that drone swarm, being repped by a flurry of... Um, uh, friendly rep drones they're gonna just try and keep him alive for as long as possible and more importantly make sure that when he dies the drones are as far as possible away from the rest of the team so that they have even more time without taking damage so right now the bright side of death attack bar is uh, it was rather low it's starting to increase uh, a bit more as the drones eventually catch up with the oneros and mercenary coalition do have tackle and newts on top of the myrmidon uh, trying to prevent the Merm uh, from running hardeners, newt that out, and it won't be able to uh, sustain a lot of its tank. Speaking of ships that are not sustaining their tank, it is the Oneros of Artemis Albosa, who is into uh, low armor and uh, boosting up and down from uh, the repair bots on top of them. Yeah, fellow member of a podcast that I'm a occasional member of now, not even a co-host, is really struggling here, going at so, so low. and. What happened to his rep drones? He just MJD'd away from that huge drone blob. Look, there's so all of the drones had to uh, are starting to move back towards him. That's critically good piloting there from Artemis, saving himself in just a nip of structure. And whilst the drones are going to catch up to him, he's bought his team a lot more time to work on that Myrmidon and work on that Arbitrator, but it's not really being enough. They haven't been able to break a Myrmidon, and Bright Side of Death don't even have any logistics. What is going on here, Moderator? Mercenary Coalition uh, appears to be choking, uh, would be the best way to put it. Uh, the Balgorn has the entirety of their webs on top of uh, the Arbitrator and the Mauler. The Nemesis are being guidance disrupted, and now that the Oneros has no more reps as he is dead, the Nemesis are kind of the obvious primary. Uh, very uh, weak tank without, and even with Lodgy on the field. Yeah, what do you think about Mercenary Coalition's primaries here? Should they have gone for a kind of defanging maneuver, trying to save the DPS on their Aneros? Or was this the right call? Are they just Do they just need to trade? What's their win condition at this point? It's very difficult to say. At this point, uh, they've already lost uh, control of the initial engagement. Another nemesis down there. So you can't really continue to shoot drones only as your ships are dying. Uh, they need to get uh, some Myrmidon kills, and I don't know why... Well, they need to kill the Arbitrator to get the tracking disruption off, but uh, they need to do a lot more than they're doing so far. Sure, they have a massive control bar, but their attack bar compared to Bright Side of Death is so small. Yeah, you know, the, uh, it seems like that Balgun isn't being used to the best of its effect. Normally what we see that Balgun used for is to neutralize, you know, the 17 points that Ananeros is, or the, you know, even more than that, if you're bringing, like, some other crazy ship like a Rattlesnake. But here it's just being used to take out like a Mala, uh, now a Myrmidon, finally they've put the newts back onto there. But for a second there, they were spent about two minutes using a 23 point and probably 20 plus billion isk ship to neutralize two T1 frigates. And it cost them their Neros. Yeah, not a very good trade. Uh, Bright Side of Death uh, essentially is able to ping off of every single micro jump drive on the arena. It doesn't appear that Mercenary Coalition actually has any scram effects on their ships. We're only seeing webs. Uh, we have a webbing bonus ship in the Fleet Vigil uh, that we haven't seen a lot. And the reason they're bringing that as opposed to a hyena or really anything else with the bonus to web is they just don't have the points. The Balgon or Neros uh, double maybe Harbinger, double Harbinger is so expensive. 
Yeah, it's it's a great core for killing things that are lightly tanked and have good uh, mitigation. We can see that Deletor in the Navy Halberger doing as his name suggests and getting deleted here by the Bright Side of Death team. This is brutal. Like, they finally killed off that Myrmidon five minutes into the match. Yeah, if they can kill uh, Grasser, that would do a lot for them. But they've got webs on a mauler, and you don't really care all that much about killing a mauler at this point. Yeah, I think that I think the reason why they're doing that is they're trying to stop him from applying even more damage to their already flaky composition. But it's not going to help them at this point. They need to they need to have made offensive plays three minutes ago to really start to claw their way back into this match after losing their Neuros. Yeah, and look at the total overall defensive bar. That Navy Harbinger, uh, as he's dropping, we see the defense bar drop lower and lower. And that will be more links off the field. So uh, there have been two links that are already dead with the two Navy Harbingers, Deleter and uh, Ilsan, uh, being dead. And Massive Death and Grimbacken are the only two link ships really left at this point. Yeah, it's worth noting, however, that links don't immediately drop as they did in previous tournaments, thanks to the new um, command burst system. So what we'll see is we'll see, there you go, you see there, the defense bar drops as these um, links, now expire. links expire, but they don't drop immediately. So you have a little more time to work with your links and maybe move into a good position, but there we go. I can't pronounce that name, died in a harbinger. Yeah, Mercenary Coalition doesn't have any time of their own. They needed to uh, take some initiative earlier on. Uh, Navy Harbinger of Mass of Death is now in the next primary. A good call from Bright Side of Death. This is a team I never thought would have made to top 16. Yeah, well, I have a lot of experience fighting Bright Side of Death. They quite often roam to Providence in very, very interesting and very, very skill-intensive comps. So I had a lot of faith in them. I actually predicted them to win on my sheet. So I can be very smug about that when we go back to the uh, commentary, uh, the analysis booth later. But there we go, another ship down. Interesting to note that Bright Side of Death is scramming that Balgorn, making sure that he can't move away and that he has to watch as the rest of his team is just destroyed around him. This has got to be heartbreaking for the Mercenary Coalition team, as it's a slow and painful death here. Yeah, uh, it would be a massive death for them. Uh, Joan Ajari being in the Crucifier, he hasn't had a single thing to tracking disrupt or missile guidance disrupt this entire match. He's been able to put his um, tracking disruptors on the Mala, actually, which is somewhat useful, but honestly... You don't intend for that to be what you want to hit with that crucifier. You're trying to take out, you know, a battle cruiser, maybe even a battleship. If someone brings a gun bow, which this late in the tournament, I don't imagine we'll see much of. You know, the threat density for the Mercenary Coalition team was great. Four Harbingers, great tracking, huge control. But Bright Side of Dreth just brought more, and more importantly, they were able to execute their strategy way, way better. Mercenary Coalition were trying to play to their own game. They weren't concentrating what Bright Side of Death were doing. And it cost them this match. Yeah, they uh, they kind of play themselves. And uh, as one thing I've ever learned from DJ Khaled is uh, you don't want to play yourself. Uh, Bright Side of Death will continue to play through this lower bracket uh, as uh, they have knocked out Mercenary Coalition. Um, well, we can't call it. Maybe they all jump on, do an MJD beacon for fun and boundary violate their entire team. But uh, I wouldn't bet on it if I was a betting man. Yeah, uh, Balgorn continuing to drop through armor. Uh, that'll be a significant amount of loot. I like shooting him now and leaving the uh, Fleet Vigil and the Crucifier left. That will give you time to get on top of him and secure those officer webs and probably newts as well. Yeah, and I'm sure that'll be lovely. It'll, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that Balgorn is fit at the end of the day. It's nice to see how much money people are sinking into these ships. We normally expect to see, at least late in the tournament, you know, Balgorn start to reach the 60 billion mark as two Toby webs, multiple Jaclera newts, to really get that extra couple of percentage points out that are so vital. You know, having a Balgorn with Tobias webs is obviously so much more impactful than having one with Simple Faction. Do you want to explain why they're a little more? Sure. So... Essentially, the flagship allows you to uh, ignore a significant number, but not all of the fitting restrictions. Uh, it can't quite fit things like uh, tech to uh, large rigs, uh, despite what uh, everyone on Z-Kill might want you to believe. Uh, but um, it can fit the officer webs that have up to about a 60 to 70, depending on what links you have in the field, uh, heated. So it's very good at locking down things like an O'Neill set warps in at 50 if you can bring your Balgorn in at zero. Uh, but faction webs quite can't do it. Some of the lower tier officer webs can't do it. Uh, and Mercenary Coalition couldn't do it in this match. Bright Side of Death uh, continues uh, to continue in their side of the bracket. And with that, we'll send it back to the studio.
if I got bars like a marsh shit spot, speed mines, testified, 12k is when you decide, to hack the engines and override, overheat on my overdrive, you so surprised, no joke, I said shit's on fire like the blunts I smoke. And there we have it, a mercenary coalition being knocked out by the bright side of death who will advance in the elimination bracket of Alliance Tournament 15. Uh, the loss there of a uh, of a Flag Balgorn, of course, not the first one that we've seen today. Uh, we did have a look at the kill mail for the Flag Balgorn uh, coming from the Bastard Cartel earlier. About 10.2 billion isk loss. Uh, not too much. Yeah, they just... didn't have any fancy nudes or nos, but the, the Bastard Cartel went big money on the smart bombs to get rid of drones. You know, it's yeah. a good play. Well, it, it wasn't good enough. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, mercenary uh, mercenary coalition not not being able to derive uh, value also out of their what, what did did, uh, did he call it the the poverty edition? That's just not yeah. that's not kind. Uh, let's let's go with penury. Uh, the, 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 the penury comp, uh, a slightly uh, reduced cost version. I, again, though, not delivering. Uh, what do we think about that fight? I quite enjoyed it. I thought the bright side of death actually executed the drone spam really well. I believe we saw the Myrmidon that was being primaried first, MJD away, yep. to live, whereas Ar I think it was Artemis and the Neros had attempted to do the same thing, but the drones caught up to him way too fast, and he wasn't really able to live. And then from there, uh, Mercenary Coalition just kind of cascaded. Without that logic, they weren't able to stay alive, and Bright State of Death, which their team was all whole tanked. I'm not sure if people were quite paying attention to that, that defense bar, but it was a solid blue whole tanked Galente team. So they... They were able to outsustain mercenary coalitions. They certainly did a good job. Uh, the Myrmidon pilot, a an amazing jump when he needed mm -hmm. to, and we see the difficulty of investing points in that Tech Two logistics yeah. uh, on the side of mercenary coalition. At least mercenary coalition didn't bring a single warp scrambling device on any of their ships. Not a one. There's no scram. They also took a a fleet hyena or a fleet uh, the, the bad version of a hyena, the fleet vigil. <laughs> I, I don't know. They, they banned a prophecy. I should have I should have called it bright side of death going, but I did predict the Dominix is which up today, and I predicted they would win. So I'm still right in a way, but uh, yeah. So bright side <laughs> of death, as Rain was saying, really really solid strategy. It's a bit of a cheesy strategy. You sit at the jump beacon in the center of the arena, and when you get almost dead, you push the button and then you jump out a hundred kilometers away, and then the the guy shooting you have to be like, oh geez, this guy's far away now. Do I have to shoot someone else or what's going on? And uh, so they did, and then that guy jumps. And they shot another guy, and then he jumped. So I mean, they just couldn't get anything down. Uh, it's got to be very, very frustrating for Mercenary Coalition, just overlooking that one scrambler. And as you said, it's because of the point increase for the battleship hulls and the Tech 2 logistics. They just couldn't devote the resources to it. And uh, eventually it, it nipped them right in the butt, and now they're, they're gone. And of course, those jump beacons being uh, a part of the Alliance tournament uh, since they were introduced, uh, always available to any of the teams. We, we don't always see them being used uh, to the best effect, but that was a, a, a master class almost. Yeah. Uh, and, and how to make sure that your, their, your fleet members are ready to go when they need to and can activate those jump beacons, move yeah. themselves out of range. It's a strategy that the team we'll be seeing after the break has used too, uh, Slice. Uh, they bring a lot of stuff to the center of the region, uh, the the center of the arena and you jump out, you know? We, we will see that fight coming up at uh, 1720 Eve time, uh, Solaris Ketonium uh, versus Pandemic Legion. And of course, uh, both of you will be in the booth for that fight. That will come up after the break. Uh, for the, Rounding out the rest of the evening today, uh, Hydra Reloaded versus the Salt Farmers, the Tuskers versus Vydra Reloaded, uh, Northern Coalition Dot versus Exodus Dot, the Initiative Dot versus Pen is Out, uh, Band Apart versus L-A-Z-E-R-H-A-W-K-S. Laser Hawks. Uh, all of those fights coming up after the break here on Alliance Tournament 15. Uh, before we go, any any last comments on what we've seen so far before you guys uh, totter off to the booth uh, to offer some commentary play-by-play? -play? I'd just like to point out that I'm six for six on my predictions today. That's, you have had six correct predictions. You are not six for six. I'm six for six. You're six for six if you ignore two of your predictions. Uh, Rain, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I will... Probably prevent, stop myself from making any more predictions, though, after being wrong. So I'm times. going to force you two to make predictions the next time you're back at the desk, uh, and possibly someone will be able to 
force me to make some sort of prediction or logical statement. Uh, in the meantime, we will leave you for the break here. We will be back at 1720 Eve time uh, for the continuation of Alliance Tournament 15. Uh, this, the second to last day, the penultimate day, uh, penultimate weekend of the tournament, first day of the penultimate weekend, uh, when we continue with Solaris, Ketonium versus Pandemic Legion, uh, match 103. Until then, I'm CCP Antiquarian, and this is Alliance Tournament 15. worth more than Isk is trust. In Amsterdam, Eve is real. No, no, guys, 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 let's get the fucking bow down. Boundary. We need the flag, we need the flag down. He's trying okay, to boundary. Okay, yeah. Get the fucking kill, web him, go web him. I'm webbing him now. Also, watch boundary, guys, don't boundary. And welcome back to the studio as we continue our coverage of Alliance Tournament 15 here uh, broadcasting from Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, I am CCP Antiquarian and joining me at the desk are uh, my colleague CCP Fozzy. Fozzy, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's great. And Darkness, my old friend, moderator, <laughs> who uh, has joined us from the booth uh, for his second Alliance Tournament. Moderator, thank you for being with us. Yeah, I'm really excited to see which of these teams walk the narrow streets of Cobblestone in the winner's bracket all the way up. That is exactly what we're going to find out. We have the bands in for this first match of the uh, second half of today. Match 103, Soliaris, Ketonium versus Pandemic Legion. Those bands coming down uh, from Soliaris, a Cerberus, a Scimitar, and a Chameleon. A very unusual band. Uh, for Pandemic Legion, the Vexor Navy Issue, the Ishtar, and the Rattlesnake. Now, gentlemen, uh, Without getting into too in-depth of an analysis, because the uh, teams are just about ready to take the field and, and go at it, uh, let's get some predictions. Who takes this match? Moderator, give me yours first. Pandemic Legion. Pandemic Legion. Bold. I like it. It's yeah. interesting. I've not heard of them before, but I think they might be able to do something on the field. Uh, Fozzie, do you know anything about this Legion? Uh, they've got a long tournament history. I think they uh, they are probably my favorite for this, but it's always risky this tournament to bet against Slice. Slice have been upset in uh, a lot of really solid teams. They they have done mm -hmm. excellent work thus far. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to support the Legion just so that uh, Elise's smug isn't completely misguided. Uh, it's possible that they take this, and and his predictions are, are good. Of course, he and Chocolate Rain have, uh, sorry, Rain Chocolate have moved over uh, to the booth uh, to commentate on this match, so we will head over there right now and join them uh, for match 103, Solaris Ketonium versus Pandemic Legion, here on Alliance Tournament 15. Welcome back, I'm Rain, and I'm joined by Elise, and we're going to be commentating Solarius versus Pandemic Legion. Solarius, also known as Slice, have brought a Widow, Oneros, Rook, Myrmidon, Double Gila, Vigilant, Pontifex, and Double Punisher. Elise, can you introduce Pandemic Legion? All right, the PL team in blue, the boys in blue, have brought a Double Navy Harbinger, Double Navy Brudix, Hyena, Purifier, Twin Daredevil, a Sarday Oneros core uh, with them. You know, it's something we've seen from them earlier in the Alliance Hornet, something they're very comfortable with, and... Uh, <sighs> It's very risky to bring something you've brought before, especially against Slice. Yeah, so Slice has always been one of the teams to kind of bring something different, and they've definitely brought something different here with the first time I believe we've seen a Widow as well as a Rook. And yeah. We have the matches uh, starting. Widow is a very... So Slice are taking an ECM-centric team, uh, so it's very risky. They need to get the jams out early, and they need to get control. 
Uh, we can see some tracking disruption effects coming out against the PL side uh, on the Navy Harbor Journal's Brudixes. And uh, we see some jams starting to be applied right now. Now, when you see the little jam icon on the screen, that doesn't mean that the jam is successful. That just means it's attempted. Uh, so we'll see these teams like move around a little bit. And we see Mr. Rive in the Hyena, not jammed at all. This is a pivotal ship for the PL team. The fact that it's not getting jammed at all is a huge, huge mistake. He has gone and tackled the Oneros of the Slice team, and that's the ire of PL's desire right now. Yeah, so PL, PL in order for them to win, pretty much have to destroy that Oneros and then eliminate the rest of the Slice team. Whereas vice versa, Slice should be able to pick off the support team, the support wing with that he, Hyena Purifier, and even the Oneros themselves in order to, to complete those wing conditions. However, having the Widow and the Rook really helps Slice and sort of hinders PL with those attempted jams. Yep, so the uh, the Hyena not jammed still. We saw a jam attempt going out on it, but uh, it was still getting able to get its web and target painter on the Oneros. This Oneros is melting pretty fast. It's entering structure right now, and PL has taken no appreciable damage to show for it. Uh, there we go, Oneros down. Slice really behind on the backseat here. They need to pray to RNGesus to get a lot of jams off on this. And Slice actually recognizing the Hyena was pivotal to getting rid of the Oneros has now primaried it. However, he is easily catching reps from Lucas and the Oneros. Um, looks like Pandemic Legion is beginning to primary that Widow and the Rook, not liking ECM at all and wanting to get it immediately off the field. And we can see these Punishers are also pinned down. The, the Daredevils on the PL side are controlling the Slice uh, support wing. Uh, these Punishers aren't going to be able to get anything done. Daredevils have 90% webs. They are the superior control in this uh, this field right now. So really good piloting by here. PL is about to take a Rook down. Uh, Slice taking a big gamble with this setup and they are losing an Oneros or a, a Widow at the same time. That is most of their DPS or their control core down and watch that control bar shrink as that Widow dies. So Slice actually losing the Oneros and then both the ECM ships without anything to really show for it are going to have a tough time fighting back. They still have a pretty pretty decent damage with the Myrmidon and, and Gila's. But, other, but otherwise, like, that control bar is very minimum. They're not going to be able to really take anything down from Pandemic Legion, especially with that Oneiro still sitting pretty in shields. Uh, shout out to uh, PD in the Punisher. He was able to tackle Lucas Kwan's Oneros. A uh, pretty important part, but uh, this late in the match, you've traded way too much for it. So a good individual skill from the slice side, but, uh, you know, their, their, their setup just couldn't couldn't prevail here. They are really against the wall the entire time. Uh, Lucas Kwan is getting shot. He is... Uh, scrammed, but you know, the swarm of rep bots which you get from this Navy Battlecruiser core is going to keep him alive. Slice have nothing left in the tank after this Gila dies. Uh, they'll just have Vigilant, Pontifex, and Twin Punishers. Uh, really, really solid performance by PL, who are, you know, probably a little bit embarrassed to have lost last weekend, and you know, they want to prove that they belong here. This is their alliance tournament for the taking. They're going to try and do it against a very stiff competition coming up. Yeah, so PL pretty much wiping Slice out. I believe um, the Hyena pilot making that crucial play and Slice not being able to target call it right away really cost them this match. While Slice has shown very great performance in the past, beating not only Templus, who have beaten Hydra before, but also clearing out other teams with some pretty, I want to call clowny plays. But here they were not able to come against Pandemic Legion, who didn't even show their whole hand. They tried to, Slice tried to predict that um, Alliance tournament ship with the Chameleon ban. However, Pandemic Legion didn't bring a flagship, didn't bring an Alliance tournament ship, and still were able to pretty even-handedly beat Slice. Yep, absolutely. And NPL just cleaning up right now, uh, you know, very convincing fashion. Uh, we see some uh, good camaraderie going on in local. King Voodoo, the Slice captain, saying good fight. Feels bad when the jams don't land and, uh, you know, the jams certainly didn't land. We saw them apply pretty good application from the slice side, but they just can uh, get a single jam off. And I think leaving Mr. Rive and the Hyena uh, completely untouched was a, a little bit of a mistake, but it probably wouldn't have gone that differently for them, even if they had him jammed. I mean, their Nero's pilot might have been able to live a little longer, but unless they got the rest of their jams to be able to stop Pandemic, Le Pandemic Legion's DPS being applied, it really, really wasn't worth it. So we have just the Punisher and the Pontifex left, Pete and Biggest Dickus just sitting there trying to uh, outlast as long as they can and not really able to take down really anything on Pandemic Legion. I mean, they did scram with Daredevil, so this might go... No, it's not going to go that way. But uh, either way, you know, just... just uh, it was a really great showing that Slice had in this alliance tournament. They were very fun to watch. Uh, they had some very clowny and cheesy strategies that we've seen people emulate mm -hmm. even in this alliance tournament. Uh, so, you know, good job. You've made an impact, Slice. Uh, we're proud of you. Uh, but PL securing a round of 16 births, so next year they'll still be in the Alliance Tournament. Praise. Praise <laughs> for PL. 
Good job, Elise. Now, we'll, now you won't have to go in the back room and cry yeah. after they potentially have lost. My tears are saved for another day. We're going to send it back to CCB Antiquarian and the boys in the studio. It's a union of powerful mega corporations. brought its people both misery and triumph. My brother gets off work at four o'clock and we're coming down here to kick some mother Pandemic Legion steadies uh, in the Alliance for proceed forward here in the elimination bracket as uh, Solaris Chitonium uh, heads home. Uh, Slice, of course, very entertaining to watch, and uh, King Voodoo uh, also entertaining on YouTube. If you guys haven't stopped by mm -hmm. uh, his channel, I can't recommend it enough uh, for for entertaining things to watch about Eve. Uh, of course, uh, you won't be seeing any more of them uh, here in the Alliance tournament. We will see more of Pandemic Legion. Uh, they will go on uh, to play in match 112, uh, which will go on tomorrow. Gentlemen, talk about what we saw there uh, as far as the, the bands, the execution, and uh, the comps themselves. Uh, Moderate Reject, kick us off. Yeah, I'd love to. So, one thing that really struck me as being really odd is having an O'Neill, so you want to bring Armor Core, okay. Widow, that makes sense. Even though it's a shield tank set setup, you use it for the full jams and you just armor tank it. But armor tank healers, that's a little bit out there. Uh, they tried to go for uh, their own uh, ECM uh, magic, you know, King Voodoo. kind of makes sense, but uh, there's some things in this comp that didn't really quite make sense to me. Uh, yeah, Slice have been, they've been earning a reputation for really creative setups. And this was definitely creative. It didn't work out in this case. It might have worked out if they'd gotten lucky on the gems. It was definitely a gamble. Um, it would be interesting to see the fits for those healers, whether they were, say, full tracking disruptor, because we know there was tracking disruptors on the field, so they might have been using those mids for that. But uh, either way, it was definitely a very risky setup, which is sometimes what you might see with a less experienced team coming up against a juggernaut. Pandemic Legion, of course, a team with a big tournament dynasty. And when you come up against that, sometimes you just go for a Hail Mary and see what you can get. Now, what do you think about the Pandemic Legion comp? Because that was something much more mm -hmm. traditional, something that we would have seen last year, say, those battle cruisers, a T2 Logic cruiser, and then uh, a support wing uh, with Daredevils, of, co of course, having a point mm -hmm. reduction there to kind of balance out uh, the point bump uh, for the T2 logistics. I mean, that's a traditional, a traditional play, fairly safe from Pandemic Legion. Yeah, very safe. So it looked like Pandemic Legion just wanted to ban out what they felt were the threats to that comp. Having an extra ban uh, gives you a lot more safety in that regard, and then just brought a very standard uh, setup that we've been seeing basically for the entirety of this tournament. It also doesn't reveal their hand as to their setups that they want to use later in the tournament. And going through the lower bracket, they're going to have to play so many, th 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 excuse me, through so many matches and then best out of threes in order to break into uh, the final end day of the tournament. Yeah, they, they know that tomorrow they're going to have to come up against either Hydra Reloaded or Salt Farmers, especially the thought of facing Hydra Reloaded has to be making them really nervous. And being able to hold back your hand and maybe save one of your special uh, creative over-the-top setups for tomorrow and not reveal it is a really good opportunity here. Now, let me ask, because we don't see the Chameleon Band very often. Obviously, <laughs> it's not a, a, a super common ship to be available to a lot of people. Uh, did, uh, did Slice waste the ban? I mean, was PL ever going to bring a chameleon out? I don't think it was the strongest ban. I can kind of see the thought process behind it. PL is a team that we know has access to a lot of these unique ships. They've won tournaments in the past. They've come in the top couple of uh, uh, teams in quite a few of the last tournaments. And they also just have a lot of funding. But um, the chameleon is not the one that you... We haven't really seen many chameleons in the tournament. It's just not a ship that fits really well in this format. But they might have been afraid that a chameleon would have been able to quickly lock up the Widow and counter jam it. So, um, like uh, Fozzie was saying, if you're Slice right, you're not going to beat Pandemic Legion by playing a standard setup against them. They're just generally, overall, a better team than you. So, uh, it's unfortunate, but it's true, and they proved it in that match, uh, shutting them out. So... 
if you try to beat them, you have to go for kind of a bit of a cheesy play, which is what they wanted. It, it worked for initiative, really. Like Pandemic Legion, it was kind of clear that that setup was a bit, a bit wonky, the, the setup that they lost to within it. So maybe the uh, side of um, Slice thought that they could do the same thing. Pandemic mm -hmm. Legion uh, didn't flinch twice, though. Yeah, maybe count on being underestimated. Uh, that's something I think uh, a lot of teams have been able to take advantage of coming up against these big juggernauts, is knowing that the juggernauts don't want to give away something uh, special. Um, it would be really fascinating to see what jammers the uh, ECM chips had, the Widow and the Rook there, to see how they distributed it across the different races. Uh, uh, of course, we'll we'll have to uh, wait until we see kill mails uh, from those ships mm -hmm. in order to make that kind of analysis. Uh, right now, we're going to move on to the next fight coming up. Uh, 104, that's Hydra Reloaded versus the Salt Farmers, The one of the two teams mm -hmm. of, of which will go up against PL tomorrow. Uh, we actually have an interview right now uh, with, with the PL captain. Uh, who was it that captained the PL squad right there? I think it's we... Lucas Kwan this yeah, year. Yeah, it's Lucas Kwan this year. Uh, mm -hmm. Dan Cool, the previous team captain, has kind of stepped back, so Lucas Kwan mm -hmm. and to an extent every Lewis have stepped in and filled some of the shoes. Uh, Lucas Kwan was formerly the co-captain, so he was kind of the natural pick this year to be the full captain. All right. Well, uh, we've got a, about a, a minute, I think, while he uh, situates himself, and then we'll be mm -hmm. going there. Any, uh, any interesting uh, questions that you would have for him? I'd be really interested to hear what he thinks about uh, the potential of coming up against Hydra uh, tomorrow. Of course, we don't know whether Hydra or Salt Farmers will win the next match, but there's a really famous rivalry that's going back years between Pandemic Legion and Hydra Reloaded. And this year, the Hydra Reloaded team uh, is quite famously made up of uh, members, at least partially, that had been part of the PL team last year. These are people that had been part of Hydra in the past, joined PL for last year, and then now split back off into Hydra again. So this is a match that I'm sure is going to have a lot of personal drama. Oh. Well, provided that uh, Hydra squeaks yes, past salt, if they do, uh, yeah. which we'll find out in, uh, mm -hmm. in just a bit. Uh, Maud, any any ideas what you might want to ask uh, the captain of uh, the Pandemic Legion fleet? All of the kind of questions I feel I want to ask him. I want to get inside the head of a team captain, having been one myself before. I don't think he's going to answer, you know, anything too uh, <laughs> secret. But um, I really just want to know kind of where his uh, head's at, what kind of their general game plan is uh, for going through the lower bracket and how they're going to keep that setup pool and uh, deal with three bands going forward. Because three bands affects everyone, uh, not just Pandemic Legion. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's true. The three bands are, uh, affecting every match uh, from now until the end of the tournament. Uh, and uh, we'll check right now uh, to see if we have the bands in for the next match. Uh, we do. And do we have do we have the captain on? Yet. Yeah. Yes, we do. Hello, sir. This is CZP Antiquarian talking to you from the tournament desk here at Alliance Tournament 15. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> well, well, it's been a, a delight watching you guys fly. Uh, a couple questions from the desk. One, uh, how do you feel about uh, the Salt Farmers versus Hydra Reloaded? Uh, who are you going up against tomorrow? Um, I, I'd like to say Salt Farmers, but my heart isn't with Hydra. Uh, we sort of knew we were going to fight them eventually down the way the bracket was laid out at the beginning. We just never saw it happening in this position. Are you, are you prepared for the Hydra team? Have you, uh, have you got any eyes on the field? I mean, it's hard to prepare against a team that's always had very good piloting and uh, decent enough theory crafting to go alongside that. We do have a decent record against Hydra uh, in previous Alliance tournaments, but as we all know, you can't really rest on your laurels in this game. You have to. You're only as good as your last fleet, as Shitty would say. And uh, certainly can't rest on your laurels in the elimination bracket. Now, uh, uh, Elise would have us believe that this is all part of a grand plan, uh, that you're on your way down there in order to make yourselves uh, a little bit more motivated to do well. Uh, can, can we have confirmation of that from your side? I mean... I mean, the more matches you win, the more skins you get, right? So if you're really smart, you drop down early so you can get all those dank skins. I I see. Dank skins is, of course, a motivator, and I'm sure that uh, Rain will be happy to hear you say it. Uh, we always love to see a little bit of bling on the field uh, when something explodes. Now, a uh, moderator here asks a good question about your general game plan moving forward. It, it, it's clear that you've analyzed the brackets. You have an idea about who you might want to see and who you're going up to. Are there, are there any uh, points in the strategy that you'd like to share with us? Um, I mean, much of the strategy we had going into the Alliance tournament sort of blew up in the first round. So <laughs> this bracket hasn't exactly 
I mean, I don't know. Uh, I saw moderate, Moderator's predictions before the tournament, and I don't think he's hit any of them so far. Maybe Tuskers, they've been going Ouch. decent. Uh, a sc scathing review <laughs> of, uh, of Moderator's uh, performance so far. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we will, of course, uh, look forward to seeing you as you move forward. And, of course, we'd, we'd like to thank you for being with us. Uh, do you have uh, any advice to the teams uh, that uh, are, are also in the bracket with you at this point in time or uh, anyone in the, uh, in the undefeated bracket? Yeah, well, I, I could give this one advice to Hydra. If, if you drop out now, you can still make it to the TI finals. True. You can still run up to Seattle and watch it. True Pandemic Legion and fine form. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Well, well, there we have it. The uh, Pandemic Legion captain, uh, obviously mm -hmm. very pleased with the performance of his team and uh, looking forward uh, to uh, moving forward in the bracket. Uh, right now, though, let's see who they are going to fight uh, in the next match, uh, and that will be decided here. Hydra Reloaded versus the Salt Farmers. The ban's in for that match. Uh, Hydra banning the Blackbird, the Basilisk, and the Scimitar. And Salt Farmers banning out a triple uh, armor logistics set, the Guardian, the Oneros, and the Rabisu. Now, I think this is the first, uh, the first full Laji ban uh, that I've seen in the tournament. Yeah, this is a lot of logistics banned. Um, the Atana is open if someone wants to bring that. Another Alliance tournament prize ship, a very rare and valuable one. Hydra probably I'm would I'm sure access. they would have access to them, yes. Um, also, Laji frigates have been something we've seen very popular. None of them are banned out here. And we've seen some great success with no Laji teams, uh, like we saw the Ronin bring at the beginning of the day. Indeed. Mm -hmm. So it'll be fascinating to see what they bring, but either way, I think Salt Farmers wanted to push Hydra into something that they haven't shown before. And uh, do you think that's going to be successful, Fozzy? Before I pass it over to Moderator, who uh, whose predictions have been so maligned, uh, <laughs> let's let's get one from you. Who do you think? Hydra versus Salt. Uh, Hydra is another team with a huge tournament pedigree, a lot of experience. I think they're probably the more likely to take this. One vote for mm -hmm. Hydra. Uh, Moderator. Hail Hydra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. I think we can say that on air. I don't think it's, got, it's probably got some yeah. sort of trademark situation yeah. going on there. I well, hope we don't get hit with the DMCA. That would be unfortunate. That's, yeah. that's, it's never what we're looking for. Uh, Hydra, of course, uh, ha having made wonderful appearances in uh, tournaments previous, uh, and all of those pilots having a lot of skill. I, I, I generally put my vote there as well, uh, just, just to... Just to round out the desk and you make it even, but for sure this I, you know, I like I, I actually quite like the name of the salt farmers uh, mm -hmm. being a, a semi-active <laughs> participant on on some forums and in some locations myself where where we generate a bit of salt. I, I mm -hmm. like that someone's out there collecting it. So salt farmers, uh, I, I may be voting uh, that I think Hydra will win, but I really hope that uh, you do something amazing uh, to destroy the team that appears before you. Uh, before we cut over to the booth, because I'm not sure if. If it's ready to go, are we? Oh, we're it. Never mind. Uh, nothing before we cut to the booth. We are going to go directly there to Rain Chocolate and Elise Randolph for a commentary on this match: Hydra Reloaded versus the Salt Farmers. All right, guys. Welcome back to Alliance Hornet Fifteen. Action. I'm Elise Randolph, joined by Rain Chocolate. Uh, we got Salt Farmers in blue here versus Hydra Reloaded. The winner will go on to face Pandemic Legion in the elimination bracket. And uh, that is some shiny stuff you see on field right now. Uh, Rain, take me through the Hydra team. So Hydra bought a double Widow, a Tana, double Hilo, double Stark, double Manicore, and a Raptor. So even though every other Logistics Cruiser was banned, T2 Logistics Cruiser, they still managed to bring the bling. Yep, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Salt Farmers, they brought double Rook, double Hurricane, double Harbinger, double Brutix, a double Deacon. Uh, you know, this, this Widow Tinker that Hydra brought, uh, it is a little bit susceptible to the ECM. So if the Salt Farmers gambled correctly on their jammers, they might be able to get an edge up. But I think Hydra were kind of prepared for this. Um, their storks uh, probably have remote ECCM to get the widows going and to make sure that they will get a lock. So the initial jam war will be what we have to watch out for. If these rooks can get a widow jammed or two widows jammed, then salt farmers have a chance. They got a chance to kill a Gila, which is what they have to do. Uh, just pop that Gila really quick and, uh, you know, they need to snowball off of that win. You can't give Hydra chance to get their jams off. The longer the match goes, they're a very durable setup right now with this Tinker. And uh, we've seen a setup like this before in the Alliance Tournament Finals. 
between it was either Hydra or Camel that had it, but uh, you know they field this before for sure. So we have the match starting. Um, we saw the links go off. Those double healers actually burning in to the enemy team um, into salt farmers, and the attempted jams going off both on the Atana and the widows, as well as the rooks from each team. So it actually looks like none of the jams are successful. People are actually being able to counter jam. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like any jams really, any important jams at least, landed right now. We see Hydra putting jams on the double deacons. Uh, they're quite vulnerable to this jamming if there's no remote ECCM on the field. And uh, we can see at least one of the deacons can lock. It is repping up this rook, piloted by Rico or Lando. And uh, he needs to be a little bit tankier than this. We see the Hydra DPS just plumbing it plummeting into him right now. He's at half hull. Uh, he needs to, to not die here, and he needs yeah. to get a lucky jam off. Yeah, and we see Big Daddy Blue Melon and the Gila actually within the Salt Farmers comp. I believe he's just running a smart bomb over and over again, attempting to kill some of those blue drones from Salt Farmers themselves. I am. That is Rook down. Rico Orlando is dead. Salt Farmers are now very far behind in this match. It's only one ship, but you know, when you have ECM on your opponent's side, uh, it snowballs with every ship that gets eliminated. Now the Salt Farmers, you know, they're losing a second Rook right now, and uh, they've got a Hurricane that's kind of bleeding a little bit. Uh, just taking a little bit of pot shots here. I'll be interested to see if these Rooks ever attempted to jam the Gila drones. That is a tactic that mm -hmm. we've seen used before. It's quite effective because the Gila's don't have many drones. Uh, they just have very strong, beefy drones. Yeah, and we actually see Smart Bombs again by, by these Gila's. Um, it looks like even though the Gila's do use drones themselves, they're actually attempting to kill any sort of support the Salt Farmers have. Although it looks like, I believe maybe the jams were successful on those widows. I only see one on the hurricane and it is now gone. So maybe maybe that last rook was barely attempted to save himself with some jams. Yep, yeah, as you mentioned, the healers are smart bombing the medium armor maintenance spots. Uh, when those drones die, it represents a large portion of the rep power from the salt farmer's side. We see salt farmers are actually in control of this match right now. You mentioned it. This rook has gotten some pretty good jams off. These rook or these widows aren't able to do too much. Although. Uh, Although just because they got the successful jam, salt farmers have to actually act with it. It looks like they attempted to kill that manticore, but the Atana actually kept him alive. Um, it looks like all, all of Hydra, even though they were jammed, were sitting pretty. So salt farmers getting that successful jam weren't actually able to make anything of it. Yeah, we see Sutoni and his Raptor. He took off very quickly. Uh, his goal would be to, to pin down a logistics ship at some point and hold him in the backfield. Uh, he didn't have to use it. Uh, he didn't have to utilize this round. So he's just uh, flying around, uh, looking at the sights, probably taking some selfies. And Hydra Reloaded just lost a Manticore. Uh, probably not going to be all that important because they traded it for their last Rook. Yeah, so now that Solar Farmers have no ECM on the field, you can see their control bar is quite low and therefore they're not going to be able to really prevent Hydra Widows from really doing any damage. All right, that's another Manticore down. Uh, these, these ECM isn't that, that successful uh, from either side, really. But, you know, it doesn't matter. Hydra, you know, when you bring an ECM comp, mm -hmm you have to bring damage with it. And that's something that the Widows do very well, uh, as well as the uh, the healers, and to a lesser extent, the Storks. I mean, the Storks can do a lot of damage. They can also kill drones. Yep. Uh, it's not something you get to see very often uh, because it's hard to observe, but that's one of the roles that the Storks have. Additionally, those Storks will also provide links to the Hydra team. So even though they're not as great as the Battlecruiser links, they're still cru cru crucial links for Hydra's comp in order to be able to execute. Yeah, so uh, you can look at the uh, control bar now. It has completely swapped. Hydra full control, Salt Farmers almost nothing here. Uh, this is going to be pretty frustrating for everyone involved. Not being able to get a lock, uh, not being able to do anything. As the Salt Farmers lose a Harbinger uh, right now, uh, boom goes that dynamite. Uh, there's, only, there's only like five DPS ships left if any of them can get a lock. Yeah, and it looks like, I mean, if you watch their attack bar, there's a very small sliver of red, meaning that they're not actually able to apply the majority of their DPS. That could be maybe potentially from drones or maybe, I don't know, they're attempting to shoot something and missing, but the fact that their attack bar is so low shows out those jams are actually successful. Yeah, we see uh, no MGD shenanigans, really. Um, the Deacons from the Salt Farmer side are kind of hovering around an MGD beacon. Uh, but, you know, not going to really happen too much here because Hydra Reloaded just doesn't care. If you jump away, they've still got a huge victory or a huge point lead right now, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they'll win. Yeah, and with those Deacons, their range isn't as far as, say, a T2 logistics cruiser, so therefore jumping away may save the ship itself, but it won't be too helpful for its team. Yeah, we see Hydra doing the right play here. This is how you beat these logistics frigates. They've clearly trained with them before. They are pinning one down. Uh, you don't need tackle on both of them because, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. they work in tandem. So if you can just pin one 
one down, the other will just have to stay next to it. Otherwise, it's completely ineffective. Yeah, and as we see, even with, it looks like the Deacons were actually able to apply some reps or that icon might be rep drones, but it doesn't look like it's working too well. Um, we saw the second Harbinger die, as well as his Brudex dropping very quickly. Yeah, so when you bring a lot of Battlecruiser hulls, part of the advantage, as we discussed before, is you could bring a lot of rep bots. Uh, and as you pointed out, these Gila's have been smart bombing all the rep bots off. There's only three left for the Salt Farmer side, and they're very sad. I can see, if you look at it, you can see the pilots, they're crying a little bit. Hopefully they're collecting the salt from their own salty tears. Um, but, you know, who knows how this is going to work out. As a Brudix, piloted by October Day, finally pops. Yeah, and so now that there's only six ships left on the salt, salt farm, or five ships left on the salt farmer's side, it allows these widows to apply pretty much jams across the field, and not only that, but stack them in case the first jam attempt failed. So salt farmers probably won't be getting locks anytime soon. Yeah, these battlecruiser hulls are popping pretty hard right here. Uh, feels feels bad for these pilots. You know, your heart goes out to you. Uh, it kind of seems like salt farmers rushed into this setup just a little bit. Uh, Hydra reloaded with a very pointed band on the Blackbird. They kind of knew that Salt Farmers wanted to take that bandit. Salt Farmers had to upgrade to the Rooks, um, you know, double the points. Recons are cheap, but still double the points. So these Hurricanes and Harbingers can't be Navy Hurricanes, Navy Harbingers, or Navy Brudixes. They have to be just the standard scrub level stuff, and you know, just not, not as good. Yeah, and we do see, I believe the Atana has an attempted jam on him. Those actually aren't drones. It looks like maybe those Hurricanes are... Even the Deacons, even though I don't know why they would put on the Deacons, but the Double Hurricanes could also have ECM effects sent to that Atana. Uh, um, that is Heart SP and the Widow jamming his own Atana and shooting it just a little bit to make him uh, get a little bit scared there. Uh, we see some <laughs> manners question marks in local, but it's, you know, it's going to their own team. So, you know, Hydra just having a little bit of fun as they finish up the last, uh, the last Hurricane here. There's really nothing, nothing that the Soul Farmers could have done once you know, they lost that first Rook. It really snowballed out of the control for the Salt Farmers. And, uh, you know, Hydra just, just held on to that lead, which mm -hmm. is something they're very good at doing. They get a lead, they hold on to it, they just execute very well. I was going to say, do you think Salt Farmers could have done anything differently to have the match swing in their favor? I mean, they went for the Manticores, which is not a bad a bad choice there because they, they are quite weak. I think you just have to pop a Gila just right at the start. Just all in on a Gila, overload your jams, mm -hmm. win that jam war, kill a Gila, they didn't have that much for tackle. These healers are piloted very well. They were probably very wily to grab. So, you know, it's easy to say what they should have done. But, you know, when you're in that hot seat, it's not as easy as we make it seem. Yep. And with that, the two deacons are left alive um, to for Hydra to, I would say, clean up the match. Um, usually with logistics, you, most people generally will primary them first. In this match, obviously, it didn't really matter. It was all about the ECM war and the control bars. Yep, Suetonia is probably really happy he finally gets to do something as he scrambles a Deacon. Uh, actually, never mind. He's actually looting a wreck right now <laughs> of his own Manticore pilot. All right, so there you go. Maybe they could have had... I don't think... I don't know. Maybe they are Plex tanked or something. I don't know. I don't think there'd be uh, anything They almost certainly it. put Plex in there. Suetonia would never do anything that makes no sense. So, uh, you know... Good job there. As uh, one more Deacon finally bites the dust, and there it goes. Salt Farmers eliminated. Hydra Reloaded go on to face Pandemic Legion tomorrow. Uh, we're going to send it back to the studio, though, to break down that hot, sexy action. It's a union of powerful mega corporations. brought its people both misery and triumph. <laughs> My brother gets off work at four o'clock and we're coming down here to kick some mother <laughs> Zutonia proving that his dedication to the pickup extends beyond Twitter. Uh, pretty impressive work from him going after that uh, that stationary wreck. Good job, suit. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
what can be said, Hydra Reloaded uh, takes it over salt farmers uh, who have an excellent ad, uh, but were not able to uh, deliver on the field. Uh, moderator, what do we see happening out there? Well, we saw the Mayo die. So, I mean, that's uh, one of the problems of uh, being uh, a salt farmers. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> they went with the, uh, the, uh, the rook pair, and that cost 14 more points than, say, a blackbird pair. So, really well uh, targeted ban by uh, Hydra. They kind of mind game in them into that. Those 14 points could have definitely gone towards using something that could break a Widow, a Tana Tinker, which the setup that they had definitely, they being salt farmers, couldn't. I'm also a bit curious to see why they were anchoring in that match. That's not something that's really quite yeah. common at this level. Yeah, they were either anchoring or had an intentional conga line uh, with all their battle cruisers just going along in a straight line. So we've seen that sometimes before where uh, you don't want your pilots to worry about manual piloting, so you just get them all to anchor up on the FC. Not a great tactic in general for the Alliance tournament because usually you need to spread out, um, especially with battle cruisers. It's a really good tactic to get yourself some distance. Um, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it wouldn't have made a huge difference, I think, doing anything uh, else with most of the DPS coming from missiles from the Widows and drones from the Helos. Now, the Widow, uh, mm -hmm. pretty dominant ship in, in this setup, but also the Atana mm -hmm. making an appearance. Uh, that's itself being an Alliance, uh, Alliance tournament prize ship. Uh, and uh, and of course, we have uh, prize ships for this Alliance tournament yes, coming indeed. out as well. And really, really uh, nice ones. The ships that have come out. Uh, now, you had mm -hmm. a, a hand in uh, the creation of the ships on, yeah. the, on the gameplay side, and I just <laughs> recently finished helping create them on the graphics side. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's, let's uh, get some images up on the screen, if we can, here, they for the ships coming ships. out. As well. Now, these uh, will fit with the Serpentis theme uh, that mm -hmm. uh, is being delivered here in Alliance Tournament 15. So we have a bomber called the Virtuoso yep. and a cruiser? A, a uh, recon ship. A recon yeah. ship uh, mm -hmm. known as the Victor. And I believe we have those images ready to share with people there at home. We there go. we are. These are some very exciting ships. So this is the Victor. It's the uh, Alliance Tournament prize recon ship. Uh, it has a lot of damage with hybrid weapons, but the real star is the fact that it's the first ship to have a combination of both web strength, which is the typical Serpentis bonus, but also web range. So it has 90% webs with a range bonus, which is huge, very powerful. Uh, I expect this to be a ship that's going to be popular uh, for future tournaments and just generally... Uh, uh, used for very blingy fleets on TQ as now, well. Now that's the Victor. Let's take a look at the Virtuoso mm -hmm. here. This uh, using that Nemesis hull, but with the uh, Alliance Tournament 15 uh, pattern applied to it. Uh, basically a a a bomber, but uh, split Mimitar Galante. So yeah, it's uh, essentially got all of the benefits of a stealth bomber and all of the benefits of a daredevil combined together. Yeah. So taking advantage of all of these bonuses at the same time is going to be a challenge. This is going to be a ship that really uh, rewards thinking outside the box, creativity. Uh, you're going to have to fly it very differently than you would a daredevil or a bomber, but uh, having both of those capabilities together is really huge. In Incredible ships mod. Mm -hmm. uh, any idea on how you would use those in a tournament situation? Well, first, I just want Tuskers to actually get to a point where they win these so I can get my cut of these excellent prize ships. I'd really be excited to fly these on uh, Tranquility or uh, in a tournament play should I get the opportunity to in the future. Um, is it true that we're seeing that the uh, bomber, the Virtuoso, is a recon, is a recon ship uh, bonus? Um, it has uh, the, uh, no, I think no, there's the a recon ship showing there, then that would be a typo. The bomber has stealth bomber bonuses sure. as well as bonuses from Glente Frigate and Mimitar Frigate. Yeah, yeah, they look incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm jealous. I hope I get my hands on one. <laughs> Uh, of course, will be interesting to see who gets their hands on ones. All of the uh, all of the teams winning today guarantee themselves a top sixteen position, yes. but that doesn't guarantee them a ship. No, you no. have to get into the top four, I believe. The top four, four and ships. We'll be seeing that yeah. uh, next weekend. Uh, yeah. Right now, cutting the field down from twenty four mm -hmm. to sixteen, and the next match we have coming up uh, to assist with that is Tuskers Co. versus Vidra Reloaded. So we're now done with the elimination matches for yep. the day. So for these last four matches of the day, these teams are not up against the wall. These are teams that haven't lost any matches yet. Now. Correct me if I'm wrong. We're going to see slightly less out there comps from these from these teams because they can afford uh, 
to they can afford to go down one level. You can, but going down one level is really, really risky. We've seen what happens to teams like uh, Volta and uh, PL and Hydra, these really strong teams that were expected to do well that get knocked down. They now have such a long grind through a lot of teams to make it back. Uh, if you can survive these next matches, so if you can win for these next four uh, sets, you're guaranteed to go into uh, best of three matches tomorrow. And that gives you a lot more breathing room. At the, with the best of three matches, you can feel like you can make a mistake and still come back. So do you think they pull out all the stops? Do we see flagships? Do we see Alliance Tournament prize ships? Mod, what's the strategy here going into uh, undefeated bracket on, on this, the penultimate day of the first weekend of the last two weekends of Alliance Tournament 15? I mean, if you have the opportunity to bring uh, AT ships or a flagship and you feel that the bands go away that allow you to run a composition that you feel is solid, and that you definitely do it. The lower bracket has so many good teams that at this point you don't risk it. You don't risk anything until best out of threes or even like the grand final. It's so important to get uh, to that point. So one interesting thing to see is in the um, bottom end of the winner bracket, right, we've got three teams or four teams that we've never seen make it to that far in top eight, and one mm -hmm. of those will get at least third place overall. Yeah, so somebody from Initiative, Pen is out, Band Apart, and Laserhawks is going to be guaranteed at least third, one of those teams. Uh, and that's really amazing, because these are teams that, uh, some of them have been in tournaments before, like Band Apart's been in a couple of tournaments before, um, but they these are teams that uh, don't have a really long tradition of getting this far, so they're really, really upping their game. Well, we'll see how they perform later on this afternoon. Uh, right now, we'll be going to Tuskers and Vydra, and we do have the bands for that in, uh, so let's uh, give that uh, to the viewers at home. Uh, Tuskers banning out the Blackbird, the Kitsune, and the Ishtar, uh, and Vydra Reloaded banning the Orthrus, the Slepnir, and the Brutix Navy Issue. Uh, mm -hmm. What do we see going on there? Obviously, Blackbird, Kitsune, that's uh, looking, at that, uh, looking at that jam potential. Um, yeah. What, what's 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 happening on the Vydra band side? Orthrus, Slepnir, Brutix, Navy issue. Vydra doesn't want to fight any sort of a kiting comp. So Orthrus and uh, the Slepnir, if you have Artie on the Slepnir and Rails on the uh, Brutix, Navy issue, I mean, that's the armor side, but as well the Orthrus. These are all very long-range kiting uh, mm -hmm. setups, and one thing that Tuskers has been very well known uh, for is their ability to execute these setups at the top level, really. There's only a handful of teams that can really execute on the level they do, and Vydra is probably in that area. They don't want to have to fight execution. Uh, Tuskers, they're banning uh, Blackbird, Karis, and Ishtar, or, sorry, was that Kitsune? Uh, Kitsune. Yes. So Tuskers just doesn't want to fight against cheap jams. Uh, Vydra could go Griffin, but the Griffin doesn't do nearly what the Kitsune do, no. does, so... Kitsune is an interesting band. We haven't seen a ton of the Kitsune bands, uh, but that can often indicate that you're actually planning on bringing ECM yourself. Something like Widows, Kitsunes can win a jam war by locking really quickly because they're frigates. Well, we'll see how they deliver. I'm pretty sure I know where your vote is here, Mod, but just for the sake of the cameras. Tuskers, I really hope they go or Vydra. And Vydra are great, but Tuskers are the defending champions. I'm going to go with them. Incredible. Tuskers, defending champs from Alliance Tournament 14. We expect them to do well as we go to the booth for match 105 of Alliance Tournament 15. Tuskers versus Vydra Reloaded. Uh, Rain Chocolate and Elise Randolph take us away. All right, welcome back. I'm Rain, and I'm joined with Elise, and we're going to be commentating Tuskers versus Vyadra. So Tuskers brought Double Vindy, Rabisu, Curse, Prophecy, Pontifex, Double Vexor, and Double Purifier at staggered ranges from 20 to 50. Elise, can you introduce yeah, Vyadra? Your eyes do not deceive you. That is a chameleon uh, and a Rabisu, both in, you know, the undefeated bracket. These teams, you know... If they lose this match, they're not eliminated, but we see the first time that we're seeing double tournament prize ships. Uh, Vydra bringing the Guardian, Chameleon, Double Rook, Prophecy, Double Sacrilege, probably the first showing of the Sacrilege, uh, Pontifex, and Double Vexor. Uh, my goodness, you know, Vydra Reloaded are great at coming up with outside the box thinking, setups you don't really expect, and this is no exception. We've got a Prophecy, Unironic Sacrileges, and a chameleon. Yeah, and I believe when we were sitting at the desk, you had made the comment of, I don't know why anyone would bring a chameleon, and now we see a chameleon. So it's going to be very interesting. Um, I'm assuming if one, I'm assuming by the end of this match, we'll see one, if not two, dead ET ships. So uh, a chameleon, by the way, for those that don't know at home, it is an Alliance Horn and Prize ship. Uh, you know, it gets, it's like a Gila 
and a, f a rook all in one. So you essentially get uh, three rooks uh, for the low, low cost of an extra 200 billion esque or so with that chameleon. So we're going to have to watch out for, you know, these two sacrilege pilots. Uh, Mystic Rebel and Pandy need to be on top of their game. This is the moment they've been waiting for. They wanted to see to win Battleship Cores. These guys will go down and pin the Vindicators of Sully and Onivia. And, you know, if they do that, then Vydra, I think, has a really, really good chance to, uh, to make the defending champion sweat it out here. Uh, it's all going to come on to uh, the backs of RNGesus to see who can get the jams. And, uh, you know, for Tuskers, they need to have their Cursed Pilot do some godly maneuvers here. Yeah, so the match has started. We immediately see that Vydra control bar spiking up as there are attempted ECM jams, as well as those tracking disruptors on those Vindicators. Um, Vi the, the Tusker team is actually burning in. We see both Oneva and Suleiman burning in the, those Vindicators, whereas those those sacrileges are actually kind of backing away, getting ready to try and screen them. Yeah, absolutely. And this is just very, very smart maneuvers on the Vydra side. Uh, they know that the, the team that rushes in first generally loses uh, that battle. So the, the Vydra sacrileges are operating as a screen. They're just going to play keep away from the Vindicators. Uh, the Vindicators from the Tusker side are just you know, methodically charging across the field, uh, trying to get it in a positioning. And we can see you know, Tuskers have a lot of drones out right now. And uh, they're actually shooting Vydra Reloadlids drones, who uh, one of their pilots, you know, just sent out, uh, you know, some drones to tease them a little bit. Yeah, uh, looks, looks like those drones went for that purifier, but obviously haven't done too much. The purifier seems to be sitting pretty with no reps on him. All right, here we go. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Mystic Rebel and Pandy have gone out and met the Vindicators, and they are webbing each other down. Uh, these Vindicators are getting neutered by the curse. Or rather, the sacrileges are getting neutered by the curse to try and free the Vindicators. Uh, you know, these Vindicators need to get free from these sacrileges uh, if they have any chance at applying damage. And Vydra is just waiting for the jam game to go for them. Well, it looks like it worked. One Vindicator seems to be free, and it looks like the new on that sacrilege. He is now in armor, uh, catching reps from that Guardian. But it looks like they're just going to not even worry about trying to go past them and just try and destroy them. Although this Rabisu has not been able to apply reps on those Vindicators. So now we see the now we see the icon. Although it's, they're going to take a while to catch because armor reps come at the end of the cycle rather than the beginning. Vajra need to do something about this curse. This curse is just wrecking them right now by nuding off some of the tackle. We see that Mystic Rebel and Pandy in the sacrileges have got tackle back on the Vindicators again, and the Vajra Reloaded team is just moving around, keeping away from the Vindicators that they know can no longer chase them. Uh, they just wait for the jam game. If they get a jam on the Rabisu, they just start firing with everything they have on one of the softer targets here. That's going to be a Purifier, that's going to be a Vexer, and uh, you know possibly... A curse if they're feeling a little bit cheeky. Yeah, and I'm looking at the Rabisu. So we see the icon of those of the armor repair, although it doesn't seem to be coming from the Rabisu. Or maybe, yep, maybe it is. But there's also um, a swarm of rep bots on the Vindicators as well. And they seem, now that they have actually caught full reps, um, they seem to be sitting sitting well in their armor. And then the Sacrilege still seems to be taking damage, though the Guardian keeps catching him with reps, although the Guardian is also neutered. So we see some drone battle going on in the center of the arena here. Um, there are Tusker's drones killing armor maintenance bots from the Hydra, uh, Vajri Loaded side. And, uh, you know, that is going to be pretty, pretty wild. Uh, these guys, they definitely need to do... Uh, more than just kill drones. It's, you know, it's the composed thing to do, but uh, they got to make some moves here. And as we can see now, the curse is finally getting uh, dealt with by these rooks and by the chameleon. Yeah, and the purifier looks like is being the primary from the Vydra side as well as that curse. So they're trying to split damage, um, cause the Rabisu to maybe not apply full reps on one or the other, but they desperately need this curse to stay alive. And he's not He's caught oh, reps. that curse is going down. I don't think it's going to work. I think the Rabisu might be jammed. I think those are just jammed drone effects. And bam, the curse is down. That is all the control that the Tuskers have. Mm -hmm. And they're being dominated by Vydra right now. Uh, the double works, the double rooks and the chameleons, uh, or the chameleon, is just proving too effective. The sacrileges are doing the job. I can't believe I'm saying this. The sacrileges are winning right now. <laughs> uh, and both teams took a prophecy because they want to make me look dumb. But... Uh, jokes on them. I still predicted that Vydra would win this match, and I think they might. Yeah, so it looks like uh, Vydra's now still working on that Purify, who just barely managed to catch reps with a sliver of structure left. Props to that Rabisu. Um, the Tusker still seems to be working or attempting to kill that Sacrilege, and it's not getting them anywhere. Yeah, that Sacrilege is a brick. We've seen teams use a ship like the Mauler. Uh, the Sacrilege is just like a Mauler, but way better, way more durable, and it has you know a decent amount of damage. It's not picked for its damage. It's picked to hold down a double core like this. So, 
you know, Nick and Noiser played Tuskers like a fiddle with this pick right here. Uh, you know, really, really good theory crafting and decision making on this Vydra side. I'm very impressed. No matter the outcome, Vydra should feel pretty good about, uh, you know, making the Tuskers bleed a little bit. Mm -hmm. And from watching this, it looks like they're still attempting to kill that Purify. They're not able to apply enough damage to break through him and those Rabisu reps. But at the same time, Vydra's already up ahead on points. They don't really have to kill anything else. If they can just utilize their full control bar on the Tuskers and, outpl and outplay them and outlast them, then they win. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, we have been seeing a drone battle going on. Uh, Vydra are probably losing a few of their drones right here. And uh, it's it's not that great for them in the in the long term. But as you said, they have the points advantage, so they don't care all that much. They've got a purifier down. They're going for the second one, and Tuskers are swapping their primary. They're realizing that the sacrilege is too hard to break through, so they're gonna go for a prophecy. Uh, they got a snap web on the prophecy really quickly there, um, possibly by the the Pontifex, and they're gonna hope that their vindicators are in range. Maybe they just plink away with null. Uh, yeah. So I was going to say, this Prophecies actually went in immediately on those, vind or not immediately, but on the Vindicators, running his Smart Bomb to actually get rid of any rep bots. Because obviously if the Rabisu's jammed, but he has his rep bots on his teammates, then they're still catching reps even without using the actual module and using drones instead. Yeah. So this Prophecy is using his Smart Bomb to try and get rid of those off the Vindicator so that Vydra could actually break one of them. Yeah, but it's going to be a long time for that to work. But you know, this match has already gone on for six minutes. Uh, Vydra looking very commanding here. Uh, that Prophecy is taking some damage, but... It looks like Nick and Noiser, the captain, is able to keep this prophecy alive. Potentially what he's doing is he's baiting a little bit. He's letting Tuskers think that the prophecy might just be slipping a little bit so they keep on him. Yeah. Um, but you know what? If they get a jam, if something happens, then it could be... Uh, it could be a huge upset here. Yeah, so we see Suleiman being primaried again by oh, Vydra. Oh, snap. That prophecy is actually going down really hard right now. Uh, Nick and Noiser better be baiting really, really well. Uh, it looks like the prophecy is actually Vindicator Web. The Vindicators are unjammed right now. This could be a disaster. Oh. This might be some links. Uh, it's not enough points for the Tuskers to take the advantage here, but it, it you know... It's part of the process. Yeah, so Prophecy down. Tuskers are still, not, still in this. They're not out yet, even though they are down on points. So now they're probably going to be priming one of these Sacrilegious next, or it looks like they had actually gone for the Pontifex, who has a scram on him. So he's clearly been tackled. Um, yep, so the, the Pontifex is, it looks like he might be scrammed by the other Pontifex. So there's like a Pontifex duel going on there um, between Ice Tim and uh, Hoodie Mafia. But, you know, the Vexter positioning on this Vydra Reloaded side is fantastic. They're all the way in the back. They're saying, you know what? My drones do all the work. We just saw them put out a new flight of drones right now because their drones have been getting shot the whole time. Uh, the Vydra Prophecy, as you mentioned, it went up to the Vindicators to smart bomb some rep bots. Uh, that could have been all he want, needed to do with his, uh, with his goal there, or as his goal there uh, to get those rep bots dead. Yeah, it looks like these um, these sacrileges are probably not going to be primaried anymore. They just have a swarm of rep drones on them. Um, I'm not quite sure who Tuskers would be going for next. Maybe that Pontifex, unless unless Hoodie Mafia thinks he's probably going to win a 1v1. Yeah, there is absolutely no way that uh, Tuskers can do anything here. They knew that their backs were up against the wall when they saw this setup. They knew what these sacrileges were meant to do, and these sacrileges, highlighted by Mystic Rebel and Pandy, just flew perfectly right now. Like... Just a master pl class in sacrilege piloting in the Alliance tournament. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to take that class, but, you know, if they did want to take it, these guys would definitely be the professors. So the second purifier by Dana Walker actually went down to Vydra. So Vydra's only up by seven points. However, this Pontifex is worth six. Um, I think he's actually being tackled, it looked like, by the Tusker's Prophecy as well as the Vexer. So I'm not sure if they're going to be able to beat him in time or try to win these points back. There's only a minute 30 left. I'm not quite sure what Tuskers are going to be able to do this claw to do to claw this back. Yeah, I mean, Vydra, they're just in a commanding lead right now. They do have their Guardian scrammed, but it doesn't matter at all. These Vindicators are pinned down by these Sacrileges, and uh, there's really nothing they can do about it. It looks like both Vindies are unjammed right now, so we might see in the last minute here a burst of damage on something, um, but... Probably a little bit too little too late. These Vindicators must be hating life right now. You know, what's worse than being jammed is being controlled in a Vindicator. You just want to get up in someone's face and blast mm. them. Uh, and these Tuskers Vindicators are both jammed and controlled, so they can't do anything. Even hitting Null, 
it just it's just awful for these guys. Yeah, and we can see that with their attack bar. They have a pretty pretty big attack bar compared to Vidro. However, it's just there's only a sliver of red as they're not really able to apply any DPS. And even if they weren't jammed, like you said, the control they have the webs on them. They have the tar the tracking disruptors on. Them, they have a one of them even has a scram on them. They're not really able to do anything but sit there and just pretend like they're shooting something. I guess I don't. So the elimination bracket is going to be filled entirely with former tournament winners. Agreed, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be absolutely crazy down there because it's, you know, elimination. When you lose in the elimination bracket, you get eliminated. Like yeah. that That's why we call it that. However, we do have, I believe, the top two teams from last year in the elimination bracket, whereas third place and fourth place, no, actually top three teams, and then fourth place being in CDOT, is actually still in the winner's bracket, though their match is coming up later today. Yeah, Northern Coalition versus Exodus will be next, and you know, both these teams are going to be licking their chops at the path to victory becoming that much easier. Time is over. Vigil Reloaded takes us 18 to 11 with a Chameleon and a Rubisu on field. Uh, I'm Elise Randolph, joined by Chocolate Rain. We're going to send it back to the studio to break down what happens, and maybe we'll get some sad moderator. None of them died, though. Bye, Steve. Bye, Steve. Bye, Steve. <laughs> And former champions of the Alliance Tournament, the Tuskers, make their way down from the undefeated bracket into the elimination bracket, where for their next match, they will go up against We Form Volta. That is going to be a match. That is scary for them, but that is going to be spectacular. Tomorrow we are going to see uh, both um, Tuskers Volta and PL Hydra, both in the elimination bracket, both <sighs> best of one. That's going to be, those are two spectacular matches. Those are two matches that if anyone had said, that's what the final's going to be before we done the brackets for this tournament, anyone would have said, oh yeah, that's, that's a perfectly normal final. And we're going to be seeing them in the elimination bracket. Yeah. This is the top three from last year are all now down in the elimination bracket. In incredible, incredible mm -hmm. point. Uh, Maud, can we get a close-up? Can we get a close-up? <laughs> Maud, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, how are you feeling? This is what I get for saying that I was going to want my cut of those prize ships. <laughs> I, I deserve this. I really have earned this. Dude, that's yeah. a, and that's Vidra, startling hubris. This is not yeah. your fault. You didn't yeah, do no. this. Vidra, Vidra earned that match. Um, as much as we like to joke about things like uh, the Amara Tech 2 hack, whose name I'm forgetting, the Sacrilege. Sacrilege yeah. yeah, that was... Uh, they're great screening ships against Yeah, Vindicators. they're the perfect screening ship <laughs> yeah. against Vindicators. They've got excellent resists and... I was joking about Jin Ten with like one dimensional setups, but unfortunately, the setup that Tuskers does does one thing, it does some other things really well, but it just can't, it's not flexible enough to deal with uh, mm -hmm. what Vydra brought. Uh, Vydra, they knew what they needed to do, they executed it essentially perfectly, really, and Tuskers from there on out couldn't primary uh, a target long enough uh, while being unjammed to break it. They eventually got rejammed. Reps would get back on something, and it was kind of downhill from there. Yeah, we we talk about uh, jamming being so, so prominent sometimes. Uh, now there are ways to deal with it, but but this is one of those instances where you look at it and there's just nothing that they can do uh, with their setup. Yeah, I mean the uh, the jams were actually only landing part of the time. Yeah. For for most of the match, all the, most of those ships could fire just fine. Um, the thing that actually really uh, defeated Tusker there wasn't the ECM; it was the tackle. It was the fact that they couldn't get the Vindicators, which are these big close close range ships on top of targets. And with that, that meant that all the um, Vider team had to do was wait for that occasional jam and then get a kill on things like a Purifier or a Pontifex when they got the opportunity. 
Well, they they okay. executed well. They they got the okay. job done. Neither of those uh, alliance from red prize ships going down. Uh, there was two, one, uh, one yeah, for each. Yeah, yeah Rabasu and a chameleon, and um, they both survived to maybe fight another day. Because I think uh, we are likely going to see Tuskers pull that Rabasu out again. Oh, almost definitely. Yeah, almost definitely. Uh, yeah. Tuskers making their way down into the elimination bracket, uh, where they will go up against uh, We Form Volta. Uh, that will happen uh, tomorrow, and I think the time for that is uh, seventeen hundred. Eve time is that that seems all right. Uh, that looks right to me. I yes. Yep. yep. I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. I've got it down. Uh, so we'll see Tuskers again. Uh, we'll certainly see Vydra again as they make their way again through the undefeated bracket, uh, heading possibly towards victory. Uh, in the meantime, though, we have additional action here to focus on. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, NC dot Northern Coalition dot versus Exodus. That fight coming up here uh, again. Both of those teams having made appearances in the Alliance tournament, uh, ob obviously numerous times before. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those pilots very skilled, and they have brought in their bands. The band coming in for Northern Coalition Dot uh, have been the Deacon, the Slepnir, and the Ishtar. Uh, and for Exodus, the Gila, the Rabisu, and the Atana. Now, they're going after yeah. both of those prize, prize ship Lajis, trying to get them off the field. Uh, what, do, what do you think we're seeing from Exodus that they're so afraid of those, uh, the, those uh, prize ships? In this case, I think they're just trying to eliminate some of these really strong options for NC. Dot. We know that NC.1 were some Rabasus last year, uh, so they definitely have access to them. Uh, and uh, that's going to be something that, like we saw in this last match, is the kind of thing you bring out in these matches, where it's a best of one, you don't want to get knocked out of the elimination bracket, you're going to throw every bit of resources your alliance can muster into it. A little, little bit of mm -hmm. bling limitation from Exodus. Mod, mm -hmm. what do you think about the, uh, the Nancy Dot fans? <laughs> um, so NC Dot, they want to ban out Deacon because they might not have good setups to counter uh, that double Deacon pair that we see so much. Mm -hmm. Slepnir is just, it's an all-round good ship. Uh, that's why we see it's one of uh, the ships that's used most often. Alexi from uh, Even T, uh, he made an excellent set of graphs, and that was one of the ships that's up there. Again, also with the Ishtar, that's another ship that's been used uh, very frequently in the drone meta at the hack point cost. It's very good for what it does. Yeah, this might indicate uh, NC Dot wanting to bring drones of their own, but with a setup that doesn't use Ishtars, because drones have a hard time killing the Deacons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, ha have we seen a, a, a really good solution to the Deacon other than than locking it down with an interceptor? Uh, we saw someone attempt that and fail. We've seen someone attempt that and win. Mm -hmm. Have we seen something that's that's just blatantly better than the, the double Deacon setup all the time? Uh, newts work really, really well against it. It's a bit of rock, paper, scissors. I don't think there's anything that's always going to be better than it, but for countering that specific setup, Newts are really effective. Uh, anything that can hit small targets, rapid lights, which we've seen from the Orthrus, from the Gila, really, really good. Not seeing the Orthrus really uh, be mm -hmm. as dominant as it could be. That's a good ship, but, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen them perform as well as they could uh, this tournament thus far around. Um, I, I don't know if, if you guys have... Uh, an observation on that. It's just I see them explode a lot, but I don't see them really delivering when they need to in clutch situations. Yeah, well, with uh, the rules change allowing, uh, going from AT-14, there were no Tech-2 mobile drones. Now, so the mobile drones being the heavies, the lights, and the mediums. So with those, uh, it's a bit more of a deeper, you have a lot more options with those kind of drone kiting setups than you do with kind of the shield light missile kiting setups. They're a little bit more versatile. You can do more with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but uh, uh, it's nice to have the option to be able to throw people off, too. It's, I think for teams, having the ability to field a good drone team, a good Navy BC team, uh, a good rapid light team, maybe a, uh, a slap near fly killer team. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the like really core archetypes that if you can pull those out and surprise people, then you've got a really strong roster. Certainly have seen a, a lot of variation in the comps, not actually like one dominant uh, I mean, a, a few mm -hmm. a few meta threads emerging, but but yeah. nothing that's ruled over everything mm -hmm. in in, a new, uh, in most situations. And it's certainly not seeing the type of uh, homogeneity across the bands that we saw last year, where it was almost always the executor or the guardian. Mm -hmm. um, so that's interesting. Uh, we will see uh, how these teams do. Do we have some predictions here? NC dot uh, and Exodus. Who is it that's really gonna gonna walk away from this? Okay, so. What I'm learning really quickly is that I need to pick the team I don't actually want to win because I just curse everyone. So, um, <laughs> you know what? I, I think Exodus should should win, and I'm not trying to say that to curse them. I was a former team captain of those guys. I hope that they do well. Um, I give them a bit of an edge, but anything can happen in best of ones. Mm 
Mm -hmm. These are two great teams, but I'm going to go with Exodus. So we've got two votes for Exodus. Mm -hmm. I, you know, just just for the heck of it, I'll I'll give it to NC. We'll see how they do, uh, and and we'll go right over there as soon as the match is ready. I think uh, the ships are still being moved into position. We've got a little bit of a of a technical break there. Mm -hmm. uh, while I have a minute, uh, a few shouts to people. Uh, I've just got notifications here. Uh, David G indicates to everyone watching at home that you need to kill the bow. Don't let him boundary. Uh, Nola Kataru says, Mr. Cellophane, please pay your loan. Uh, Yanarfall reminds us all that Apollo Defense Industries is recruiting. Uh, Santorin reminds everybody uh, of the importance of differential equations in EVE Combat. And I, I, I can't stress that enough. Know your math. Uh, and uh, Brainstraw invites you to contact him for any of your support wizardry inquiries. Uh, apparently he knows quite a lot about the carries in the sfipple. Yeah. I, I can't I can't argue. Uh, uh, any other notes uh, coming in uh, include, uh, a, again, a recommendation to everyone watching at home to stop by evemeet.net uh, to make sure that you know of Eve Meet ups happening in your area around the world. Uh, and of course, if you're scheduling an Eve Meet and would like to invite people along, feel free to hop on there uh, and register it so that others can uh, be aware of what's happening. Uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to the Eve Meet that's happening in the uh, Washington, D.C., Virginia, and Maryland area every month. Uh, and it, I think it's a a varying location. I could be wrong about that. It might be at Dogfish uh, this this month. Uh, it could not. It could not be. Don't hold me to it. Uh, I I keep wanting to go. I, w I would love to hop over and and visit. And I just haven't been able to make it happen. But you can if you're in the Washington D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. So uh, make sure you stop by. Uh, check that out. There's a thread on Reddit. Uh, you guys, at Fozzie, of course, you participate a little bit on Reddit. Mod, I don't see you on Reddit so often. Do I? Um, I've been backing a little bit uh, away from uh, posting, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, it's it's really good to get involved with some of these Eve meets. At, I believe there was just an Eve meet that some of the CCP devs just recently came back from. Yeah, yeah, we've had uh, we had some people that went to uh, Saint Petersburg, Russia, and then as well myself and CCP Archduke went to uh, Eve Northeast, uh, which was a really really great time. Amazing group of people there. They're, they're expanding that though. That's a, kind of like a camping trip sort of. Thing. Yeah, yeah. They've got a um, a farm that is being uh, rented out for events and. Um, uh, they've got a uh, place for camping, some cabins, and it's a really, really amazing time. Uh, they uh, uh, get a lot of youth players. It's a very wormhole heavy event. Lots of uh, lots of wormholers there, and uh, started out just as a court barbecue that just expanded. They had a corporation barbecue they ran every year. Then they invited everyone else, and eventually they had to move it to a bigger venue. Well, that's that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, maybe we can we can. Make it a regular thing that we send more devs. Out oh there. yes, yeah. I think uh, we've sent people for the last three years, and uh, even before that, we were doing Skype uh, calls in to uh, say hi to them. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, of course, that that is a uh, one big plus about these player meetups is that uh, if you can get CSP involved, uh, we will we will make an effort uh, to participate in any way we can, whether that's uh, donating uh, goods to be given away or uh, making appearance as devs. Right now, making an appearance are our next two teams for the field, NC Dot and uh, Exodus. We will see how it plays out in match 106 here at Alliance Tournament 15. Uh, take it away, Rain Chocolate and Elise Randolph. All right, guys, welcome back to Alliance 115 action. We've got Northern Coalition dot in red, Exodus in blue. We're going to start a pretty quick heal here. Uh, DHB Wildcat is in the flag, Balgorn. He is at the center of the unit right now. He is going to try to control these Exodus Vindicators. Uh, this Alliance tournament, apparently, it's all about controlling the Vindicators. Uh, Rain, why don't you introduce what Exodus have? So Exodus, like you said, Vindicators. Then they got the Guardian, the Curse, Double Pawn Effects, Double Sweeple, which actually attempted to fly in. They immediately started taking damage and then 360 noped away. The Vexor and then the Purifier. And it looks like the Vindicator is now being primaried for Northern Coalition. All right, a lot of control on both teams. Uh, it looks like both guys know exactly what the other ones wanted to do. Uh, so the Battlecruiser hulls on the Northern Coalition side are getting zonked by these Curse Tracking Disruptors. They're not able to do anything. Uh, meanwhile, the Vindicators are getting kind of controlled by the Balgorns, mm -hmm. but I say kind of controlled because uh, although the Balgorn does get a web range bonus, it doesn't have web strength. So these uh, Vindicators, they're, they're going 500 meters a second, which is still pretty quick. Yeah, especially for battleships. And then actually, most people warp their Balgorn in really close, which it looks like what um, 
DHB Wildcat and the flagship Balgorn actually did, but he is also moving away as it seems those Vindicators seem to be coming in on top of him. And we did see him run a smart bomb as well to try and kill those Exodus drones being sent over to his teammates. Yep, DHB Wildcat right in the center of the battle right now. Exodus are kind of flying right next to him. Uh, they're going to have to be careful, as you said, not to get smart bombed as they send drones by because that is one of the jobs of this Balgorn. But uh, we see Exodus just ignoring the Balgorn. Uh, they've got it webbed with Vindy Web, so it's going quite slow. And a lot of the support wing, which are these people, we haven't seen many of them. The Alliance tournament, they were one of the most popular ships last at the Alliance tournament for how versatile they are. And you know, they're they're kind of they've kind of got a good skill cap on them. And Exodus. Uh, are predicated on their piloting skill. Yeah, and if we watch, actually, this about DHB and the and the Balgorn has been tempting to screen all of Exodus, but all of Exodus has actually just kind of flown around him. I believe the Guardian, the Vexer, as well as the Curse, kind of flew around him. And it looks like he actually managed to snag that Curse. All right, or so not uh, the Curse, the Guardian. The, the Guardian is webbed and scrammed, which is big news here. Uh, the Oneros on the Northern Coalition side, however, is zero speed and getting neutered by the Exodus Curse. So both guys are trying to go for the Logi trade here by some means or another, but Northern Coalition actually killed the ship very quickly. Uh, Exodus are not going to be happy with this at all. They thought they had good positioning, they thought they were being meticulous, but nope, uh, the Balgorn uh, got the webs on it just at the mm -hmm. right moment, swapped off from a Vindicator, and uh, the DPS was applied. Although, this Oneros, while still is at full health, he is not going to be doing too well with both Newts and Nos, as well as a web and a scram on him. He's not going to be able to move around, so what Northern Coalition has to do is either kill all of the Exodus team, or to potentially prevent him from harm, or kill the key ships that are locking him down, which seems to be these double pawn effects, or Sveeples, actually. Yeah, it looks like the uh, Northern Coalition dot uh, Oneros did get lost in the sauce a little bit. Kind of didn't move, didn't really care about his positioning, was going zero speed, but uh, doesn't matter as Exodus are currently about to lose a Vindicator. Uh, that's one Vindicator about to go pop. Northern Coalition says, oh, you got a curse, that's great control, great dragon interrupters, don't care, killing your Vindicators. And uh, Mr. Black is about to die. Man, poor Vindicator, the last two matches. Sad yeah. boys for the Vindicators. Yeah, these Vindies, while they're very, very strong, especially when when they're able to get on top of the opponent, they're also easily countered by all of this E-War, whether it be tracking disruptors, webs to pin them down, or just pretty much anything. If, you, if your team's able to properly kite, they can't get on top of anything to shoot and destroy it. And this Oneros, we see it take a, took a little bit of hold or uh, armor damage, but he seems to be sitting just fine, even though he is pretty hard tackled. Yeah, so we this is the second time in a row we've seen a dominant winning team bringing uh, double Vindicators and a Curse. Uh, Exodus brought a little bit different support with them this time uh, compared to Tusker's last, but you know, this setup is just eating it right now. It can't do anything right. It seems like, is this just a bad matchup or is this just, you know, good execution? I would say it's probably good execution by the Northern Coalition team. I, the, the Balgorn obviously keeping those Vendies away from away from his team, but at the same time, he did he did let everyone else go past, but they weren't able to do anything about it. So just because the Sveeples were able to tackle that Oneros, Exodus wasn't able to apply the damage. So therefore, it really didn't matter if his team got tackled or he wasn't able to screen some of the smaller ships compared to those Vindies. Yeah, it looks like Wasa QC is taking some appreciable damage right now. Uh, Northern Coalition realizing that they probably got this one in the bag, uh, though they are losing their Oneros right now. So the Vindicators actually, I say that, and then this Vindicator has actually come up and sat right on top of this Oneros. <laughs> So I had spoken, obviously, too soon. This Vindicator, while a little bit in, in armor, is clearly just wiping the floor with this poor little Oneros. Yep, so the back and forth, you know, Exodus, they're not giving up. They're not saying, oh, mm -hmm. they're just making Northern Coalition play the one out. Northern Coalition has made mistakes in previous Lions tournament. Uh, you know, they've boundary, they've lost matches to piloting mistakes. And uh, I think Crowlor is going to wish he flew a little bit better in this one uh, because he got caught really early and had his cap nuded out really early for no reason when Northern Coalition had all of the control in the world. So he is dead. Uh, the match probably still in uh, Northern Coalition's favor, but Exodus could potentially, you know, cause some damage here uh, with... Yeah. I mean, they could kill the Flag Bow. So... Yeah, they kill the flag bow. So for some reason, the Balgorn actually went right on top of the Vindicator. I'm assuming to attempt to save the Oneros. It didn't work. Oneros is dead. But now this Vindicator is sitting right on top of this Balgorn. Even though he's being tracking disrupted, he's pretty much sitting at zero on so he's able to fully apply his, his damage. And we have seen teams in the past uh, lose a match to kill a flagship. If a flagship dies, mm -hmm. if this Northern Coalition Balgorn dies, DHB Wildcat cannot pilot it throughout the rest of the tournament. Um, so this is probably not what uh, Exodus wanted to do, but you know they're trying to get some uh, silver lining here. 
Uh, probably not going to work though because I have a feeling this vindicator is hearing the capacitor. The, ca the capacitor is empty over and over and over again. Yep. So for the Vindicator, being able to use those blasters obviously doesn't work when you're being neutered and yeah. lost. And that's something that Balgorin uh, can do very well. It really gives the suck, uh, as the kids are saying these days. And uh, you can see the attack bar from the Exodus side, uh, pretty anemic. Mm -hmm. You know, not able to apply that blaster DPS in full. He's got to inject, yep. shoot, capacitor is empty. Um, but, I mean, I guess he, he just popped a Vexor instead of the Balgorin, so... Yeah, I mean, at the same time, just because Exodus loses this match, they're only going to be down in the elimination bracket. So while they could have potentially, like you said, thrown the match to kill the Balgorn, it may not have been a good idea. And it looks like they tried to attempt to kill that Balgorn, but obviously a single Vindicator can't just solo him, especially while being neutered. Yeah, absolutely. So Exodus, you know, just trying to try and claw back here. They, they did lose. They had really good piloting. Uh, but, you know, Northern Coalition setup, I think, was just a little bit too good. They brought out that flagship. A good job from the uh, the Exodus side for banning the Rubisu. I'm sure that Northern Coalition wants to field this with the Rubisu instead of the Oneros. But, you know, maybe they got a little bit lucky because they did lose their Lodgy. Yeah, yeah. So, obviously, an Oneros would not be as expensive as the Rubisu. Although, I believe it's you who said, if you lose an AT ship but win the match, then it's definitely worth yeah, it's it. Yeah, hashtag worth. And uh, Northern Coalition... They are licking their chops right now. Tusker is eliminated. Exodus is gone. They've got, you know, a really good path to victory here. Uh, for myself and Rain Chocolate, we're going to send it back to CCP Antiquarian and the boys in the studio. We all have dreams of greatness. At Upwell Consortium, we have made this dream a reality. It's a very excellent picture of, uh, of Fozzie there in the Amsterdam commercial. Amsterdam is always an amazing time. It's wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a wonderful fight that we just saw there. Uh, Northern Coalition versus Exodus. Exodus going down into mm -hmm. the elimination bracket. Not going to say that I called it. Uh, because I'll let someone else remind you that I called it. Someone else will tell you about it. I uh, should have known better than to agree with moderator. It's, <laughs> <laughs> oh, mod. I mean, he's not wrong at this point. Right now, every team I pick, I'm just actually cursing them to lose. I've got, like, some, like, apparent, like, demonic power that I picked up in the <laughs> airport from, like, some Norse uh, god or something. Yeah, Dem so, I mean, I wouldn't call that an upset. Uh, NC Dot, of course, did really well last year and then came in fourth last year. Yeah. Um, so they actually were probably the, the favorite, if you look at last year's um, success. Uh, but uh, this uh, these are two teams with really uh, strong tournament pedigrees. Fan fantastic mm -hmm. teams, so who have made an excellent showing in, in yeah. tournaments previous, made an excellent showing in that fight, in fact. Uh, talk a little bit about what we saw going on there uh, as far as uh, using their ships and ex executing. Uh, Exodus unable uh, to get past NC Dot uh, and their their setup. What what happened? Moderator? Well, it, this problem with the Vindicator is a similar problem that Toskers had uh, in the last match against Vydra. If you get your Vindicators essentially locked down, mm -hmm. it's very tempting, very, very tempting with the points reduction that we have as a part of the rule set to bring them because they do uh, excellent damage at close range, have the 90% webs that can lock down and hit damage uh, to anything really in the game. Um, but again, they're a little bit one-dimensional, yeah. and that's what happened here. I think a lot of teams are getting wise now. At this point, the teams that are left are smart enough to not warp in a zero, which is the real danger <laughs> with the Vindicator. If you if you can catch people right on top of you, then you're in great shape as a Vindy. But uh, with this situation, you had the Flag Balgorn, which was a huge impact in this match. And the Flag Balgorn can hold the Vindicators at range and keep itself out of optimal. The, uh, the Flag Balgorn is also the reason that uh, NCDOT was able to catch that uh, Lodgy for Exodus. 
Now, interestingly enough, we see a lot of these flag battles making an appearance now after Alliance Tournament 14, where they were prominent because of the point reduction. We didn't see quite as many of them before in Alliance Tournament 13, Alliance Tournament 12. Not as many, but they were still the most popular. I think Balgorns have been the most popular flagship probably every year, actually, since the flagship rule got introduced. Um, but definitely but, more But more this so year. now, yeah. yeah. I think a lot of teams realized how strong they were after the points reduction last year, um, and that just increased their popularity a lot. Um, in previous years, we'd seen more cases of um, uh, rattlesnakes. Uh, that was a pretty common, yeah. and Navy scorpions. Um, that's gotten a little bit less popular this year. Yeah. Now, if, if, if I might, because I'm curious, uh, Fozzy, when you go in to make the rules for each successive tournament, it's obviously not you by yourself, it's the entire uh, EVE tournament team, and you, and you guys take a look at, at what has been happening and what's going to happen. What, what guides you towards picking, say, one pirate faction versus another, or one particular uh, module or one particular type of drone, for instance? Mm -hmm. So for choosing the pirate faction that is sponsoring the tournament, uh, we've been actually moving through the pirate faction. So Serpentis was the last one to come up. So that was the uh, that was a pretty easy choice for us. We knew that uh, we hadn't done a Serpentis uh, prize ship yet. Uh, we had some really good ideas of fun prize ships we could make for them, and so we decided to go that direction. Plus, low points for Serpentis ships are something that are very exciting to watch. Uh, it's a lot of blasters, a lot of damage, a lot of explosions. Um, and then for the rest of the rules, our big priorities are making sure that uh, we have a fun-to-watch tournament, which means often uh, skewing things more towards explosions and damage and less towards defensiveness, uh, and also making sure that things are shaken up from the year before. So we, wanted to, we want to have a new challenge for teams to overcome. Right on. We certainly have been seeing uh, teams respond to those rules changes mm -hmm. in this tournament. Again, leaning towards the Vindicator perhaps a little bit too much, as indicated in the last two matches. Uh, what do you think of the rules this year so far, moderator? Things have, have played out, and we're, we're starting to get a look at, at what the metas are and how these top-tier teams are responding to them. What do you think? I mean, ever since we've had the uh, change in the rule set where we've moved from uh, 12 point. 12 men to a 10 man roster, it's allowed people to have uh, a bit deeper uh, and more mechanically skilled players. And what that's done along with the rules changes is it's really upped the elevation of the kind of the baseline for where teams are at, along with the Thunderdome being a thing. So we're seeing a lot of factors come in to increase the overall skill level, and it makes the matches a lot more entertaining. So it's been very healthy on the whole. Excellent, excellent, excellent. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> uh, of course, we also like to hear about what's coming up in the Alliance Tournament. The The next match, uh, second to last match of the day, will be the Initiative versus Pen is Out. Uh, the Initiative uh, has has some pilots of, of repute. Uh, mm -hmm. The Pen is Out. I'm, I'm not familiar with their work all, except for this tournament. I yeah, I think this is, they're, they're pretty new to the Alliance tournament. Uh, the next uh, four teams are all what you would call Cinderella stories. These are teams that people were not expecting to do as well, which is, you're seeing that in, for instance, the ads, that, that um, uh, uh, what was it, the initiative ad, uh, was it? the Or Laserhawks, Laserhawks had the ad talking about how people are getting predictions wrong. Um, the, these are teams that have really upended what we expected, and that's really exciting to watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we hope that this next match is exciting. We have the bands coming in, and, and we'll go to you, Maud, first for commentary on this. Uh, the initiative targeting the Gila, the Ishtar, and the Rattlesnake. Uh, Pen is out, have gone after the Blackbird, uh, that Deacon, uh, and the Vindicator, which I, I guess they're worried about it if, if they're seeing it. Don't know why. Seems to be... <laughs> seems to be fairly so, ineffectual. What do you think, Maud? So Initiative doesn't want to face any sort of a shield drunk hiding setup or even a brawling one. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a fairly standard bans for that. Pen is out. Uh, they've got a very good spread of bans. So uh, Blackbird bans out in sort of like an ECM support, and it's just a good general ban. Then you've got the Deacon. They don't want to fight against, or maybe they don't, can't deal with the, uh, you know, Tech 2 Logi and or Frigate Logi, that is. And the Vindicator, uh, while we have been bashing it a little bit, it's still very good at dealing with a lot of rush comps. If you bring Slapniers against it, the Slapniers lose nine out of ten times. Yeah, yeah. I think the the scene, uh, the Vindicator ban suggests to me that uh, the Pen is Out team wants to be bringing something that's a bit closer brawly, um, something like actually maybe Rattlesnakes. It's possible that they ban the Vindy and then Initiative seeing that ban, ban the Rattlesnake, because Vindicator is one of the things you might ban if you're planning on bringing a Rattlesnake team. 
All right. Well, we've got about uh, 20 seconds before the teams take the field. Uh, so with that, uh, we will we will head over to the booth. Uh, the initiative versus pen, and out, pen is out here at uh, match number 107 of Lions Tournament 15. We have one more match for you today coming up afterwards. That will be a band apart versus Laserhawks, L-A-Z-E-R-H-A-W-K-S. There are spaces, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to, to obey the orthography. Uh, for now, though, uh, we will cut over to Rain Chocolate and Elise. Randolph, who are ready to commentate on uh, initiative versus pen and out, pen is out here at Alliance Tournament 15. Welcome back. I'm Rain, and I'm joined by Elise, and we're going to be commenting initiative versus pen is out. So initiative have brought a flagship Balgorn at 30, double Navy Harvey, Navy Brudix, double Harbinger, double Thalia, those T2 frigate Lodgy, and then a Vexen or Daredevil, all at 50. At least, can you introduce Pen is Out Yep, for the uh, blue side, Pen is Out, also have a flagship in that Balgorn. They have a Gen Oneros, double Prophecy, because they want to make me look bad. Kitsune, double Vexor, double Hound. Uh, they've warped in at a little bit of staggered ranges, but, uh, you know, the Gen and the Balgorn for the Pen is Out side are both at zero. As you can see there, uh, they're going to reach out and do something. And, uh, you know, got to say, I I'm pretty interested to see how this plays out here. Um, the flagships really change the dynamic with these Navy Harbingers and Navy Brudixes because the flagship can you know, go out a little bit longer, get the newts off, and, uh, you know, pen is out an odd setup, I'm going to say yep. that right now. But they do have the tools in the bag to beat the initiative here. Who do you think they're going to be priming first? Do you think it's going to be their key to successes within killing those Thalias, or is it... Maybe getting rid of that Balgorn on the field. All right, so the, the pen is outside their game plan. They have to get these Harbingers and Navy Harbingers down. They got to clear that DPS pretty quickly uh, because they want their Hounds to stay alive. And the, mm -hmm. the Navy Harbingers uh, are really good at shooting the Hounds and the Kitsune. We'll see what the Kitsune uh, focuses on. Uh, fighting starts. Initiative currently focusing on a Vexor right now. And pen is out, as predicted, going on a Harbinger and, uh, you know, spreading the newts. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, it looks like Initiative, instead of trying to kite backwards, they're actually kiting off to the side. The thing is, is they all have to stay together because those Thalia rep ranges are not good, are not, they don't have a lot of range with them. They're like within 20 to 30 at most. So if they get out of range of those Thalias, they're just going to drop very quickly. All right, we do see uh, Kitsune trying to jam the Balgorn on the Initiative side. Uh, Uki, one of the most storied Alliance tournament history, uh, or storied pilots in the Alliance tournament, uh, you know, is going to be able to keep a... Uh, Keep it cool like a mm -hmm. cucumber here. Uh, Pen is out, as you mentioned, to uh, disrupt the Frigate Lodgy. They're just nuding them out. And they've got the tools with the Balgorn and the Gen Newts. Uh, so those reps are not going to be very effective at all. We'll see what happens here as this Harbinger for the Initiative side is getting primaried. And, uh, you know, it could go down. Oh, never mind. The Initiative is also shooting the Balgorn. They realize that the Balgorn is a very weak spot right here with the Frigate Lodgy not being able to do much. This Balgorn on the Initiative side might die. Uki might go down. He is in half arm right now. And he just got scrammed in case he wanted to MJD to, to victory. Not going to work. He is he is actually catching reps. It looks like the Thalia has actually got at least close to him to catch reps. Um, it looks like the 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 pen is out, uh, Balgorn, is also actually smart bombing, attempting to smart bomb these the drones off the Thalia. Um, he has he has run in immediately directly into the middle of the initiative team and scrammed things down. So the, yep. the Harbinger immediately drops from that Balgorn. That is a Harbinger down. And uh, to point out, the pen is outside do have Damage drones uh, initiative do have rep bots here. Uh, so that's one harbinger down. They needed this to happen. Good job It looks like the initiative do have one of their thoroughly is tackled and separated from the other one this these guys work in a pair But the initiative not to be outdone have tackled the pen out on arrows and that is their primary uh, a very good decision here right now uh, They need to kill this pen out uh, on arrows and a kitsune just gets blapped by these double navy harbingers just one shot dead Kitsune. So that Thalia that was tackled is now dead. However, it's still there is the other one. Oh, just kidding. He also is now not only newt, but also webbed and target painted. So it looks like he's going to be the next primary for Pen is Out. Yep. So uh, so Nate here in the Pen is Out, Oneros really needs to survive. Uh, he's You see him dipping into low, low armor here. He has to live a little bit longer. He has to buy his team more time. Uh, the initiative just lost their second Thalia. So, you know, a Lodgy trade here does benefit the initiative because they only spent five or ten mm -hmm. points on their Lodgy. Uh, Pen is out devoted 17 points to theirs, uh, but it looks like... It, it might come back. I was going to say, Pen is out, uh, Onerosis did drop, so it did live longer than those Salias. However, without the Lodgy on the field, those Balgorns are not going to live for very long at all unless they win the control war. It's back and forth here. Okay, the Hounds are going down. The Hounds will do all the damage to this Balgorn, so good call on the initiative side. Uki keeping it cool, killing the Hounds. He's got a Vexor tackled right now, which 
will be their next primary. Pretty cheap DPS, but they're trading a Harbinger for it. This is back and forth, back and mm -hmm. forth. Uh, there is no clear victor here right now uh, with these trades. I think both teams are kind of feeling the pressure right now, and they know they have to perform. They want to get a win here. They don't want to go in the elimination bracket because it is spooky, spooky central down there. Yeah, and so these teams have to make the right primary calls as well as being able to execute on being able to get tackled on their opponents. Um, it's pretty much a DPS, DPS race at this point, we, though we do see uh, Lodgy drones on that Navy Harbinger. Yep, so this Navy Harbinger is actually going down pretty quickly. Uh, Hound dies, blowing to Sokar. He just got blapped really quickly here. They're just, you know, these initiative pilots are coordinating their volleys, so they hit it all at the same time. Uh, so this Hound, huge play out there, and a Vexor goes down at the same time. Initiative looks like they have uh, the upper hand here with the Harbinger uh, just staying alive a little bit longer. Um, however, as the match goes on, we've been pointing this out, there's a Balgorn and a Geddon. They win the cap war. The longer the match goes, the better the Balgorn and Armageddon team do. So uh, we'll see what they do, or how this plays out. As a Navy Brudix is, uh, is Balwebbed and the next target. Yeah, so um, even though the points, I believe they were even, well now initiative is down, but they are definitely not out. They are primarying this Vexor, trying to get him immediately off the field, and then they can focus on both oh. of these prophecies. This Navy Brutix is dropping real fast here. There are no more uh, really uh, armor rep bots to keep him alive. He's not structure tanked. He is going to pop. However, you know, Pen is out. They did lose one more DPS ship for it. Uh, so this is a lot of back and forth. I think the pen is out. Obviously, they have the, the advantage in points here, but I think they also have the advantage, uh, you know, just by virtue of having that Geddon and Balgorn as their cores. Yeah, and as we see, even though they are they are mostly control ships, they obviously at least have some sort of weapons because that attack bar is massive, especially for just having two prophecies, whereas the initiative one is slightly smaller, as well as their, I believe, the control bars are pretty closely the same. So even though initiative looks like it may have more DPS, Pen is out is is definitely like has more than just utility with these with these battleships. And one of these teams is going to lose a flagship. Potentially both teams will lose their flagships in this match. So you know, it could be quite disastrous. Uh, Pen is out is getting there, getting focused down uh, right now with the remaining damage that the initiative has. Uh, this harbinger probably can't fire. I mean. He's just injecting and shooting, just doing his damnedest, but he is about to die right here. He is caught by this Balgorn on the Penna's outside. You know, the Balgorn, this is why it's so good, it, especially when it's a flagship. Those webs go out so far, every time the Penna's out team wanted to go for a target, it has been tackled. So now it's Balgorn Vexor versus Balgorn Geddon, double prophecy. Penna's out, chopping off the foot of this Cinderella story. I, I don't think they can come back from, I don't think Initiative can come back from this. I think this single-handedly goes to Penazal. Absolutely, and uh, so Uki piloting the Flag Balgorn is going to lose his Flag Balgorn. I mean, this is just I reality mean, here right now. I mean, he could maybe pull it off and attempt to kite away, but at the same time, he is, he's caught over here by this, uh, what you call it, the Geddon. So yeah. there's no way, there's no way he's going to be able to like burn while being webbed. Um, they could have put an MJD on him, or he could maybe get to a beacon. He's actually very far from any sort of beacon. But if maybe if he if he has an MJD, he can make some elite play. But that's very risky to do. Yeah, super risky. And uh, as I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, Uki is going to go down with the initiative into the elimination bracket, where potentially they could kick PL out again uh, at some point. So maybe that's maybe that's the play. They're like, yeah, we can get PL twice. They don't care if they lose. I still their they don't even care if they lose their flagship. Uh, the as flagship long as they is beat. just for show anyway. This team, they didn't like it. I, clearly, they didn't like it. Uh, it couldn't deliver what they wanted. But, you know, we're joking around. But the pen is outside. I'm very impressed with them. You know, yeah. they're tournament newbies, more or less. They play in faction warfare. And they are just killing their way through the uh, undefeated bracket. If you told me that a uh, faction warfare corp would be in the undefeated bracket at this stage, I'd laugh. <laughs> Uh, so good job, Pen is out. You are making me laugh, and we don't have to throw out all of our pens, which is what, what the play was. So, you know, good job for you guys. Yep. Take the victory lap, scoop that loot, and let me know what was in it. They they are, I haven't seen any of them actually move for this loot. They're calling good fights in local, and this Vexor is being primaried. But no one's actually attempted to scoop loot. So if they don't scoop the loot and they get sent back home, that loot just vanishes off the field. Yep, uh, here's hoping that happens because, you know, that's what the loot gods want. Uh, maybe this Vexor can, you know, maybe just shoot the wreck uh, if he has any drones left. Uh, probably not, though. He is not moving at all. Uh, the initiative not eliminated. They are going into the elimination bracket. Uh, the pen is outside. I think they're guaranteed to get prize ships now, or very close to it. They're, they might be just one yeah. series away from guaranteed prize ships. I think it's, they're 
If they win their next one, I think it's guaranteed third place. That's. I think that's how it works. That's multiple hundreds of billions of isk that they yep. potentially win here in this alliance tournament. They could potentially win trillions of isk for a, a small group. Rapid withdrawal is a pretty small group. Mm -hmm. They're very good in faction warfare. Fly against them quite a bit. Uh, and very impressed. I, I, their setup looked a little bit weird to me. It's unorthodox, but it works. That's all that yep. matters. It doesn't have to look good. It has to perform. And the Penas outside definitely came out today and they performed. And, you know, they took down Tournament Legacy. Uki's teams, yeah. he's not always on the initiative, but his teams are always very hard to beat. Uh, very well thought out. So the, the Penas outside, they definitely should be patting themselves on the back here. Uh, I'm, I'm just really, really impressed. And we do see Chase Tay saying, looting is hard. Uh, he actually typoed every single word in that sentence because his hands must be shaking. Yeah, no, we see, I believe it's like three different ships on this wreck. So they're keeping, the what, what the pen is out is doing is they're keeping the Vexor alive. They have it pinned down, they have it webbed. So what they're actually doing is keeping him alive so that they could loot the field and actually benefit from all from all the drops. Yep, and there it goes. Uh, I'm Elise Randolph with Rain Chocolate. Pen is out, victorious. Uh, we're going to send it back to the boys in the studio to see what they have to say about that. Can I ask you kind of a weird question? Do you want to play some spaceships with me? And there you have it. Uh, the initiative knocked down into the elimination bracket by Pen is out by the transitive property, according to CCP Fozzy. Uh, Pen is out is now officially better uh, than Pandemic Legion. Uh, however, uh, by the transitive property, scissors beat rock? Yeah, I think we're actually going to start to run into those at some point in yeah. this tournament where every chain of, uh, everyone in a chain of teams is beating each other. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's something to watch. Mm -hmm. It's certainly an amazing fight to see on grid. Mm -hmm. uh, Pen is out and an initiative trading back and forth there. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about, about what you saw going on and wh what were the key moments in the fight, moderator? Yeah, Pen is out did a good job at interdicting the ships of initiative. Uh, one thing I might have liked to have seen from them was uh, nuding out some of the initiative uh, battle cruiser core a little bit earlier, especially when you have not only just a Balgorn, uh, but you have the Armageddon. If you can shut off the guns, shut off the prop mods, and uh, prevent them from actually having any sort of hardeners, you do a lot. And that's something they have, that they have to do moving forward. Uh, they should be glad to have that win, but they've got a, some things to tighten up on a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, I think that may be partly connected to the fact that they looks like they had a bit of an unusual fit for their flagship Balgorn. What we've been seeing more this year with flagship Balgorns is full newt fit, full newt, maybe some smart bombs, taking advantage of the fact that flagships can fit very valuable rare modules for neutralizing smart bombs. Um, but flagships can also fit rare and valuable damage modules, modules that increase the damage of your guns. And uh, Pen is out had both newts and guns on their Balgorn. Uh, that's something that we we saw more a couple of years ago than we do now. But that really actually gave them a lot more DPS than uh, their setup might have otherwise had. And what do you think? Do you think mm -hmm. uh, it's worth the gamble of splitting focus that way? I mean, for them it clearly worked. It worked out here, and actually one thing that's notable, they can switch that up. So if they do have maybe some extra um, high-end uh, newts, if they bring the flagship next match, they don't have to bring the same fit for it. They can actually switch that up, and that might be something that can leave a team that was expecting the gun Balgorn uh, flat-footed. That's interesting. Do we, mm -hmm. do we leave that in the rules on purpose, that you don't have to put in your fit for your yep. flagship? Yeah, so we actually, when flagships were first introduced to the rules, they we made people submit a set fit that they had to use throughout the entire tournament. Uh, but then we actually intentionally allowed people to switch them up um, a couple years back with a change in the rules. Nice. Well, mm -hmm. certainly, certainly, we'll see if they if they bring it again, whether or not mm -hmm. they bring it with the same split fit uh, using both damage and newts. Uh, mm -hmm. 
First, though, we've got one more match to get through today uh, before we see any of the action that happens tomorrow. That match coming up, a band apart versus Laser Hawks. Uh, and again, Laser Hawks uh, showing people that uh, that you don't have to have a long history in the tournament necessarily to have an impact and to, mm -hmm. to push, uh, <laughs> to put uh, teams with, say, more storied provenance uh, down into that elimination bracket. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have the bands coming in here, and hopefully we'll have enough time before we go to the booth to get some predictions this time. Uh, the bands from a band apart are the Harbinger Navy issue, the Hurricane Fleet issue, and the Brudix Navy issue, all uh, Navy issue battle cruisers. Uh, from Laserhawks, the Blackbird, the Eos, and the Ishtar. Now, we've seen this Ishtar uh, a uh, band come up again and again and again. We've seen the Blackbird band come again and again and again. Uh, I've not seen a triple battle cruiser uh, band that I recall. No, uh, certainly not one that focuses on the, these Navy battle cruisers. What do we think is happening there, Mod? So, the reason we're not seeing that kind of a band is because what that does is it really only bans out one setup and leaves a whole lot open. What um, we're seeing a lot more, especially in this stage of the tournament, is we're seeing people pick apart the strongest. Uh, components of a lot of different setups. Mm -hmm. uh, again, getting into this stage of the tournament, you need to have that depth if you want to continue advancing in the winner's bracket. Yeah, I think uh, Band Apart, obviously they they really don't want to see Laserhawks bringing these Navy Battlecruiser teams. Uh, and Laserhawks has been very successful with these Battlecruiser teams. In fact, they've actually been bringing a lot of the the really heavy Navy Battlecruiser teams, the ones that ha end up with like uh, six um, um, Navy Battlecruiser or command ships. Um, and uh, so having that band out, maybe a Band Apart trying to force Laserhawks into something they haven't practiced as much, force them into something that they might uh, not rely on as much normally. Now, the mm -hmm. winner of this match, uh, this is match uh, 108. Uh, mm -hmm. The winner of this match won't actually play uh, again until the uh, the series, the 108 versus 107 series uh, yeah. that happens tomorrow afternoon. So, uh, Penn is out has guaranteed themselves by getting this win here uh, to go to the uh, winner's bracket uh, semifinals, which are best of three tomorrow at, in the second half of the day. Uh, so, that is a great relief for any team to be able to get to that point. And the mm -hmm. winner of the match between uh, Pen is out and whoever wins this fight. Now they're guaranteed prize ships, correct? Yes. Yeah. And that's where we start to see the money come in. We start to see people being really excited about these fights yeah, Pen in is terms out. of what they take away. They're now one series away from being guaranteed prize ships. Uh, and whoever wins between this next match of Band Apart and Laserhawks is also going to be in that same boat. Yeah. It's a it's a tricky situation. Uh, Maude, what do you do uh, if you're if you're putting together your your fleet, getting ready to go in there? Uh, say you're Band Apart or you're Laser Hawks. What what are you looking to bring onto the field? What are you looking to leave behind? Uh, it's kind of difficult to say. So part of what uh, I deliberately did is I stepped back from the Toskers uh, after I found out that I was going to be commentating. So I'm not quite sure what exactly uh, some of these teams have because I haven't been practicing against them. Uh, but uh, Laser Hawks. If what you've been saying is uh, true and they don't have a lot of setups that can deal with the Battle Cruiser core, or they only run that, then it could be a better band from a band apart that I'm giving them credit for. At least it's what they've shown a lot of so far. So it's very possible they've got a ton, but a band apart might be trying to uh, at least make them change things up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, we don't have any final announcements uh, before the tournament ends. We will invite everyone back uh, tomorrow at 1500 Eve time where the uh, tournament, uh, Alliance Tournament 15 will continue uh, starting at, at 1500. And I believe we have that schedule up, if I'm not mistaken, uh, should be there. Or perhaps not. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, we do have the schedule yep. uh, uh, on the website for anyone yep. who wants to check it out. Yep. Yep. Uh, you can check that out. Mm -hmm. It's at uh, eveonline.com, community alliance dash tournament slash tournament dash brackets. Uh, and that will show you everything that's going on. Uh, as it is, uh, we will be seeing the Ronin go up against Skill. Mm hmm. We will see Brave Collective versus Test Alliance. Please ignore it. That's bound to be excellent. Be uh, really yeah. looking forward to it. We form Volta versus Bright Side of Death, and Pandemic Legion versus Hydra Reloaded. Uh, that should be pretty easy, right? That's a mm -hmm. It's just a walk yeah, through the park. that's not a hype match. You know, no. It's really looking No, we're not mm -hmm. too worried. And, uh, and then, of course, we'll see uh, the winners of those matches go up against... Uh, 
the uh, teams that have won in the uh, sorry have descended from the winners bracket yes. today, uh, the initiative mm -hmm. uh, and whoever fails in this fight. Yeah, so I was mistaken earlier. Um, the uh, Tuskers won't be facing Volta right away. They'll be facing the winner of Volta and the bright side of death. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, moving then uh, into this mm -hmm. final match, uh, a band apart versus Laserhawks. Before we go to the team in the booth, let's get some predictions from the desk. Uh, moderator, who takes it? Because of their ad wormhole bird. This is a really tough one. I'm going to go with Laser Hawks there. Uh, Laser Hawks, uh, Laser Hawk. Uh, what an excellent band! So I'm going to I'm going to go with them. I now that we've done that, we've guaranteed that Band Apart's going to win. Yeah, Band Apart, congratulations! Yeah, uh, we job. don't actually have to show it. Uh, well, we will allow <laughs> someone else to do it. Uh, Rain Chocolate and Elise Randolph will take this uh, match 108. A Band Apart versus Laser Hawks at Alliance Tournament 15. End of the day, last match, Laserhawks in blue, a band apart in red. Uh, Laserhawks bringing double Slepnir, Scimitar, double Ferox, uh, double Moa, and a Worm and a Merlin as their support wing. Yep, and the band apart has brought a Scorpion, Oneros, Hugin, double Stratios, double Myrmidon, Vexor, double Daredevil, all at 50 kilometers from the center. Yep, that is actually a Scorpion. That is not a glitch. Uh, it's a, a real, honest to God, Scorpion in the Alliance tournament. Uh, should be pretty wild to see how this is used. Um, important to point out, there are no like small jamming ships on the Laserhawk side. So, uh, you know, generally when you're flying a Scorpion, you're worried about a, a Kitsune or a Griffin getting that lock off first. But uh, nope, this this Scorpion is going to have free reign. We can see a bend apart, a lot of control on their uh, on their side. Uh, not a lot of an attack, but you know, a lot of control. And yeah. They'll be dropping drones. And, uh, you know, trying to control the field and just pick away at their opponents. Yeah, whereas we have the, kind of the opposite on Laser Hawks. They have a very minimal control bar, whereas they also have a lot of attack. Um, and then, obviously, both ships have the cliche T2 um, logistics cruiser, one being shield, one the other being armor. And the match is starting in five seconds. Yeah, well, watch out on this Hugin. The, uh, whoever the Hugin pins down first, likely the Laser Hawk Scimitar, if he is close enough, uh, that will be, you know, a, a key matchup to watch here. Uh, Band Apart, they don't have a lot of damage. Uh, so they really need to, you know, focus on the control. Uh, you can see that the Laser Hawks are getting uh, a Slepnir and one Moa screened off, uh, letting the other Slepnir and the Feroxes charge in. Yeah, and it looks like a band apart immediately applying at least the majority of their control bar with not only ECMs but tracking disruptors and what look like to be damps at first, so though some have dropped. Yeah, again, we uh, we can't see if these jams are successful. They're just an attempted jam. Uh, but the Scorpion definitely has lock on the Scimitar, and uh, a band apart are going to you know wait for a Scimitar jam and then kill something. Uh, right now, they've got a, a Moa really heavily tackled here, uh, but no no damage just yet. We see Laserhawks uh, focusing on a Scorpion a little bit, testing its tank, and uh, really getting in after this Daredevil piloted by Mark. Uh, he's a little bit far forward, so that's what Laserhawks can can. Uh, you know, kind of poke at. Yeah, Laser Hawks are really just rushing into the Band Apart team. They have attempted to move away, um, although it looks like the majority of them, like I just see red and blue across each other, and it does look like that Scorpion actually has a smart bomb as we see uh, Blue Jones being eliminated from him. Yep, so the Scorpion, that's the role he is playing. He is going to smart bomb drones off. Laser Hawks uh, don't have that many drones, uh, but what they do have is two Slepnirs that are totally controlled right now. Uh, their Slepnirs are double webbed, one of them is scrammed. Uh, so these guys, they want to be close to the action, they want to apply the damage, uh, and they're going to be controlled very, very hard here. Uh, as we see a MOA going down really quickly, my goodness, uh, that MOA, it's just a MOA, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. four-point cruiser, but it represents tanky, durable tackle, uh, which Laserhawks desperately needs. They need to hold something down to let their Slepnirs get all up in and apply some damage. Yeah, and it looks like they're actually, even though this Scorpion is only webbed, they're actually being able to apply at least the majority of the damage to him. And it doesn't look like that Oneros is able to get reps off on him. I'm wondering if... Maybe he has ECM drones on him. It looks like he's not able to actually rep that Oneros or yeah. the Scorpion at all, which is not good. They're going to lose their main This control. Oneros is finally getting reps onto the Scorpion. He was jammed, as you called it out. I uh, look like some uh, Hornet EC-300s. Uh, they do it again. EC-300s always seem to jam at the right moment. Uh, unless you're using them, then they never do anything. Yeah, they always work for your opponent. And then, so, a band apart counteracting with primarying that scimitar, which is both webbed and was uh, was damped, and it looks oh. like it's getting very, very low shields, bleeding into armor. Webbed and scrammed. It's not able to MJD, even if it was next to a beacon. Uh, this is really bad for the abandon, or for the uh, Laserhawk side. Uh, Laserhawks, you know, they do claw something back. They get a Myrmidon, mm -hmm. piloted by Rick Javix. Uh, he was probably busy, you know, making some memes and making some cartoons. Uh, got caught, is dying, but they're gonna trade a scimitar for it. That's a great trade if you're oh, yeah. uh, 
I mean, the Myrmidon brings DPS, it brings links, but obviously getting a getting a logistics ship off the field is definitely worth the trade. Though Jose and the Scorpion is actually being primary now. He's very low armor, just barely able to catch reps. Um, and although there goes the scimitar. You're watching it explode right now. It lost its ASB charges only at non nine cycles, and finally down a bend apart. Uh, they've still got their own arrows sitting pretty. Um, there are some EC 300s on the field, but no biggie. Uh, Laser Hawks, you know, really behind the eight ball. They got a Daredevil. Uh, they're still in this. They need to do something about this Hugin. They have to get it off the field. It is doing too much control or potential control against the Laser Hawk side. Yeah, and I want to say the Scorpion lived to win. He's now at half half armor, and it doesn't look like any DPS is being applied to him. I don't know if he MJD'd or actually got on it. He's now on a beacon himself, so I'm not sure if he MJD'd prior and we just didn't catch it. Although, a band apart now looks like they're primarying that Ferox, um, getting a tanky DPS off the field while trying to keep their own Daredevil alive. Yep, so uh, there are some uh, little drone wars going on here. Uh, Laser Hawks were shooting some drones, uh, not nearly enough uh, to get some damage. And as you mentioned, that Ferox is going down, belonging to Kase Cook. Uh, you know, Lynx, durable tackle. We've seen them used as screens before in the Alliance Hornet, and just extra tackle. Um, however, the Oneros on a, belonging to Band Apart is webbed and tackled. Mm -hmm. So. These scimitars are not controlled by the Hugin at all. The Hugin, I assume, is jammed by some EC-300s. A lot of EC drones on this Laserhawk side. Super frustrating it must be for a recon to get jammed by a light drone. Oh, yeah. And um, you had mentioned those Slepners uh, being being jammed themselves. They're also actually damped. So even if they weren't, actually, weren't ECM'd, they wouldn't be able to lock or um, lock targets from further away. It decreases decreases their lock range and we as I say that Devlin and the Onero is taking heavy heavy fire I believe he was tackled actually by this worm yeah absolutely like this Onero is, is actually going back in laser hawk side right now if they can get this Onero down quickly and it looks like they can this Onero is going to pop then laser hawks they still have their slepnirs if they can get onto a Hugin they force this Hugin to go quite far away as he's trying to you know run away from the jams he, uh, he has a swarm of EC-300s on him, just an entire cloud of little tiny uh, mm -hmm. jam drones. Yeah, so while Laserhawks, well, they have lost a lot of their core ships, they still have a Ferox le left, they still have the double Slepner, and then they also still have both a Moa and a Cerberus. So they actually have a lot of damage potential on the field, and we can see that as now they're priming that Scorpion, who does not have any logistics drones on him. Yeah, this Scorpion's gonna go down. Uh, the Daredevil by Prita Prita from a band apart side is holding on to Alexi Axan. Um, you know, he's keeping the damage off of the Scorpion a little bit, but he's got to be very careful here. He's very close to a Slepnir, and he's got no Lodgy of himself, so he's probably going to be next, uh, assuming uh, Laserhawks have a little bit of tackle on it. But nope, they're going for the Hugin. Great idea. The, this Hugin is a very, very important uh, for Laserhawks to get down. And uh, a band apart, they had a great early advantage, but it is slipping away. Yeah, the, I mean, when you get the Scimitar down and then you're not able to kill off the majority of the laser hawks damage. There's not really any point of like being able to take advantage of your early lead. Alexi so dropping no low now. He does have an ASB shield booster. Uh, you see him repping uh, as he's pretty low there, but he's not going to live all that much longer. This is not quite half the damage, but it's a good 30% of the damage that laser hawks have. And the daredevil dropped for a band apart, mm -hmm. which is a lot of DPS um, or a daredevil. I thought it was a bummer. Excuse me. So daredevil drops potentially um, tackle off the field. There is a still a Slepner and a Ferox left for Laserhawks. So they do have more damage than a Band Apart, and they're actually up on points. Yeah, these Stratioses and the Myrmidons, the, they don't have that many drones left. Uh, we've seen Laserhawks shooting drones. Uh, they haven't made it their top priority, but they have been making it a priority. So not all of the drones are down, but uh, a good portion of them are enough so that Laserhawks you know, aren't bleeding that much DPS. Mm -hmm. And you know, great piloting by this Worm Pilot. He has caught a Stratios. Um, he and Pivotally, he is scrammed. These uh, Band Apart guys are going towards MJD beacons, trying to jump away when they're getting low. Yeah. At least that's their goal. But, you know, when you're scrammed, you can't MJD. Yeah, and this Worm Pilot has been doing really well. He caught the Oneros earlier. He's pretty much been able to slip by all of a Band Apart. I mean, Worms, while they are tanky frigates, they're still frigates. They don't have a lot of HP. So they'd be very easy to get off the field. And they've just pretty much ignored him, and he's punished them for that. Yeah, so Band Apart, they had a great early victory here, uh, a great early lead, rather. Uh, but it is all gone. Power Ducks, uh, or Laser Hawks, they're making the happy duck sounds right now. I can hear it all the way over from uh, from where I am in Reykjavik. So, uh, you know, quack, quack, quack. Uh, Laser Hawks are going to go on, and they're going to be facing hands out and potentially be fighting for that third place victory. Yeah, that is absolutely crazy. Uh, Laserhawks 
you know, staying composed. Uh, they lost their scimitar pretty early on. Uh, that's that's not good. You don't like that at all. But the EC 300s clawing it back for them, giving great jams, uh, s making a band apart, kind of make a little bit of mistakes, being out of position, and Laser Hawks capitalizing on those out of position plays. Uh, so really good, really good uh, decision making here by Laser Hawks. I'm, I'm impressed with them. Uh, they've played Alliance Hornet type matches before, but uh, they've never been this far. So they should be. Uh, very happy. They took a, a strong setup and uh, executed it really well. Yeah, and um, so now they're just kind of cleaning, I want to say cleaning the field. A band apart can't really pull back from this. They don't have the DPS with the fully fully uh, healed Stratios and Myrmidon anyway to kill a, kill a Slapnare, to kill a Ferox. So now it's just kind of like Laserhawks executed it well. They were able to come in at a disadvantage and pull back. Yep, very good, uh, very good, keeping it there. And we can see the uh, Worm, as he's been doing all match, getting a scram on a ship that's trying to MJD. Uh, this is something that we saw a lot of pilots kind of forget about. Mercenary Coalition, earlier in the day, didn't bring a single scram, mm -hmm. so their opponents were able to MJD away. Yep. Lazer Hawk said, you know what? We know this is the tournament of micro jump beacons. We're going to bring scrams. Uh, and it looks like they let the scram go, and he blinked away anyways. Because, you know, that's how it goes. You know, you say something, they do the exact opposite. I mean, damn you, King Tut Tut. Yeah, I mean, granted, worms are really fast little little frigates, so maybe he uh, slingshot himself. Obviously, when you just hit approach, overheat your MWD, you can shoot past them and let that scram slip away. I mean, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. He just wanted to uh, to loot the field a little bit. Uh, he might actually die here for his hubris, but uh, don't worry. The Myrmidon has a swarm of EC300s around it again, so uh, he's probably going to lose jams or lose lock. Man, EC300s. Uh, we've seen Rooks do it. We've seen Kitsune's do it. But EC300 saving the day, getting jams on a recon, getting jams on a sensor boosted Lodgy. Woo! That's gotta yeah. be frustrating. Oh, yeah, definitely frustrating. And it shows that just because you can bring drones, you shouldn't automatically go with the damage drones. Both, we've seen Lodgy drones perform really well, as well as multiple types of E War drones. Yep, uh, so that is it. A band apart, finally defeated. Laser Hawks, still undefeated, mm -hmm. doing some happy duck sounds right now. Quack, 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 quack. That's exactly as it sounds. We're going to send it back to the studios to break it down. Wings of laser, nerves of steel, laser hawks separating a band apart from their grip on the undefeated bracket, sending them down into the elimination bracket mm -hmm. where they'll uh, hold on for dear life tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we'll see how that happens. Uh, before we go uh, for the, uh, before we end the day today, uh, Mod, uh, any comments on the fight we just saw? Yeah, uh, King Tut Badass was absolutely living up to his name. Yeah, definitely the MVP of the match. We've been seeing um, a band apart, a lot of teams, but a band apart actually has been showing it in their previous matches, making really good use of the micro jump beacons. And uh, having a really talented frigate pilot who can dive in, get a scram, then get out and survive. Surviving in a ship that's that fragile is really challenging, and King Tut Tut did a great job. Yeah. We, uh, mm -hmm. we, of course, see. Uh uh, Laser Ox mm -hmm. holding on after the loss of their Lodgy, and I, I mm -hmm. was pretty sure that that was going to be the, the tipping point for them, uh, but Abandon Part just unable to apply damage. Uh, was it the drones? Was it... What was going on? I, it's kind of difficult to say. You would think that the natural thing would to be to start killing ships after the Lodgy goes down. That's the entire premise of primarying the Lodgy. Uh, it's difficult to say, honestly. They were getting some kills, but yeah, they just weren't trading all that effectively. Um, they We saw a really great uh, last minute micro jump by the Scorpion for Band Apart when he was in Hull, um, but unfortunately the Scorpion doesn't have a lot of DPS. So although it has some jamming and has a good bit of hit points, uh, it's not really bringing much damage to the field, and I think that really hurt them in that trading war. Why bring the Scorpion? Well, as long as we're there, like what's the benefit Scorpion, a little bit of a weaker choice, I think. It's possible this setup was designed to use the Widow, but then maybe some of the other bands forced them to shift things around. They didn't have the points for a Widow anymore. Mm. 
it's it's possible. I, in any event, uh, a band apart unable to hold on uh, to that early lead that they took in the match, and uh, therefore Laserhawks moving forward, they will go up uh, in the bracket uh, versus out. versus Pen is out yeah. uh, for uh, uh, for the minimum place of third. Yes. Uh, and that will happen tomorrow uh, in the second half of the day. Uh, right now, uh, we are going to leave you uh, after this, the first day of the CCP's official broadcast of Alliance Tournament 15. Join us tomorrow at 1500 Eve time uh, when match 109 will commence uh, and uh, we will all see you there. Until tomorrow, I'm CCP Antiquarian. Fly free. <laughs>